Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's a distinct honor and pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He is a former U.S. Navy SEAL for about seven years. Four years prior to that, he was a U.S. Marine. We don't hold that against him, just like our boy, Andy. Uh, he did have a combat deployment with the Marines as well as one with the SEALs. Two full deployments as a SEAL. He was the creator of TAG, Tactical Assault Gear. He's now the owner of Chris Osmond Designs, which specializes in designing motorcycle and tactical gear design. And we'll get into the uh, how the fuck that works here in just a little bit. He's currently in talks with Apple to be the male voice of Siri. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Osmond. Thanks for having me, man. It's well, fuck awesome yeah. to be out here. No, it's, it's a pleasure having you. How, uh, how fucking long has it been since you and I uh, have really seen each other? Probably a couple of years because I remember in Coronado we were you know typical team guy oh, shit. Yeah. Like I was hanging out at uh, I want to say Nikki Rotten's there on Orange Avenue. Yeah, and you were just leaving having lunch with some friends, and I'd saw you, and I was like my eyes lit up like I saw Michael Jackson coming out of a limousine. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. Yeah, yeah, I take it in a good way. You know, I don't know if you so guys. I was, can... hang, I was hanging out with little kids or what? No, 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 no. <laughs> just you know, just be you know seeing you because I hadn't yeah. seen you in so long, and you know we have such a long history together. Yeah. And um, so it was just great seeing you, man. And I knew you'd, you know, dove headfirst into the canine world. And, yeah. um, you know, what's funny is, you know, seeing you then, which a lot of, you know, it's, you know, we put these throwback Thursdays on Instagram. And it's hilarious looking back. I mean, it's been 20, 21 years since we went through Buds yeah. and stuff, right? Yeah. And I remember I checked into Buds. I think I weighed like 160 pounds, like yeah. left the Marine Corps. And I was like, hey, man, I'm fucking fit and all yeah. this stuff. Then I really realized what fit was, and I can, I can tell every listener that I was not it. <laughs> um, and you were skinny, small. I was what? even smaller than you, for yeah. sure. Younger than me, yeah. right? And so now it's funny that you know we see each other now, and it's like beards, <laughs> tattoos. <laughs> Guys, just like go fuck yourself. Yeah. Just like so, we're, yeah. we're so different. No, I know it. Um, and so, I almost didn't even I almost didn't recognize you because when I. Last time I'd seen you, you were so much smaller. Yeah. And then everybody, you know, we start getting smarter on training, nutrition, yeah. lifting, and then just, you know, then old man muscle takes over. Oh, yeah. Um, and it and literally probably looked like you'd gained like 35 pounds. Oh, shit. I mean, when I fucking checked into Buds, I weighed, uh, well, my my first Navy ID, I weighed 147, you yeah. know, and, and same height, you know, a quarter inch shy of fucking six foot. And, uh, and you and I have carried gear oh, yeah. that weighed what your body was, oh, which, which yeah. is insane. You think about like, hey, man, we're going to go out and we're going to yeah. do special recons and yeah. we're going to hide hindsight. We're going to bury ourselves in the dirt. We're going to do all this shit. And you've got... Basically doing a buddy carry. <laughs> <laughs> can, right? And then yeah. you go to the VA and you're like, hey, man, my shoulder hurts. You're like, yeah, I can't be service connected. You're like, yeah. that's that's really weird because yeah. for four days I carried myself on my back <laughs> yeah. and my fucking, fucking shoulder really hurts. Fucking Motrin and ice. Fucking... Right. Check Face outboard. Watch. Face check, outboard. Yeah. Get check, some socks. Check the watch, Bill. Yeah, no shit. Well, I mean, what's crazy, so for the listener, Chris and I went through Buds together, and uh, we'll we'll talk about that here uh, in a few minutes once we get past the lightning round of bullshit that I put everybody through, but, um, you know, it's the the amount of time you and I have known each other. I mean, I, I've known you pretty much my whole fucking adult life, which is hard, yeah. to, hard to think about, but uh, yeah, we, we got some good good fucking stories and, uh, and a bunch of good shit to talk about. I appreciate you making the trip. I know you're in Dallas anyway, but... Uh, as as the listener and most people know, and now you especially since you you made the drive, I don't exactly live in Dallas. So no. So anybody who's listening, watching, um, when what I've learned, you know, I'm from San Diego, and everything's a ten minute drive, twenty minute drive. What I've learned about being around Dallas for the last four days is everything is twenty five minutes, thirty five minutes, forty five yeah. minutes. Well, Mikey here, Mikey Big Balls Ritland. That's right. Is nowhere near that forty mile mark. Yeah. He's a little bit further out, so you you know. Oh, way the fuck out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a good place to fucking be, but uh, yeah, it's not not convenient. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful, man. You got the ranch out here. You got the dogs. It's like you're in your own yeah. your own world. Yeah, so little, it's very very yeah, cool. Uh, you know, these miserable bastards talk about their man caves. Like fuck that. You know, have have a man property while you're at it. Fuck the cave. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> that's true, right? Yeah, yeah. Most guys are just trying to have yeah, some yeah, some, like, well, some semblance I, of privacy in a garage, yeah, and they yeah. build out the garage, yeah, and you're dude. like, you built a whole whole fucking property. No, I mean, to me, that that shit. Uh, I think that's one of the one of the issues with our society. I mean, to, the, I know the Jordan Peterson movement, if you will, or like the you know the knock the toxic out of toxic masculinity campaigns that uh, some guys have, uh, justifiably so, but. Uh, like that's one of the big big problems I see when people are like you know whether it's buying a dog or fucking getting a piece of gear or a man cave or whatever like well you know if my old lady will let me and like whoa 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 like what do you mean if she'll fucking let you it was like yeah you know. I, I think that's where it that's where it that, starts oh, where it huh? ends where like yeah. you know you're well one you're living to make somebody else happy which I can yeah. understand if you're in love and and there's going to be some compromise in there but why yeah, would, why would you <laughs> why would you as um as a human being, right, regardless of gender, yeah. let somebody else control you so no. much that you're fucking miserable. No, I know it. I mean, to me, it's just like, well, I got to check with my wife if I can. I mean, one of the jokes I think I made a while back, but like, you know, you got to make sure that she's good with you getting extra meat on a fucking Subway sandwich, like while you're in line. It's just like, fucking Christ, man. I mean, like, guy, I mean, you deserve it if you let that shit happen. Like, you know, run, run, True. Your, run your fucking shit. Yeah. I, I just, I don't get it, but. Anyway, we got uh, we got some good uh, political issues uh, written down to talk about later. We'll get into some more of that. But uh, real quick on the lightning round, I like to throw a, cute, a few just bullshit questions uh, out of the way. What's your favorite seal book ever written? Seal and, book. And yes, that's I a would, joke. Um, but I do know it's The Element of Surprise by Daryl Young. It's a book that I read in um, junior high and also in high school. And I think I did a, a 10th grade book report on that. Oh, and shit. What's it called? The Element of Surprise. I by Daryl I've Young. Never, I've never even heard of it. Yeah, really cool book, and it's you know Vietnam type shit, and and um, you know read that book cover to cover a few times, and well you know just like most people like enamored by the whole idea of being in the SEAL teams and patrolling yeah. and pa pa painting your face and doing all this other shit and yeah. snatching a Vietnamese you know tax collector in the middle of the night <laughs> seemed pretty awesome. Pulling uh, fingernails off. Yeah, so we in in high school they made us dress up as the char as the the character or the author that we were. So I literally go to school camouflage jacket paint up my face <laughs> and then I'm, and i give like this book i got an a on it yeah. but other people were you know ballet dancers or one guy did one on a, a cyclist so he's in there and he's like holding a tire and i've got like <laughs> fucking h gear fucking on minigun yeah i got h gear on painted face and the whole deal was it was pretty uh pretty sketchy but it was cool you couldn't do that now you'd probably get arrested oh, yeah. for it yeah yeah you'd get fucking well i mean between the fucking uh trench coat mafias that run around fucking shooting schools up and uh, just how emasculated our society has become yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't get 300 yards within a school with that shit no uh all right next question why don't you have a beard i've always been anti-beard oh, sure. in the sense of like well i mean yours looks good but it doesn't attract me to you i'm not going to try to make out with you because you have one well so. if i play my cards right i think i think that's going to change later he, he is spending the night tonight <laughs> <laughs> That's true, and you already gave me a beer, so we're uh, we're we're a yeah. six pack away from yeah. some very very bad decisions. Fucking hey, Joe Bob. Um, you know, I just never it, when the beard started growing out for me, it really itched my yeah. face a lot. Now I used to get a lot of ingrown hairs and all that. Yeah, but I also you know joke that I enjoy modern conveniences like hot water and a razor. So yeah. I guess why would you have a beard is the bigger question. You know, so here's here's a little backstory on me. I used to fucking shave everything, and uh, literally like one day, like in my mid thirties, I was looking around and I was like, I, I saw some dude that was fucking shorn, and and I just I was like, fuck me, that's what I look like. <laughs> it's like holy like shit, like the hairless cat, yeah, but was, with uh, an M sixty, yeah, right? Well, yeah, I was like, fuck, what? Why in the fuck? You know, I just stopped shaving everything then, like. And to me, it was like, you know, I, I'm, you grow it like it's supposed yeah. to fucking be there, I guess, you know, and I don't yeah. know, it, it literally like it, it happened over fucking night. I was just like, man, that looks dumb as fuck. You know, you look like a fucking, a fucking a peach for Christ's sake walking around, yeah. like, you know, it's just. But. Well, and some, you know, there are people who do look good with beards, like it, it fits their Mm -hmm. facial profile and the coloring's right good like yeah. yours has got like good color to it right you got a little silver shit going on right but mine grows out and it turns like reddish oh yeah which Fuck, i don't you know a fucking ginger beard not full ginger but enough ginger to where it's yeah. not good looking <laughs> it's, it's disgustingly oh, horrific to look at like yeah that's yeah. fucking priceless. Yeah, you could yeah. always just... No panties are dropping yeah. if I walk by in a beard, I'll tell you that. They're probably running for cover. Maybe because they're tripping over themselves running, right? Probably, yeah. yeah. 
Fucking Christ, that's awesome. I, I think you should. I, th- I think we should do like an internet challenge where if you know, pick pick a fucking goal that if people can reach this, that you have to grow a beard for like fucking six months. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe I'll just do it and send you send you some pictures yeah. and just grow it until like this think, before summer, right? So if I start yeah. now and don't shave until say June, yeah, I think, I think it'll be full red gray. I think you owe it to yourself. I think I owe it to America. <laughs> you know, not all heroes wear yeah, capes, but uh, they do have beards. Ginger, half ginger, fucking like uh, Chester the Molester, fucking ginger beard. <laughs> yeah, just That's, roll up in the ice cream truck yeah. with my beard. <laughs> the free candy T-shirt. Yeah. Uh, best hazing story. Best and I, hazing and I know story. you and I have been, have been around plenty of it at the same time, but best know. hazing story. Um, I've obviously been hazed a few times. Um, I think probably when we went out to Fallon, Nevada, and our AOIC, um, we got the you know the green light from the platoon chief yeah. to haze him, and it's like what we can like actually you we can know work this motherfucker over. work this motherfucker we're gonna tape him up, and he still has pictures of it which I thought was hilarious. But uh, I was just out at, at his house out in uh, in Vegas recently, and he was running through some old photos. He's like, hey, remember this? And he's um, so we're in these. Um, all of, we were staging our gear in helicopter uh, squadrons, and on the walls, they have those like hooks for their helmets, right? It's got the, yeah. little, the wooden cap on it, and they put their helmet on there. Mm-hmm. So he zip tied this dude up. And of course, you know, it's, you know, stripped naked, hook knife his <laughs> shit off of him. So he's got the happy hat on with duct tape. And then we came up with this brilliant idea to hang him there like he was a deer. Yeah. And so we zip tie him and put enough tape on his, on his uh, ankles and his, and his wrists that we like from one hook and he's just hanging there and then we went to work on him. You know what I mean? We didn't get too medieval, but we, yeah. he, we tuned his ass up. Oh, and Christ. so then that weekend we go into, and we spray painted and we fucked him up pretty good. Yeah. So we go to Reno that weekend to hang out and he's like, Oh, Hey man, this is my girlfriend. And it was the first time anybody in the platoon had ever met her. <laughs> and he's got like a long sleeve shirt on. Cause the only thing that wasn't paint spray painted black was his face and his hands. We, we fucked him up. So then they like go up to the, <laughs> the hotel suite and he comes back on Monday and he's like, Oh my God, man. She was like, what, what the fuck? Who am I falling in love with? <laughs> Oh, fucking Christ. Yeah. But she stuck it out. They're married. Yeah. They got a couple kids. You know? Oh, no shit. Yeah, didn't scare yeah. her away. So. What uh, What did he do to, to warrant the fucking hazing? Do you remember? I just think it's because just he was there. Him. It was yeah. like the welcome boy. He wasn't yeah. fucked. He was a really, really good leader yeah. and had that, that good balance between, you know, yeah. um, you know, getting after it with the boys, yeah. but then also like stepping back and saying, hey, man. Now's, yeah. now's our time to exit. Like, they were the guys that would come in and drink with you, get yeah. a little tuned up, but they were gone at like 10, 10.30. Yeah. They were like, hey, man, we, we, and I don't know if that was out of fear yeah. or if it was out of, what? you know, realizing that the boys need to be the boys without the officers and, yeah. and all that bullshit. What rank was it? Was he a third O or? No, he was our, he was our AOIC, yeah, AOIC. So he was a uh, fucking lieutenant. He was a lieutenant. No shit. We sma- it was smashed on him, which was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's one we of the things. crushed him. <laughs> That's one of the things that I, I fucking absolutely love about the community, uh, and for those listening, and you know whether you're a first responder, fucking law enforcement, military, whatever, is that you know officers go through all of the same fucking training, and they and they, they are not immune to getting the fuck beat out of them if they if they right. fuck up. I remember uh, the the third O of my first platoon, like holy Christ, he I don't even remember what the fuck he did. Um, you know, to to get in that position, he did something. You know, it was egregious for sure. I mean, it, it warranted having your ass kicked. But uh, they took that fucking guy and they they took a cruise box. And for those of you listening, it's it's a metal fucking chest, basically like a, you know you have a wooden chest for luggage or whatever. And and it's what is it? Probably three feet long and two feet wide, something yeah, like that. Two you feet know, high. Two feet high. And then the the handles for the for the listeners are. I, I used to call them. I think they were made out of piano wire, yeah. but they're really really <laughs> thin, and they get loaded down literally yeah. with like seventy pounds, eighty pounds. Yeah. I mean, just four hundred uh, fucking pounds. Yeah, you try to pick these things up, so yeah. Inevitably, you start you know taping um, yeah. pads around them just to yeah. not destroy your hands as yeah. you're you know doing your loadouts. But the fucking cruise box. So anyway, they fill this thing up about two thirds with water. And pack this motherfucker in there, right, with a, a regulator. Like, so they, they fill it, shove him in, so now the water's all the way to the fucking top, like he displaced it all the way up. They hand, a, like, and he's, he's taped up too, mind you. 
shove a fucking regulator in his mouth, stuff him in there, and close the fucking lid. And it wasn't Ouch. like they left him in there for 30 seconds. I mean, it was minutes. Like, you talk yeah. about fucking pool comp, dude. Like, taped up, pitch black, in a fucking cruise box with a goddamn regulator. Yeah. I mean, holy. Which is, in that experience, is probably what every guy at SDV, like, probably guys yeah. who are in SDV are listening <laughs> to this. They're like, well, that's yeah. our life. That's what we did <laughs> Shit. for 16 hours on yeah. an insert leg. Yeah, big fucking deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're, you're hazing. But that's horrible. Fucking, when you're underwater yeah. with a regulator oh, yeah. taped up, you're, you're yeah, well, definitely ta- fucked up. Especially taped up. I mean, like, that, that thing fucking slipped out of your mouth it ain't like you can put it back in yeah and who are you gonna call for help yeah. you're gonna start kicking the box yeah. like they're and just laughing yeah he did i mean it sounded like he was trying to do fucking laundry in there like <laughs> roll, <laughs> roll, with a, with a roll three pound around. bag of marbles yeah. you're like what are you doing <laughs> yeah. in there man oh it was what fucking you- priceless yeah and then i mean there was tabasco on the ass cracked fucking mini blast machine you name it i mean they yeah. fucking worked his ass those are always over. good ones too. Yeah. The, yeah. to shave the balls and then dump the tabasco <laughs> yeah. on right after yeah. like here's some here, here's some old spice yeah. for you yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fucking brute, a little aftershave. Um, do you have a dream car and and a motorcycle? I know you're big into bikes. Like, you, you win the lottery. What's the fucking first car you buy, and, and what's the bike you're going to trick out? Um, I've owned quite a few cars. Um, I thought my dream car there for a minute was a Maserati Quattroporte, which I did own. Yeah. Until I got a flat tire, and it cost me um, twelve hundred dollars to f- to get it fixed. Jesus fuck! And of course, it's like, oh, this is the special rim, the special tire. You got to go to the Maserati place to get it, you know, specially fixed. And oh, hey man, well, if you're going to repair this one, you got to get the other one so it wears even. So it was like a, a I think, right around twelve to forty hundred bucks just to, because I got a fucking flat tire. And about two months later. The the way the Maserati works, you know, they have parking assists, but you have to hit the button for it to turn on. Oh yeah, for the front of it. So we'd be pulling into the garage, and I hit the button, and it's you know starts beeping and shit. Well, one day we're pulling in there, and I hit the button, and my and my fucking finger goes through the dash. <laughs> no shit, quality and I'm like, craftsmanship. Call, yeah, and I'm like, okay, this is like supposed to be like the poor man's Ferrari, and I'm like, okay, so. Again, I take it, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's a common problem that, is, you know, it's a little plastic clip in the back there. This is, you know, it happens all the time. Don't worry about it, Mr. Osmond. You know, come back tomorrow. And they had to take the whole dash apart to replace this button. That was like 800 bucks. Jesus fuck. And I was just like, hey, man, um, I'm going to sell the car. I literally picked the car up, and I left, and I took it to um, – um, a car lot and, yeah. and sold it. No shit. Sure. I couldn't deal with it. And I thought that was like my dream car. But before that, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a, um, a, 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 a Mercedes CLS 550, which I loved. Yeah. Um, and I think if, if tomorrow morning I won the lottery, I'd probably just buy a CLS 550. Yeah. What, uh, what engine does that have in it? It's got a V8. Is you know, the, the five and a half liter fucking just shy of 600 horse fucking. That's thing. the, uh, the, I think it's the CL, like the, the, the model above that where like they got the, you know, when you're, when you're turning the corner, like the seats move in automatically yeah. to hold you tighter and all that yeah. other crazy shit. This yeah. is more just like the, um, the sportier sedan. Yeah. But I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's about a hundred and probably fully loaded hundred and ten grand, something like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fucking love Mercedes for sure. I mean, of all, of all the, you know, quote unquote brands out there, I'd, that's for sure at the top of my list of, uh, of ones I like. What about, uh, what about a motorcycle? Right, Cause I know you do like, yeah, I love shit. motorcycles. So I don't think I would ever ride a chopper again. So, you know, like Jesse James, that's how I kind of got into it is watching his uh, Discovery Channel videos. But, um, and they're beautiful bikes. I mean, but, you know, I like, uh, you know, I'm fucking 45 in June. So I do enjoy yeah. comfort. I call yeah. myself the toughest pussy in the world now because I like <laughs> really, really, really love hot water. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, look, man, I'm sitting in here in a hoodie with a beanie on. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking 50 degrees. Yeah, and you guys are chilling in T-shirts and shit. I'm like, oh, my God, why is it so fucking cold? That's California, too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, born and bred pussy out yeah. there, man. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so I I would I would get a, um, a road glide for sure, you know, probably a Screaming Eagle, um, the largest motor, you know, all that shit for a, you know, cruising around and, you know, it's yeah. got the saddlebags and all that. I would... Yeah. Um, have a Dyna because they're just you know fast and fun to ride um, and then the Harley electric bike is coming out no shit they are man get the fuck out of yeah. here yeah goes over 100 miles an hour but doesn't make a sound then I just think that'd be just the Harley Tesla yeah it is exactly what it yeah, is that's fucked up and I didn't even know it is, it's out. weird you just start it and it just sounds yeah. like nothing and then you jump on it and it and 
it goes from, you know, zero to a hundred miles an hour in seconds, just yeah. like a Tesla does, but you're yeah. on a motorcycle, which I think would be kind of cool. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, so here's the, the question though, is that, uh, w- one of the things that I think keeps motorcyclists alive, whether it's a fucking rice burner or a chopper is, is they're, they're both loud just in different ways, but yes, like that's going to make that motherfucker three times as dangerous. I think so because, you know, especially in California where splitting lanes is legal. I don't know what the laws are in every state, but there yeah. you can. God split damn. split lanes so i split lanes like yeah. if the tra- if the if normally the you know say the traffic is going 75 or 80 i'm splitting yeah. lanes going 90 95 yeah. so but people still hear you yeah or they you know or if you're in stop dead stop traffic then yeah i don't get nutty like that i typically go about 15 20 miles an hour but it's still there's a lot of people who don't ever see me oh i know it. and yeah, i mean fuck or I, hear me yeah you know? i mean I, so I, an electric I, bike it's going to cause accidents for sure yeah that's going to be stupid fast too, because I know like with the Tesla, I mean, I've driven and ridden in a, in a couple of different, different models and they're all fast. I mean, one, I don't remember what it was. I think it was the model S, uh, with the, with the faster tuning package or whatever. I mean, it's low three zero to second, but it was like the, the equivalency of torque, even though I think it's rated different, but it, it's, it's like golf, like a golf cart or whatever. Like it's just, it goes from a standstill to max fucking speed. Like yeah. just, it's just there. And like it sucks you in the back of yeah. the seat and you can't hear anything. So it's a, that's weird. It's a yeah. very weird experience because obviously we've all grown up with yeah. the sounds of motors. To me, to me, that's half the experience of driving a fucking, a fast car is, is the, the way that goddamn thing sounds. Yeah, you know? I agree with I that. Mean, yeah. That's one thing I think Mercedes fucking unquestionably has no, has no peer is that AMG fucking sound that, uh, that those fucking things make. But, uh, man, that's fucking nuts. So you're going to get one of those? If I won the lottery tomorrow, I would. Right. I don't know if I, I don't know if I would save up to buy one. Yeah. Are they pricey? The, the Harley? Yeah. I mean, Harleys are jumping up there now. I mean, if, if like one of these fully loaded, um, street glides or road glides, you know, some of them I've seen. Um, you know, over forty thousand dollars. I'm yeah. just like, fuck, For a man. Fucking motorcycle. Yeah. yeah, that's nuts. Are you an enduro fan at all? Like, I know those BMW enduros are pretty badass. They are. Ex- BMW's making a, f- a phenomenal bike, but I'm not an enduro fan. I don't envision myself you with, know, with the fucking motocross outfit and the fucking yeah, like the full body suit. <laughs> yeah. I see guys riding and all that shit, and yeah. I, you know, I, 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 it's so funny to me because, you know. It gets hot. Well, I'm going to say Texas hot because nothing's like that except maybe fucking Somalia. But, <laughs> um, but you know, it does get hot in California, right? Yeah. So, or at least for me, it gets hot. And I'll be out in just like a t-shirt, you know, and I always wear a full face helmet, but I'm like, and of course I'm wearing a t-shirt, right? So if I go down, my head will be intact and yeah. I'll be alive to feel all my skin coming off. So it's yeah. kind of counterproductive. <laughs> yeah. um, but at any rate, but you see these guys like the BMW bikes or the weekend Harley rider. Maybe he's not that confident or I don't know what it is, but they got like the full chaps on the full length, everything jacket. Of, and I'm just like, man, how, how are you even fucking breathing in that? Yeah. No shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. No, yeah. I mean, I see people, I, I travel a lot and, you know, driving, of course, most of the time taking dogs all over the fucking country or whatever and see people like rocking these it looks like it's a fucking tent, like tent material, you yes. know, full body fucking suit, like Jesus Christ. It's, it's like an, ins- you know what it is? It's like an, in- it's a, a canvas, like insulated flight suit almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's right? fucking nuts. Yeah. I can only imagine the fucking, the amount of nut sweat it's fucking rolling because of that goddamn Operation thing. Cornstarch. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Uh, what, uh, what's your most embarrassing moment that you can think of? Most embarrassing moment. Wow. Mm. It's probably something that had to do with like childhood, maybe like getting picked on or like. Did you get picked on a lot? I did. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, my, you know, obviously I'm a white guy for those. Who, oh, fuck. <clears throat> oh, yeah. This show's over. Yep. I thought you were, I thought you were a black guy. We're done. No, time to, no, no, this is just face paint. <laughs> oh, no, it's too soon. Oh, Sorry, yeah. guys. Sorry, guys. Too soon. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, like as like I was saying earlier, like I was a small kid, you know, yeah. so five foot ten, but I was always in the, like the one thirty five, one hundred and forty pound, right? Mm. <clears throat> Wasn't necessarily, you know, I'm definitely no badass by any stretch of imagination. And my parents moved into uh, an area of Southeast San Diego, which was like gangland, right? As a matter of fact, they they even have gangland episodes yeah. about the the neighborhood that I grew up in. And you know, here I come, this white kid from Imperial Beach, and at the time. Uh, my dad was an E6 in the Navy, and they were building 
not section eight housing, but they were building houses that, you know, these, these housing projects were, were made for low income families. So my, my dad in his infinite wisdom is like, well, we're low income, man. I'm an E6 and an AB. Let me apply. <laughs> and they get their first house. Um, cause we were living in a condo before that in, in Imperial beach. And we moved out there I didn't even know what the neighborhood was, nothing like that. And you know, no experience in it. And it literally is like smack dab in the middle of gangland of San Diego. Right. It, it was so bad. They actually renamed it from Southeast San Diego to some other fucking thing to make it more politically correct now. Um, so there I am this white kid and now I'm like surrounded by, um, you know, gangsters and all this shit. So it was, it was a interesting environment, but that is when I really, for the first time was just like getting my ass kicked. Cause I was a white kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, Hey man, welcome to the neighborhood. You're the only white guy around here, <laughs> you and your brother. And, and that's where all my, you know, I picked up my street smarts and I started yeah. really getting into like fighting and defending myself and yeah. really took to, you know, why are we going to talk about it? I'm just going to start swinging. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's that's where that I, I, so I would think that you know being a kid and being picked on and having my shit stolen it's like embarrassing and like, yeah. like really kind of you know I'm like I say man I'm almost forty five years old but you don't forget shit like that oh, yeah. you know so yeah no I mean there's a it's kind of similar shit I mean the town I grew up in was uh, was more racially tense than I think most people would uh, would assume for a. A, a smaller, you know, suburban type uh, city in Iowa, but uh, I mean, it, it had its fucking its messes that way, and uh, I was on the receiving end of of a number of them, no no doubt yeah. about it. But um, what is your favorite fucking cut of meat? Up until about an hour ago, I would have said a. Um a uh, New York strip, but now I think it's a ribeye end cap. For those that you don't know, it's fucking borderline amazing. It's like it's like eating unicorn gum. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> well, I'm glad uh, I'm glad you dug it. I, one of the things I, I try to do for for most guests is uh, if we can if we can fit it in time wise is either make ribs or or that. That's that's probably my favorite favorite cut. Um, is that yeah? That fucking end cap is just uh, goddamn. It's tender. It's fucking good. Yeah, perfect flavor. It's tender and and the fucking uh, the grill, which uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, probably on another episode. I'm looking to do some barbecue ones, but anyway. Uh, last question. Uh, that's one I ask everybody. What does your morning routine look like on a, on just a normal day being home? Um, wake up definitely. What, I'm a two cup. Time? depends uh what i've got you know on the schedule if i have literally nothing to do but like maybe go to school later on that day or something like that i try to sleep in i really like sleeping now go to school yeah you fucking going to school yeah i'm trying uh, to get my uh my smarts on. trying to get my ged up in here yeah exactly right yeah i got i got the letter a couple of years ago and they're like hey man if you don't use this thing it's gonna end uh, so i fuck. like raced down and signed up yeah. uh for school and then of course a year into it they get the other letter they're like hey they just passed the forever gi bill you can use this shit anytime now it never runs out no no shit and but you know i'm uh I want to say two classes away from an associate. So yeah, well, fuck, that's um, cool. so I just do it anyway. Um, but I typically I'm, I'm up around seven, seven thirty, two cups of coffee. I do not watch the news at all. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have found that my entire day is changed by not having any like negative thoughts, right? When I first wake up or hearing somebody on, you know, pick your poison and it really doesn't matter. But you watch any news now it's just going to fire you up in yeah. a good way in a bad way and, and it kind of like it's it's kind of setting the tone for the day so i really don't watch the news at all um and then i definitely plan my workout and you know de determine you know what we got going on and what my wife's got going on because she works in the uh the tactical industry as well yeah so do you, you know, when you say you sleep in i guess i mean like barring you don't have some shit going on I mean, will you sleep fucking nine o'clock are you up before then or what no, I mean, nine's pretty late, but if it's a weekend and I'm like having a couple of bottles of wine and Netflix and chill with my chick, you know, and hit the bed at, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., yeah. I can definitely sleep eight, eight to 10 hours for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking A. Uh, what, what are your workouts like? I know I've seen the, the fucking war on weakness and, yeah. uh, and some of that shit. What, uh, like what? So, you know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I started doing CrossFit, but mm -hmm. I didn't. You know, I just didn't like, I just don't like going to a gym. Yeah. For some reason, there's just something about it that I fucking hate. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I, I don't know. It's just, 
I'm in there and it's like, Hey man, can I work in? Are you done? You know, all this, I just hate the whole experience, uh, of a, you know, a traditional gym. So that's why I went on to do this, you know, some of the CrossFit stuff. Um, but I didn't really like that. I mean, I like CrossFit. Don't get me wrong for all you fucking CrossFit Nazis. It's a cult. Yeah. I love the workouts, but what I find interesting about CrossFit is that you can go to these gyms, you know, there's a, there's even a couple of Netflix documentaries about it, but you did, but if you watch any of those Netflix documentaries on CrossFit, you got a lady, you know, is example, you, you know, she's in her forties probably. Yeah. Extremely out of shape. You know, her muffin top has a muffin top type shit. That's and my she, that's my favorite. And she goes in and joins the CrossFit, and she's like, "Oh yeah, I'm doing this. It's such a great community. Everybody, you know." And then it's like, "Okay, welcome to CrossFit." And you know, she does her three foundation courses and all this other bullshit. And the first workout, she goes in there, and they and they see the wad of the you know the workout of the day, mm-hmm. and it's you know hundred burpees, fucking two hundred double unders. It's kettlebell swings. It's overhead squats. It's ro- and I'm like, and she and she basically spends over an hour trying to do this shit murdering herself murdering herself right and i don't understand why no one says hey why there's no dip, like there's no wad and there's no like beginner immediate advanced workouts it's literally like someone making up this workout right yeah and it's supposed to be done by every person obviously you know four time as many rounds as possible blah 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 so i didn't get off on that or they or they put what weight they think the guy should use what weight the girls and and so people lose a lot of um proper form because yeah. they're trying to do these these weights that maybe their body's not uh capable of doing and so they're injuring themselves and you know i just didn't i didn't dig that so i was like fuck this so i bought my own bumper bumper plates my own box kettlebells i you know so i just do my own workouts there in the garage just like you yeah. do yeah. um but also, I'm a member of the the YMCA because he got an outdoor pool, so I swim yeah. a lot there. And damn, you, know, you still swim, huh? Still swim, yeah. Oh, shit, I I tell you, man, I I don't fucking I, I hate getting in the water at this point. I mean, like <laughs> I still fucking hate it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I grew up swimming, and I I still like fucking a decade plus in the SEAL teams has really made me hate the fucking water to yeah. this day. Like I in still the, don't like it. Because right now the water, the ocean temps about 59 degrees yeah. and there's no fuck way I'm getting in that. Yeah. Just because like I say, I'm just, <laughs> I'm at a point where it's like, hey man, if I don't have to do that, I'm not going to do it. But when yeah. spring comes and summer, I always do run swim runs at the bay. Yeah. Um, but I'll go there typically I'll get up about six o'clock, have a cup of coffee or whatever and go out there and I'm splashing. Yeah. At at seven a.m. before the boat traffic hits, yeah, and it's in, in same thing, man. I go out there and I got my little fins on, and it, it you just get shocked back. Oh yeah, into being in buds or being in your first platoon and doing yep. these run swim runs, and then the first gulp of salt water, yeah. and diesel fuel, and I'm just like, <laughs> and I'm like, why the fuck am I? I could be in bed right now. You know what I mean? So uh, I know it. Yeah, yeah. fucking more power to you, man. Fucking a. Um, do you typically do or subscribe to a specific, uh, way of eating diet, whatever, like, are you, you know, are you more on a, a keto paleo zone? Like, do you give a fuck or is it just, uh, I, I don't, I try I stay away from like deep fried foods. I don't fuck around with dairy anymore. Yeah. Um, I don't eat lunch meat. You know, once I read that it's now classified as a carcinogen, the same yeah. as a uh, cigarette smoke and all this stuff. I was like terrified of that. So I don't eat lunch meats, uh, um, I stay away from uh, dairy. Don't eat uh, deep fried food. But other than that, I, I've been messing around with, like intermittent fasting. So yeah, um, I don't even know what time it was that we ate lunch, but yeah, it was like fucking one. Yeah, one. So I'll probably eat again with you. Let's say we eat at five or six. I won't eat again until probably ten to twelve the next day. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's been working pretty good. Yeah. Do uh, fruit and vegetables and shit or. Yeah, I love, I love eating salads. Um, I don't you toss that motherfucker. Yeah, too, right? to- we toss the salads later. Yeah, yeah. It's more the off off camera off yeah, camera action. That's, that's the uh, that's the bonus footage on YouTube. Yeah, subscribe to, to my to webcam. <laughs> subscribe to my webcam. You oh, can, Christ. Yeah, twenty dollars unlimited Snapchat. That's right. I'll take requests. I'm, you know, I'm not I'm not above taking a request. Yeah. Uh, I've done worse for, and I probably paid for it. You know what I mean? I know I've done worse for free, and I've probably done worse, and I've paid for it. So, oh fuck! Um, all right, so I, I didn't realize you were from fucking San Diego. So you grew up in uh, in fucking Imperial Beach. 
Yeah, so as a, a youngster, so almost, yeah, so kindergarten through um, third grade, I was in um, Chula Vista and Imperial Beach, and then we moved out to southeast San Diego, and I was there until the ninth grade. What is that now? Like, what do they call it now? You said they renamed it, what, like for... I think it's just East San Diego. I think they got yeah. rid of the Southeast San Diego because yeah. it just became yeah. is, I mean, know, is there a famous name? for its, you know, all the crime and all the bullshit yeah. that was going on out there. I mean, what uh, what what towns that that I would recognize or anybody that, that lives there? Like what? Yeah. That? So if you were going, say, the eight hundred five, and you exited um, Imperial Avenue. And Lincoln High School is right there. Okay. Lincoln Park High School. And this now Lincoln Park High School has been rebuilt. I mean, I remember back in the day when it was like, you know, drive by shooting central over there when it was the old high school. And I lived off a of skyline drive, which is where Morris High School is at. So they're like those two high schools. Um, and in between, um, you had Martin Luther King Jr. Park, which was next to Morse High School on Skyline. I live right next to that. Like I okay. literally like hundreds yards or so off of Skyline Drive. And then further on by Lincoln Park, they had their own park behind Lincoln High School. Yeah. And that's where all the all the uh drug deals went down. That's dude, it was like <laughs> big time. Yeah. You didn't really want to fuck around, you know, yeah. hanging out there. But it was it was interesting because, you know, I when I went out there, you know, I was in the fourth grade. So all the kids that I grew up with fourth fifth sixth grade their brothers their older brothers were all like high school so they were yeah. like the lo- legit yeah. uh gangsters out shot there. collars and fucking and they were getting out there so then but i would be walking through the neighborhood and you know motherfuckers are like jumping out like yo what's up motherfucker what set you claim and i'd be like robert you know what i mean <laughs> they're like oh chris my bad dude we're about to fuck you up and i'm like jesus man i'm just trying to go home dude so um you know, Robert. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because you know, banger name Robert. But you know what I mean? Because I know him by their first names, yeah. and you're like, you know, call me, you know, call me, call me OG Slick Dick. And you're like, and I'm like, uh, isn't your name Robert? You know what I mean? So, um, oh, fuck. So that, you know, you know, taught me, a, you know, a lot about reading people and yeah. how to like kind of diffuse situations. And, and yeah. I won't say talk your way out of getting your ass kicked, but at least knowing people and getting to know yeah. them on a personal level really does, you know, does help in life in a, in a lot of situations. And Oh fuck. Yeah, it does. I mean, that, that street smarts, like you can't, uh, I mean, it's, it's priceless. You can't really teach it to no. sit, like you got to go through it, you know, yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah. I was beaten and robbed into education. Yeah. yeah no shit. School hard knocks <laughs> fucking for real. Yeah. So just East of Imperial beach. And then, so you're like fucking 10 minutes from Mexico, huh? I was, yeah, probably, yeah. 10 to 12 minutes from the border. Yeah. yeah. Did you go down to fucking Mexico growing up at all? Or? Uh, a couple times as a kid, but then when I became a Marine, we used ours. to go down there yeah. all the time. Fucking yeah. revolution. Yeah, <laughs> revolution. revolution. Oh, yeah. We used to just get crushed uh, down there, yeah. Fucking Christ. Uh, you have one brother, right? One brother, yeah. And uh, older, younger? He's two years older than me, yeah. Do you guys, do you have any type of relationship now? Or I mean, because growing up, you guys were close, right? Growing up, we were really, really close, um, and he is... You know, it's an interesting character. I mean, in, you know, for all the re- the readers, the listeners, you know, he and I do not get along now, and I, I'll get into that. But um, I have not seen him in, man, what year is this, 2019? I haven't seen him in nine years. Oh, shit. Yeah. He lives in San Diego. I have no idea where. You know, he's married now. He's got three kids I've never even met. God um, damn. So that, they, that's they, healthy. Yeah, that's super <laughs> healthy. So can't wait for Thanksgiving. Yeah. You, you know. Show up. Um, but, no, we were really tight, and – um you know, later on in life, it seemed that our interests and way of life kind of diverged. You know, my dad was a command master chief in the Navy, um, and he was in um, fast attack submarine, so he was the chief of the boat, the Cobb. Yeah. And this is during the Cold War. So I grew up in a very patriotic household, and that was like my thing. And I just loved the whole idea of being in the military and, you know, what it stood for, at least to me. And um, my brother, on the other hand, was fucked the government, fucked the military. You fuck know, you. Fuck you and, you know, fuck the rules. So he and I would fight about stuff like that growing up. And, you know, my dad, I remember one time my my me, he, my, my brother and I were like full-blown fist fighting in the kitchen, you know. And um, it was because the first Gulf War was happening, right? So this is like 1990, <laughs> right? And I'm in the 10th grade and he's getting, he's a senior at the time. So, you know, when you turn 18, you got to go down to the post office and fill out the little form and, you know, civil, you know, whatever. So he thinks he's going to get drafted. Like all him and his fucking, you know, friends are like, Oh my God, what if I get drafted? What the fuck? 
I've, I've never even seen a desert, right? So they're all freaking out. <laughs> so he refuses to go and, and, and go to the post office and sign this fucking shit. So I, I call him a communist, right? Because like back then that was a thing because we were like, we're with the Russians and shit. And Whereas now it's a, it's a left-wing compliment. Yes, now it's a compliment. Back then it was like actually, you know, was a derogatory yeah. term. Now it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. What do you do on Saturday? <laughs> yeah, no um, and so he's like, what the fuck you call me? I'm like, you heard me, you fucking mother... You know, so it's typical brother shit, yeah. right? And so now he and I are legitimately fist fighting as if we didn't... Like we were strangers, yeah. right? Yeah. And my dad, I had no idea that my dad was literally like in the driveway coming home from work. And he's in his khakis and his ribbons and shit. And he comes in. He's a bigger guy, and you know, um, you know, back then it's, it's funny because he's been like, "Man, this guy is just fucking angry. He's a dick." Now I'm just like, "Man, I, I get it, man." <laughs> now I'm like, I love him to death. Yeah. Now I'm just like, "Hey, yeah. man, remember you used to tune, tune us up?" I'm like, "Hey, man, that's kind of cool." Thanks. Yeah. It wasn't so bad, but um, so he comes in there. I mean, my brother just going at it, and he breaks the fight up. And he's like, what in the fuck is going on? And I was like, he's a communist dad. And I was like, you know, it's like, the, you know, the emotion like takes over. So like, of course, I'm like, start crying a little bit. And he's like, fuck him. And he's like, what? I'm like, he won't sign up for the service. You're at the, we don't even get to see you. You're a father. We don't, you know, we grew up in a, in a, in a household basically without a dad because you're always deployed. Yeah. And this motherfucker, you know, won't do his part. I was really, really like, no, sure. no shit upset about it. That's, that's interesting at that age to have that kind of fucking perspective on it. But yeah. Go ahead. And so my dad goes, oh, hold on, cowboy. Like, let's just fucking settle down. He goes, look, man. And, and he's the one that taught me. He's like, look, man, freedom is a two-way street. If you're, if you, you know, he has the right to think the way that he wants to think, to do what he wants to do because of the sacrifice. It doesn't mean that he has to do exactly what I do. It doesn't mean he has to believe what you believe. So he's like, you got to really, really get on board with the idea that, you know, freedom is a two way street and you can't just go around fucking throwing blows because somebody doesn't agree that you should be in the military and, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So he kind of, you know, set me straight. Yeah. That's um, good shit. Yeah. But what I still the, think he's a fucking communist. So if you're listening, you coward piece of shit. <laughs> Love you, bro. Love you, bro. Go yeah. fuck yourself. What, uh, how did your dad handle him not fucking, I mean, you got to do it. Like, was he like, and you dipshit? Like, did he fucking address him too or? Yeah, he's he just said, "Hey, man, it's your choice. I don't agree with it, but yeah. I but you're my son, and I stand behind whatever you decide. Whatever you decide. Yeah. But damn. and he never did it though. And then later on in life, when he went to go get a school loan, he couldn't get a loan because he never signed the paperwork. Which, no shit. Yeah, and I was like, ah, you fucking yeah, <laughs> Uncle Sam knows you're a fucking turd, bitch. <laughs> yeah. So we had we had some interesting, uh, some really really interesting uh, family vacations. God damn, that's <laughs> fucking priceless. <laughs> Jesus." <laughs> Uh, just, just the one brother, right? Just the one brother. Yeah. yeah. Um, relationship, obviously you have a shit. You don't have a relationship with them now. No. Uh, what about your parents now? Are they still, still alive? And parents are still alive. Uh, they're young, man. They're, uh, 64. Oh, um, sure. so my brother was, came around when they were 17. My dad dropped out of high school. He was in the 11th grade and he dropped out of high school and, uh, joined the Navy in 1972 and, um, was on a destroyer and went to, uh, did two tours in Vietnam and, um, I was born when my parents were 19 Jesus. and they're still together. Really? Which is insane. Man. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about that. I've been divorced. You've been divorced. My brother's been divorced. Yeah. That seems like the thing to do yeah. is like, Hey man, just give it a run. Yeah. It's almost like running shoes. It's like you try them out. And you're like, Hey man, this one hurts my fucking Achilles. Yeah. They were cool at first and now they suck. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, no, my. I have uh, a falling arch. These yeah. shoes are fucking. You know what I mean? You trade them in, you get a new pair that yeah. that fits, and it's almost that's how relationships are now. Yeah. Today, it's, no, it's pretty. The pretty uh, one of the one of the most sage, more sage pieces of advice that Ty Woods, God rest his soul. Uh, I remember uh, he he told me this was back. Uh, I don't know, not not long before I got out, and I don't even remember how the uh, how the conversation got teed up. But uh, he was like, you know what? He's like that new car smell wears off on fucking everybody at some point. And I was like, absolutely. Well, God damn. Yeah. I never really thought of it that way, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he, uh, cause he was, he had been married before and it was a fucking shit show and, and, uh, you know, got remarried and whatever. But, uh, anyway, um, all right. So relationship with your parents now is still, still good. Relationship with my parents is really good. Now. Um, there was a moment in time where we really didn't, um, talk for a couple of years. And that was once I had sold my business, you know, um, there was, you know, a, a big, you know, falling out with the family. And that was, you know, part of the reason why I sold in the first place is I was just over that shit. Yeah. Um, 
We're, but but over time though, you know, we fixed that, repaired that, and uh, we, I've been having a you know awesome time with them. They they lived in Spokane, Washington after my dad retired hmm. um, here in San Di- here in San Diego. In San Diego, they moved up to Spokane, and then um, he was up there for a long time. Um, and then they, I want to say they went down to Las Vegas, you know, when it was winter time up there and they came down there and they're like, you know, 65 degrees and they're like, what, yeah. are, we, what are we doing, man? So they yeah. moved to Vegas a few years ago. Um, and they love it, man. They got sure. their house out there. They got the like dialed in pool in the backyard. Yeah. They just absolutely love being in Vegas. Yeah. Do you, uh, when you go there do you fuck with the strip much or do you just fucking avoid it? I like the strip if it's a targeted place that i'm trying to go but the which i think is incredible to watch is the siege of people walking around and they're like oh my god you can drink outside and they got all the fucking you know long neck drinks and all the yeah. the bullshit and they're just literally walking up and down the strip yeah and i don't know why you would do that yeah you know and, it, and it's all the same shit that's in any town that you're from you know there's a yeah. mcdonald's you know, there's In-N-Out Burger. Mm-hmm. You know, the only difference is that you can get a cheap drink and drink it outside, and then there's the uh, the casinos. But I really like uh, old Las Vegas, like Fremont Street. Yeah. And going out there at night is really cool. So, yeah. Um, the uh, When you go there, in terms of the, the targeted spot that you go to, is there a favorite fucking place of yours? Yes. So Gordon Ramsay's oh, yeah. uh, Pub and Grill inside Caesar's Palace. So my favorite beer in the world is Innocent Gun. Innocent Gun? Innocent Gun. Oh, I-N-N-I-S and Gun. And it's the only bar in Las Vegas that has that on tap. And so I went in there one day and I was like, hey, what do you recommend? I want to drink something like, you know, something besides fucking Corona. And they're like, oh, Gordon Ramsay's favorite beer is Innocent Gun. And that's how I ended up trying it was just a bartender's recommendation. What kind of beer is it? So years ago, there was a company that was aging uh, rum barrels and whiskey barrels, but they were aging it, like wet aging it, which mm-hmm. is which I never heard of. Like, you know, they smoke the inside of it, right, for like whiskeys and scotch and things like that. So they do that same thing, but then they are wet aging it to cure it somehow. Yeah. But they're pouring like shit garbage beer into it. Mm-hmm. And it sits in there for like a year or however long it sits in there. And then they just dump the beer down the gutter. And then they use the barrels to make their rum. So one day, <laughs> as this shit's going down the drain, the guy was probably in the Marine Corps, I'm sure. <laughs> fucking puts his coffee mug in there and he tastes it. And he's like, hey, this is fucking amazing. Yeah. They're like, what? Everybody tastes it. And they're like, holy shit. So then they started bottling the beer. So it's a, it's a beer that comes from a rum. And it's aged. Yeah. No shit. And it's. Yeah, it's fucking hard to describe how aged, delicious it is. Aged beer, fucking, I gotta write that shit down. What is it called? Innis, like I N I N N I S. Innis and Gun, G U N N. Fucking, hey. can you get get it anywhere? Or is it like? Yeah, it's sold in a four pack. Um, yeah. You can definitely f- find it online. Yeah. Um, but it, in yeah. within like two years, it became the number one selling beer in yeah. all of Scotland, and I think it's now like taking over Europe. And where, where is it? Is it? Made, it's made over there. Where? Yes, yeah, Scotland. Yeah. God damn, that shit ain't fucking cheap. I imagine. No, I don't even know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'd probably give away my my yeah. my daughter for yeah. a twelve pack. <laughs> kidding. Well, that's fucking great shit. I wouldn't give her away; I'd sell her. Yeah. But yeah, I'd get something out of it. Yeah. Um, what uh, did you play any sports growing up? I tried to play sports, but I found that the whole get together, all hands in, yay team thing just wasn't me, which yeah. oddly, then I ended up being in arguably the in the SEAL fucking team. SEAL teams. And yeah. I'm like, man, the fuck, if it just didn't have the name team behind it, I would fucking <laughs> really, really like this shit. But um, so I tried wrestling, which I just sucked at. Um, I, I did swimming for a couple of years, which was cool because it's just your individual. You're just in there. Um, but I never got into football, baseball. Um, anything like that, I, you know, enjoy the sports and I'm not coordinated enough or tall enough to be good at basketball, although yeah. it is my favorite sport. Really? Yeah. A huge yeah. Lakers fan. No shit. Yeah, man. I've been a Lakers fan since like the 80s. Yeah. I never would have fucking pegged you for that. Yeah. You can peg me later though. Uh, I, but you just can, not, You count on yeah. that shit. A little salad toss and a little pegging. Boom. A little chugging. Yeah. Uh, what, uh. Or I guess, like from a from an athleticism standpoint, were you would you consider yourself athletic growing up, or was or average? yes, very much so? Uh, because I was, I always knew that I was going to join the military. That was like yeah. my goal, right? And I, you know, I literally had no ambition other than me being in the military. Yeah. 
And, you know, I think that kind of goes back to, you know, me being picked on as a kid. And then I saw First Blood for the first time Fucking when I was a, a youngster, right? John Rambo. John Rambo is still one of my all time, you know, favorite movies. And I, I remember seeing that movie as a very young kid and thinking to myself, man, I would like to be able to fuck dudes up like that. <laughs> and I remember that's what really, like, triggered in my mind that all yeah. I wanted to do was be in the yeah. military in some capacity, right? Yeah. Um, but so as a, as a kid, I did, you know, PTs on my own after school, swam, yeah. uh, had a 10 speed. So I really got, kind of got into road biking for a long time in yeah. the whole, like, um, Tour de France and all, you know, mm-hmm. getting in my fucking badass speedo yeah. Yeah. and uh, knocking out miles on the weekend. But that was like my thing. But it was, you know, it's which is weird because it's all individual shit. Yeah. If you go for a run, it's an individual <laughs> thing, right? Swimming. You're individual. not depending on anybody. Yeah. No one's depending on you. Swimming's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Riding a bicycle is the same thing. Yeah. And then dumbass me gets involved in, yeah. and spends, you know, 11 years of my life in the fucking military <laughs> professional well, team sports yeah, yeah no shit well so i'm curious about that then like what uh when you were in high school and, and doing that type of shit and, and knowing you wanted to serve can you tell us about the fucking you know why did, did you think about the marines did you think about being a seal was there you know how, how did that all fucking shake out so my whole life all i wanted to do was be a navy seal mm-hmm. that that was you know I, I found out about them from a buddy of mine um his name is Chris Rabana, if he's listening. He's actually now the command master chief of the 2nd Marine Division, which is crazy. But we grew up in the same neighborhood. Get the fuck out. Uh, skateboarding in his backyard. His, his, his parents had a, um, uh, a swimming pool, but it was empty. So it was like a nine-foot yeah. pool. So <laughs> that's California. what we met was like in uh, the fifth grade skateboarding. Yeah. Um, if anybody's ever seen the movie Thrashing. Oh, yeah. Remember that? And, yeah. Um, um, who was the guy that starred in No Country for Old Men? Uh, Tommy Lee Jones, or are you talking about the the gnarly dude, the fucking bad guy? Not the gnarly guy, the uh, the the cowboy that finds the money that he's chasing around. Oh, um, fuck! He started in the Goonies and shit. Yeah, uh, I can't think of his fucking name, but yeah, yeah. And regardless, he stars in Thrashing. He yeah. is like the lead skateboard kid in that movie, which oh, is hilarious. Sure. Yeah, and I saw that movie in the theater <laughs> as a kid. But so Josh Brolin, that's it, yeah, Josh Brolin, yeah. right? So um, it's funny to watch the movie now, but. Yeah. Um, but we were all into that whole scene of like skateboarding and thinking we were like, you know, Pals Peralta, like yeah. Bones Brigade and yeah. all that. Caballero and fucking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Tony Hawk. Yeah, Tony Hawk, which Jesus Christ, that guy's still fucking doing it. But Yeah. So that that's like, so it's kind of weird. Like we're in this like world surrounded by drive-by shootings and robberies and gangster shit. Yeah. And in the Skateboard. middle of that is my buddy's house where all the kids who really weren't doing that are like jamming Red Hot Chili Peppers and Slayer and skating in the swimming pool. But that's how me and my boy uh, Chris met. And he's and so he's the one that told me about the Navy SEALs. Yeah. Um, his dad was in the Navy. His, his dad retired the Navy as well. And I was like, what? It's, I'm like, what the fuck are they called? And he's like, no, they're SEALs, man. They're like come out of submarines and like cut dudes' necks on the fucking beach. And they're like crazy. And I'm like, whoa, what's that all about? Yeah. And my dad this entire time had never once mentioned anything about the SEAL teams or UD team, nothing like that. And he was in the Navy, which is crazy to me. But so I go home and I'm like, dad, what are Navy SEALs? Tell me everything. So he kind of tells me, you know, stories that he knew and that kind of like lit the fire of that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's where all the like PTing and, and running and all the, you know, came to try to, you know, mimic that, right. I was like the biggest wannabe on the planet of earth. And, um, so, but growing up in that neighborhood, I also got into a lot of fights. Yeah. And so as I got older, you know, um, you turns know, out de- they keep track of that shit. Yeah. It turns <laughs> out they keep track of that. And apparently you just can't go around and punch people in the face and not get in trouble for it. And I am still getting in trouble for it. I mean, yeah. I, like I said, I, I told you, right. That, you yeah. know, about a year and a half ago, I got arrested for doing the same shit. So I guess it's, you know, <laughs> history repeats itself. Um, anyway, so you know, we're hanging out in the neighborhood doing our skating thing and all this bullshit. And, you know, just as I get older, I get, you know, fights and trouble. And so I had a little juvenile record. And why well, I go to join the, the Navy, this recruiter's like, hey, you ever tried drugs? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and why, he, do you have any? Yeah, do I, what do you got in that <laughs> desk there, sailor? <laughs> Fucking hoo ya, chief. And... You know, he looks at me like, you dumb motherfucker. <laughs> I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> Anybody, but he can't by law, right? So yeah. 
he like pulls me in the back room and he goes, what the fuck are you doing, dude? He goes, I, that was like the softball, like a, that's a layup, dude, a yeah. t-ball shot. You should, yeah. you, what the fuck's wrong with you? And I'm like, yeah. well, isn't this the time where I'm supposed to like come clean and like start a, start a new and just like, yeah. he's like, yes, but no, you're a fucking <laughs> idiot. And you'd be perfect for the Marines. <laughs> kind of how it worked out. So, you know, Today, yeah. there is all the pipeline for every yeah. special operations program. <coughs> then there was the Navy Diver Fair program. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. Oh, yeah. And so that's what I wanted to sign up for. But all of a sudden now, because of the juvenile record and the fact that I admitted to you know trying drugs a couple times, all of a sudden, I, I basically just clacked myself off. I yeah. Now, I didn't qualify or yeah. meet the minimum requirement to be in Diver Fair. So my only option was join the Navy and hanging out in the Fleet Navy for four years. Yeah. Or, and, or he goes, but you ever thought about joining the Marine Corps? Yeah. And I grew up in his Navy household. I'm like, the Marine Corps? Like, gunny highway shit? Like, gunnery Sergeant Hartman? <laughs> like, fucking full metal jacket Marine Corps? I'm like, are you fucking insane? Yeah. He goes, no, man, I think this is, I think this would be perfect for you. And I'm like, why? He goes, well, let, let's be honest, man. You're a dumbass, right? <laughs> and it's kind of cool, like the bigger brother, fatherly figure, yeah. this recruiter. <laughs> you know, honest, you're a fucking dumbass. Straight up, man. He was he was not pulling any punches. Yeah. He's like, you're a fucking dumbass. And he goes, and what you need desperately in your life is discipline. Yeah. He goes, none of this, like, I hate my dad, I hate my brother, fucking anti-rebellion shit that you got going on. He goes, but like some real no shit discipline. He goes, I think the Marine Corps will give it to you. And... He goes, and what's, he goes, what's crazy? He goes, those people are dumb enough to let you fire live ammunition in boot camp. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, man, that you would actually, you're going to throw a hand grenade in boot camp. You're going to like be crawling under barbed wire and fucking screaming and stabbing dummies with bayonets and shit. He goes, that is the military that you think you want to join. Yeah. And he's like, if you join the fleet Navy, he goes, and you can, man, you can sign the paperwork today if you want. No, no big deal. But he goes, I think you're just going to get into the wrong crowd. You will never, ever, ever make it to buds. Yeah. And I was like, I literally looked at him and I go, well, do you think that's what I should do? And he goes, absolutely, man. I'm like, all right, let's go, man. <laughs> and we stand up, you know, all recruiting offices are the same, right? They kind of like yeah. share a wall. And it's like, you go in, you're like, go to the left, you're in the Navy, go to the right, you're in the Marine Corps. G and go one more down. You're like, is this the Army? Fuck, I, I, I came in the wrong door. My bad, guys. Yeah. You know where the men are at? And then they tell you next door. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Army guys. You know, you're pussies. Yeah. Kidding. Thank you for your service. So... <laughs> So I go in the Marine Corps, right? And there's a guy, uh, I'll never forget him, man, Sergeant Peters from the Bronx, New York. And he stands up and he's got this thick ass New York accent. And he goes, what, how, how can I help you today? And um, this guy's name is uh, Chief Keefe, his last name. He's like, he goes, well, look, man. Chief Keefe, isn't there a fucking rapper named that or some shit? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> how do I know that? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, what the fuck's going on what out here? What the fuck's here? going on out here? Isolation, man. That's right. Now you're listening to hip hop. I love That's it. Right. That's right. So. He's like, well, look, man, he was going to join the Navy, wants to be a SEAL, but he can't because he has uh, prior criminal history and he, you know, dabbled in some drugs. And that dude goes, that's it? He's like, when do you want to leave the boot camp? And I'm like, as soon as possible. He goes, well, come on in, man. That's it. And um, it, was, like, it was like he was surprised that that was the only shit I had going on. Yeah. And it's – any Marine listening to this will know exactly what I'm talking about. When you go in there, they, they have these – the uh, – they, they call them recruit tags or motivational tags. Whatever. And I think there's like seven or eight of them, but they're all different colored, right? And they lay it out and they're like, you know, it says like motivation, uh, physical fitness, team, you know, team, you know, you want to be a fucking bad, whatever they say, right? And you, then the, and the recruiter's like, what three of those <laughs> do you want, do you, are you here for? And you're like, oh, I want to be motivated. Shh. You're like, oh man, I need discipline. That guy just told me, and I slide it in front of myself, <laughs> and then, and I'm like, oh man, I love PT, yeah, physical fitness, right? And so now there's the three tags sitting there, and yeah. then he takes the rest. He like pulls a drawer open, <laughs> scoops the rest. He's like, now let me tell you how the Marine Corps can give you exactly what you want out of life. Oh, for fuck and I was literally, I was like, <laughs> and then he like shows me this cool video oh, of these fuck. guys like. Like it's a mini like Mount Suribachi urban warfare yeah. thing. And I'm like, what? And he goes, that's our, he goes, that's the Marine Corps, bro. Everybody does that shit. And I'm like, well, fucking howdy duty, man. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to sign right now. And he's like, here you go, man. Press hard. Seven copies. Right. And I was like, I was like, you know, scratch my name into it. And we've all done it. Right. Yeah. And like three days later, man, I was, I was headed off the boot camp. No fucking shit. What, yeah. So what, that was what? What year was that? Ninety five. That was November of nineteen ninety two. 
So you went straight out of fucking high school. Straight out of high school yeah. into the into the Marine Corps. Yeah. God damn. So tell me tell me about the fucking the Marine Corps experience for four years. The Marine Corps experience is you know, it's, it's unique. I, and again, man, you know, it's, it's funny looking back at all this stuff. Cause I think I'm like this hardcore kid. You know what I mean? I think about like you were my age at the time. I was 18 years old when I went in, you were 18 at buds. Yeah. And you know, I think your parents had to sign a waiver for you to go. Right. They did, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Think about, so think about how like young and like oh, know, fired up and all this nuts. shit. And I think I'm like, this bad motherfucker. I'm like, yeah, yeah I got some street smarts, fucking white kid from the hood. Da, da, da. <laughs> and then that, like the bus pulls up and the drill instructor jumps on, starts screaming about what fucking building you're at, get off the bus. But now you're standing on these yellow footprints. Right. And that's like the Marine yeah. Corps thing is like, yeah. you know, that you've stood in these yellow footprints and to earn the title. And they're like, you know, through these doors, the finals for fuck. And you're just like, ah, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you're just, you know, you got like the little folder with you. You know, long ass hair. You're like all fucked up and retarded, <laughs> and you literally just want to like start killing motherfuckers. It's very yeah. in it, the indoctrination prog- oh, process yeah. of being in the Marine Corps, man. Y- yeah. You know, and you go through there, and you know, it's like, hey, man, shaved head. You know, you strip you down naked, and they give you all like Marine Corps shit to wear, and, yeah. and, and it's and it's funny because you like got this fucked up, um, hoodless pullover hoodie, right? And it's it's silver. And they take a stencil. So my, the platoon I was in was Platoon 1098, right? Alpha Company. And they take boot polish and, and that's how they, they put it on there. It's like real stencil, right? But you just come out of getting your head scraped down. And, by, the, and they shave your head in like nine fucking seconds. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, I, I, yeah. And it's the, if you watched a video today of kids being dropped off down there, it's the same guy that cut my hair <laughs> oh, <shit>. over 25 <laughs> years ago. So this dude is like getting paid by the second. I don't know yeah. what the fuck he's doing down yeah. there, but like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? But so, you know, you go in there and you're just like, burp, you're skinheaded and you're like, holy shit. And you put that, this hoodie on <laughs> and the inside, cause it, you know, it's probably the cheapest thing they could find all the fuzz and shit on the inside. It's never been washed and brand new, right? So it's like on everybody's head. <laughs> yeah. So you stand there and you can you can only stand at attention and you can't scratch, you can't do this shit. And, and then they start teaching you how to talk in a third person to like drop being an individual, right? Yeah. So if I, so an example would be if I wanted to go take a piss and you were my drill instructor, Sergeant Ritland, I would walk up to you standing in attention, of course, screaming. I would say, sir, this recruit requests permission to make a head call. And you would be like, what? Louder, louder, <laughs> say it louder. La, 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 la. And you're screaming, right? <laughs> right? And they'd be like, you know, Sergeant, Rit- Sergeant Ritland, recruit Osmond, request permission to make a head call, sir. Do it. And you're fucking running in there and you're like, you know what I mean? But everything's like in the third person. You can't yeah. do shit without asking. Yeah. And so now you're standing at attention, right? So imagine this like hallway full of fucking retards. And you're all in there. <laughs> America's finest, I can tell you, you're not. I am not. I'm just a fucking dumbass kid that joined the Marine Corps. Anyway, um, but you're standing there, right? So your fucking head's itching, eyes are burning, and everybody's got like these cotton balls. <laughs> fuzz all over your freshly shaved <laughs> Oh, dude, it is the most fucked up look. Like, yeah. To me, that's the recruiting poster, yeah. <laughs> right? Not like... You know, Sergeant Badass and all this, yeah. other, you know what I mean? So, doing an obstacle course. You're fighting a dragon, yeah. Yeah. you know, with the sword, <laughs> climbing a side of a building, you know, yeah. climbing a castle and fighting a dragon with the yeah. Mameluke sword, you know what I mean? All this shit. Yeah. It's like, no, you should be showing that. Be like, hey, man, that's what's really, really going to happen <laughs> yeah. to you. It's, it's a horrible experience. Yeah. But but in yeah. that, that transformational process, you really, you know, for the first time I found out, you know, who I was, I think, and really took to the discipline of the Marine Corps and I really loved being in the Marine Corps. Like I absolutely was yeah. all about it, man. I was like belt fed high and tight, yeah. like fucking crazy ass Marine. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I, the one thing that, uh, without, without a doubt, like of all the branches, like the Marine Corps boot camp, fucking, you know, there, there is no, no peer with that. I mean, that sets the fucking standard for the boot camp experience and the indoctrination, the fucking, the we'll call it brainwashing frankly you know oh I mean, it like, is brainwashing like there, there's, there's no doubt about it yeah i mean like the, I, don't, I don't think there's a an entity that exists that that can fucking condition people to go from being some slack-jawed fucking civilian asshole to yeah to being a fucking you know dude ready to to go jump on a fucking grenade and 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 
crank 12, them out yeah. by the hundreds, you know, yeah, like, 12 to 13 weeks later, you're, yeah. you're, you're wanting to, you want to be that guy. You want to yeah. dive on a hand grenade to save yeah. your, your, save your friends. And you're yeah, like, like, wow. Yeah. I mean, their ability to, in, yeah. I mean, their, their ability to infuse fucking confidence and motivation and, and, uh, just kind of like a, like an allegiance to the Marine Corps, but like blows all the other services out of the water. I mean, it it's does. one thing like hats off to the fucking to the marine corps for that i mean they, yeah. they do a, a fantastic job one thing I've, I've always i always laugh my ass off is like you see especially now with cell phones and cameras fucking everywhere some of the videos of like there will be like two two drill instructors just fucking dressing down some motherfucker like yeah. you, you can't even like i can't even pretend to understand what the fuck they're saying right like and, what, then, and then you go to the va 20 years later and you're like hey i have ringing in my ears and you're yeah. like no that's not service connected <laughs> yeah, that you're like let me show you some videos you're yeah. like yeah i did that for yeah. 13 weeks yeah but like uh, i don't know i don't understand why i have ringing in my ears yeah but like to me your your voice has I mean, that's why I was joking about it in the intro. Like, it has that, like, you have almost that fucking drill instructor fucking tone to it. Like, all, all Marines have a little bit of that fucking... Yeah, that, I, that you know, I, I do believe that my voice changed, like, my vocal cords yeah. from screaming so loud. And then later on, and like I said, man, I was a really, really motivated um, Marine. Um, I think if I went back now, I'd, I'd probably end up in the brig in a month. But, <laughs> yeah, no shit. Um you know, I was meritoriously promoted in boot camp, which is not easy to do. And then less than a year later, God, it must have been, man. I was I was 20 years old when I was pinned corporal, and I was meritoriously promoted to corporal. So I was meritoriously promoted twice in like 13 or 14 months or some shit like that. Sure. Um, so I was just like uber belt fed, yeah. like into it. So I was, you know, really, you know, part of um, – the Marine Corps is close order drill, which is the left, right, left, right, left. And, you know, you have to be really good at drill. If, you know, my, and I, at the time I was like, yeah, man, I'm going to, I'm going to go be a drill instructor. Yeah. Cause they're, you know, they're, you know, you have to do a B billet, right? Or is what we call shore duty in the Navy. But, you know, if you're a sergeant or above, eventually you got to do some type of B billet. So you can be a recruiter, you can be a drill instructor, you know, whatever, but you're, you're going to do a B billet. Right. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to be a drill instructor. And so that was like my whole jam, man. So I was always, <laughs> and, I, and I really do think that from all the cadences and all the bullshit and the yelling, you know, yeah. for you, I, I think it warped my, my vocal cords. Yeah. Did you ever, you never did become a, a drill instructor? No. So, um, I just, here's <laughs> funny. So on my first deployment in the Marine Corps, we go to Somalia and the big thing about the Marine Corps is every, everyone's a rifleman, right? So that's yeah. why everybody shoots the same quals in boot camp. Everybody throws a hand grenade and does the bayonet course and all this hoo shit. Or, I'm sorry, oorah. It's my oorah shit. <laughs> fucking haters out there. Yeah. They're going to blow your shit. Like, he said hoo yeah. We should have said oorah. What kind of fucking savage is that? The people don't miss a fucking thing. I'll tell you what. They don't, man. God damn. No, no. There's somebody right now listening that will listen to this yeah. and pick oh, my yeah. shit apart. Oh, and, yeah. and, and three weeks from now, yeah, blow, you me said up it on, wrong. blow me up on the gram, a DM yeah. me at 2 o'clock in the morning and tell me what a piece of shit I am. <laughs> um, so... You know, so I go on this deployment, and I'm in artillery, so I didn't even do anything, like, super cool, but it was a shit job. Um, it was a tough job, actually, artillery, but um, – so we end up being becoming a provisional rifle company because, you know, every Marine's a rifleman. So, so we're going to go to Somalia, and the United Nations was leaving. So this is, like, the first couple of months of, like, 1995. I think the name of it was Operation Restore Hope or something like that. Anyway, so – you know, for months we're like prepping to go and we're like, holy shit, man, we're going to fucking hit the beach. You know, and, and of course in the Marine Corps, you're thinking this is like, you know, you're in, you're hitting Tarawa, Guadalcanal, like mm -hmm. Iwo Jima. I mean, this is like all the history of stuff that the Marine Corps beats into you. You know, you, you yeah. learn shit from like 1775, the, the history of the Marine Corps and all these historic battles and shit. Um, so you're like hyper motivated. Right. And I remember being in the hangar deck and they're like, here's your live ammo. We're like, no fucking way. We're like Jack and Mags and we're like all excited and shit. And we land, you know, pre-dawn. This, L, you know, this LCAC, this landing craft air cushion, this big ass hovercraft yeah. takes us in. And, um, you know, what's funny is they have these huge um, boxes, almost like cattle car almost, but they got these little seats in it and it's all strapped down. So I don't even know how many Marines it holds, a couple hundred, let's say. And we're all in there. And I'm like, man, this thing fucking thing sinks. We're all dead. Like you can't get out. Yeah. 
you're fucked. But of course, we're all wearing, you know, the rubber life jacket because it's just in case. Um, so we can all float to the top and drown together. I guess it was like you'll be trapped as it sinks. You're fucking stuck on the top of yes, it. Yes, yes. <laughs> just like, hey man, we're not gonna, we're gonna make sure we really do it right because if one thing they do, they do shit right. And like, we're not shit. killing one. We're killing all of these motherfuckers. <laughs> so. But I remember like hitting the beach and coming out and, you know, everybody's like taking a knee and they're all like, Hoo, uh. so we take off and, you know, our whole deal was to, to patrol down to the, um, uh, to the airport and di- and dig our own fighting positions into these sand berms. And basically we're going to guard the airport as the United Nations was leaving. And, um, so as we're cruising down the fucking beach, I spot some Z birds, right? Some Zodiacs sitting there up on the beach and as we get c- closer and closer now you gotta remember there's like 150 of us right we got 50 cal machine gun f- you know mark 19s all the uh, all the bullshit mm. and we sound like you know two skeletons fucking on a tin roof right <laughs> noisy as fuck right there's zero discipline and noise discipline in, in a movement like that you're just like humping all this shit and we're rolling up the beach and this dude like wakes up and he's like laid out on this on the on the the fucking pontoon of this z- Zodiac. He's got a boonie cover on. He lifts it up and he's like, Hey, you guys, are you guys alpha battery? And we're like, ah, ah. and he's like, Shh, Hey man, keep it down, bro. We're sleeping. And he literally points. He's like, Hey man, your guy's spot is down there about a hundred yards. And we're like, sir, thank you, sir. And we don't even know who the fuck we're talking to. And it was the seals and the recon Marines. And as we walk past him, I remember these guys are literally getting, I mean, they're like laid out for suntans. Yeah. And I'm like, in all this fuck, fucked up flat jacket <laughs> helmet that was crooked, my you know fucked up goggles, like all this dumb shit, and I'm like, wait a minute, man. I thought for the last four years I've been told we're the first to fight, we're the first in, nobody goes before us, blah 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 blah. And then for four days I got you know we were um, there, you know, getting shot at, returning fired. It was really my first combat experience, being mortared, RPGs being fired at us, um, small arms fired, all this shit. But again, you know, this, this whole time I'm like in a fucking hole being bit up by flies yeah. and these dudes are like already back on the ship. They're like, <laughs> no, we came in, we did our little recon, yeah. put out some chem lights. Here's where you go. Dumbass. Good luck. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're just hanging out in the air conditioning and I, yeah. and, it, and I was like, man, fuck, I really got to be in special operations. Yeah. This sucks. <laughs> so, so, yeah. the, so the whole time, uh, while you were the four years that you spent, like, were you did you still always have that in the back of your mind, or, or that you were planning on crossing over and, and going into the SEAL teams? No, so when I was in, I um learned about the the reconnaissance community, right? So the, back then there was battalion recon and, and first force recon, or you know, east coast was second force. And you know, I looked up to those guys the, the same as I did anybody. I mean, they're just like some hardcore, like pipe hitting guys, you know, really, really dedicated to, to their craft. Um, and so I screened for recon and passed all their, their stuff I actually came in first place. And that was in 1995, but I, I couldn't go because back then in order to be in recon or scout sniper, that was a secondary MOS. Mm. So now oh, it's yeah. a primary. Yeah. So now it's a primary MOS. You can go to the recruiter and you're like, Hey man, I'm going to be in recon and, you know, and sign up and, and yeah. go through a pipeline to become an O three twenty one. Whereas then it was a secondary MOS Yeah. and I couldn't go there unless you were a grunt motor T or a communicator and I was artillery. So I couldn't, I couldn't get orders to go. Oh, shit. Yeah. So the, uh, so that sealed the deal in terms of you wanting to come over into the fucking Navy then. Yeah. 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 What, how, how did that fucking process go? So I called the recruiter, um, and asked him if I could leave the Marine Corps and, and join the Navy and go through buds. And you'll remember this name, Staff Sergeant Elliot. Oh yeah, that mother. No shit. Yeah. So he's like, <laughs> and so the 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 random motherfucker that picks the phone up in Oceanside, this Navy recruiter's like, yeah, man, I just did it for this guy that left first force named Staff Sergeant Elliot. And I'm like, I go, would I have to be from recon or force? He's like, no, man, as long as you, no, I know, and I know exactly how to do. It. I just did it with him. Yeah. I'm like, cool, man. And I literally jumped in the car a few hours, and I was up there a few hours later, um, and I spent about four to five months you know, doing all the paperwork because you, you have to join the service all over again. Yeah. And so I had to take time off from the, you know, put in, um, you know, leave shit, take a couple of days. So I could like retake the ASVAB and imagine me like, <laughs> here I am. I was, I was a Sergeant at the time. So here's Sergeant Osmond with his high end stupid yeah. at a fucking high school 
right? With my polo shirt tucked in, with my fucking jean shorts, and I, you know, with my belt on. Like, yeah. I mean, Mer I wish Marine. I had pictures. I wish I had pictures of that because you know, in the your civilian wear is a uniform in the yeah. Marine Corps. Yeah. So they regulate what you can wear. The Marine civilian uniform. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's fucking insane, yeah. dude. Um, so there I am, just like dorked out. You know, um, I'm at fucking pegged max jarhead, but I'm at a high school, right? Taking the ASVAB test and shit. So it was an interesting experience. Um, but I use my, I use my exit physical from the Marine Corps as my entrance physical for the Navy. And also because, you know, we had to do a dive physical. So I knew a couple of the guys over at first force recon and I went over there and asked for a favor. Say, Hey man, can you guys do this exit physical, but m make it a diving physical? Cause I'm trying to get orders to buds. Yeah. And these dudes laughed their fucking <laughs> balls off. They're like, what, you skinny-ass yeah. motherfucker? You can't even do five pull-ups. You know what I mean? And yeah. uh, uh, But they were like, but they were just busting my balls, I think, you know, in typical, like, good luck. You know, you yeah. have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. And uh, But I got the hookup. So I left the, the Marine Corps at, like, 9 a.m., gave my ID card. I get my DD-214, jumped in my car, and drove down to MEPS in downtown San Diego and I swore in that day at 1,300. Oh, shit. Yeah. So I was, a, I was a civilian, like, less than eight hours. God damn. So you went and smoked a bowl in between? I did not, no. <laughs> I can't smoke weed. I've done a lot of fucking drugs, I will say that to, to everybody. I'm like, I, I'm an open book, as you know. You've yeah. known me a very, yeah. very long yeah. time. And uh, But I never did any on active duty, right? I wasn't in that <laughs> crowd. There was definitely, you know, the the boys that did that shit, but I was, I was never into it on active duty. But I yeah. think when I got out, off active duty and i was like and i held my shit together pretty well but then i think it was like the 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 you know the champagne bottle yeah. that somebody shakes up and it was like boom and i'm like hmm, let me try this let me try that and i just yeah. i went a little fucking crazy there for a minute but this was after you got out after i got out yeah yeah, yeah. and i was out for years yeah. um and i tried smoking weed but you know california has the best weed in the world yeah. and it's really really powerful like you know crazy medical grade um, and I would take like one hit off that thing. It wouldn't matter if it was a joint. It didn't matter if it was a bowl, fucking water, but it didn't matter. Fucking Coke can, apple. I've tried it all. <laughs> and I'm a one hit wonder, man. I'll, yeah. I'll take one hit and I'll, and it's funny. Like my body like locks up and I'm catatonic. Yeah. So I, if, if, if picture me, if I just smoked a joint 10 minutes ago, this interview would be a one-way conversation because I, I can't even, <laughs> I can't even talk back. Yeah. So I sit there just like mummified. And the and the walls like move and it and oh, it's, yeah, fucks you the up, spatial man. awareness is really really yeah. bad. It like and that's not like no matter how you smoke it, no matter what kind of weed it, it like no just anything. No. Huh? no shit. Yeah. What, so what uh, what's the hardest fucking shit you've ever tried? De I've de definitely tried cocaine. Um, tried meth. Fuck, you've is, tried meth. Yeah, I, sn I snorted <laughs> meth. Jesus fuck. Yeah. Um, you got you, you got to walk me through that. Like, what the fuck was that like? It's it's interesting because it um, you know I've tried damn what have I tried I've tried acid weed you ever tried heroin never tried heroin um, so I've done acid weed um, mushrooms snorted meth once which was pretty rad Adderall I mean I've tried a lot of shit yeah well, um, what was the fucking meth experience like because I know that shit's fucking like it's a pretty significant problem around here and, and in a lot of rural areas. But yeah, well, I, th I mean, I don't know, you know, I, it's interesting to that whole dynamic of like drug use. Like why does a guy like Adam Brown, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, God rest his soul, right. And his, ex his experience, right. Why does a guy like that try it? Why does a guy like me try it? It's, 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 you know, in a, in a lot of ways, maybe I'm like, man, why are, it can't be like, why do these people get addicted to it? Maybe I can control it. It can't control me. To, I don't, I don't know what it is, man. Like if somebody had a gun to my head and said, Hey, why'd you try that? I think I was like, man, I just wanted to try it. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, what's all the hype about? Yeah. All, you know, how, how fucked up can you really get on this stuff? Right. Yeah. And, um, so I snorted it, Fucking snorted it, snorted it and it burns like a motherfucker. And, um, you know, it's like that scene in, um, Oh God! What's that Quentin Tarantino movie? Uh, like Kill Bill or uh, not Kill, Pulp Fiction? Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Oh right? yeah. John Travolta comes out of the bathroom and yeah. she snorts that fucking uh, heroin he's got because she thinks yeah. it's cocaine. Yeah. She's like, <laughs> nose is burning. I kind of felt like that, no like shit. in a weird way. And I was like, holy shit, man! Is is it, is it supposed to be? They're like, oh yeah, bro. 
as you know, you're was, fine. You're totally fine, bro. <laughs> and what Fuck. I didn't know is that all it is, all it is, is an upper, right? It's an, it's a, uh, methamphetamine, obviously. So, you know, an Adderall, <clears throat> anybody who takes Adderall knows that, you know, you take a pill of 10 milligram, 20 milligram, 30 milligram, whatever, you know, you can be up for 12, 18 hours on just taking an Adderall pill. I snorted that shit and I was up for almost two fucking days. Oh shit. Yeah. You can't shut, you can shut your eyes, but you're not going to sleep. It's, it's very, you're just, but you're just like awake. So it wasn't like high. It was like, yeah, you're not, you don't have the feeling of high, like from, um, taking shrooms where you're like halluc- hallucinating and you're having a good time and you like want to run through the fields, you know, lions, tigers, and bears and do all that weird shit <laughs> or smoking weed. And you know, you get that euphoric high from that or even being drunk. You're yeah. just really, really awake. And I was, and I was like, man, why the fuck do I just want to be awake? It, yeah. it doesn't do shit other than I'm awake. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know shit about it other than that. Yeah, I see people like, you're going to find out tonight. Yeah. I got a gram in my bag. <laughs> You see, uh, I mean, you, you can see these fucking tweakers at Walmart, like just lives ruined, like all fucked up and strung yeah. the fuck out. So is, is it that that's always I, I've never understood that I've never understood why being awake. Like, let's say your life is miserable, because let's be honest, man, the people yeah, that you're you seeing these fucking tweakers, why yeah. would you want to be awake to experience <laughs> yeah. it? What you want to take the other one yeah. where you're like fucking depressant. Yeah, depressing where you're sleeping all the time. You're like, yeah. hey, you know, it, it's like being on a uh, an ARG deployment in the yeah. Navy, right, or the Marine Corps. It's a six month deployment, but if I sleep twelve hours a day, well, yeah. technically I've been on deployment for for three months. Yeah, it's like right? a, it's like a shit merry go round that you can't fucking get off of. Yeah, so you're like, hey man, I'm homeless. I have you know one tooth in my head. Yeah. You know, my skin's crawling and I'm all fucked up and I got blisters on my face. My skin, you know what I mean? All these, like you see these like before and after pictures, oh, right? Oh man, they're all fucked up. Yeah. And you're like, but I want to keep doing that and I want to stay awake. because yeah. I've never understood the, uh, the addiction side of it because yeah. I've, I, you know, I've tried a lot of shit, but nothing's ever, thank God, nothing's ever, <laughs> nothing's ever grabbed a hold of me and yeah. been like, I, you know, I, I don't Your mean, mind now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't get it either. I see, you know, people get addicted to fucking everything, but uh, I've, I've never really had that kind of personality. I guess I don't know. I've been fortunate. I've, I don't have shit to compare it to. It. That's never been anything I've, I've had any interest in. But uh, I'm always fascinated though by. Uh, like some of those fucking narc shows or dope or whatever the fuck, like some of these Netflix specials sure. that show like all, all facets of it where it's like, it's, you know, like I, I watched one or I think it was cocaine where it like starts out in the Andes mountains, you know, and right. it's like, it's a grand, a, a kilo at that point, you know, and it gets transported by fucking mule, like to, you know, across three fucking countries. By the time it makes it to, I, I don't remember what fucking country. I think it's Brazil, maybe uh, in a port in Brazil. Like at that point, it's worth ten thousand dollars. Yeah, you know, just being there, and then from there it goes to I think it was Puerto Rico. Um, because yeah, Puerto Rico. Because once it's there, like it can go from Puerto Rico to to Florida without any real fucking inspections. Right. And so, like once it hits the ground, like if you if you can get it to um to puerto rico now it's fucking 20 grand a key and yeah. then from there like it's it's relatively easy by comparison to get it to uh to florida and the, and the second it's in florida it's forty thousand a kilogram it's right like, jesus fucking christ but so it, it's kind of a fascinating show because it shows the supply element it shows and then and then the dealers like all of the people involved along the way and then the and then the hustlers and fucking dealers from the high level guys that are moving, you know, 40 fucking kilograms of it at a time mm-hmm. all the way down to the fucking, you know, crackhead that's slinging fucking nine grams at yeah. a time or whatever. And then, and then it also shows the law enforcement aspect of, you know, combating it and then the cat and mouse game and whatever. But I, I, I've always, I shouldn't say always, I've, I've recently been somewhat fascinated by, uh, by just that whole process and seeing like how many people just ruin their fucking life over some stupid shit like that. And like, I, yeah. I just don't fucking get it. You know? Yeah. I've never had that any desire to ever sell it to trans. I'm like, you know, like I, I've never understood how people get yeah. involved. In I got enough shit. shit to worry about. Yeah. I'm like, Hey man, I'm just trying to get to the fucking gym and fight my war and weakness. Like yeah. I'm not trying to like, you know, also be a fucking anal pack mule for fucking, you know, <laughs> You know, no, that's, eight, that's ball, later eight ball of blow. But we're also yeah. doing that because I, you know, I got that in the trunk. The anal pack mule later. Yeah. Um, it's the name of my new band, Anal Pack Mule. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, um, but yeah, it's an interesting, you know, what I also find very funny, it's hilarious actually to me. You're not from California, right? 
which, you know, I don't know if your listeners know this, but it's a very, very red, blue collar Republican state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like Texas. Yeah. Yeah. It's the first Texas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what's weird about that is that it's so f- liberal, right? And it's just fucking, and it's so crazy with the environmentalists yeah. and people are like, oh my God, you got to stop. What are you doing? You're using a fucking straw. Yeah. Do you know it's killing a turtle? I'm like, well, the one that I'm holding isn't. Yeah. Whoever was irresponsible and didn't throw it in the garbage can, I don't know how it ended up in the ocean and up a turtle's fucking asshole. I don't know how it ended up there, but it did. But anyway, so the, the people lose their mind about the environment, yeah. about you know sea creatures and all this other shit. But most of them do cocaine, yeah, because that's like the Hollywood designer drug, right? So yeah. any of those parties you go to, there's mountains of that shit around. Oh shit! Sure. So you've got these people who are on TV and in magazines screaming about the environment, about yeah. you know drive an electric car, how dare you use something that uses oil, right? It's it's like the protesters, right? Remember, you know the gas no platforms in California no, yeah. used to train on, right? Yeah. So up near like Monterey, one of the like pipelines broke and it like leaked a little bit of oil, fucking whatever. It shit happens, right? I guess. Um, you got to take with the good or the bad. Yeah. Well, they're out there protesting. Yeah, and like kayaks. But they're in kayaks made of <laughs> petroleum. And I'm like, motherfucker, you, <laughs> the crude oil you're bitching about yeah. it was molded into the thing you're sitting in and floating on. Yeah. So just the whole... Yeah. Um, oh, they're so fucking twisted. It, it to me, it's just hilarious. But I, I, I think it's funny because in that show that you watched about the production of drugs, and then everything that's involved in it, from you know, what do you guys say, the rooter to the tutor? When you guys are barbecuing out here, so from the rooter to the tutor, <laughs> um, the environmental damage, yeah. and the chemicals and all the crazy shit that is involved in producing cocaine meth any of that shit yeah it like fucks up the environment like really really bad yeah but they'll be at a party snorting cocaine talking about how i shouldn't be using a fucking straw so it's very weird to me well and they got there via private jet and yeah i mean it's like you know the the fucking hypocrisy with that shit drives me nuts yeah um all right, so back back to the uh, the transfer over into the Navy. Obviously, you didn't have to go through Navy boot camp because you're no. a Marine. Did you did you go straight from being uh, or you know straight into the Navy? Did you go right to Buds or how did that? Uh, yeah, so I was an E five in the in the Marine Corps, and I had to I couldn't join the Navy as an E five. I had to join as an E four. So I started my time in rank all over again. Uh, so that was kind of like a that pissed me off a little Slapping bit. Slapping the dick. Yeah, so um, I waited around like five weeks. I was at this transient processing unit, this like barracks thing that we showed up to every day. And like, you know, I was in my um, dungarees. Remember those badass? Oh, yeah. Remember the dungarees? I still dung- have them, still rock them. The, du- the dunga jams, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you ever want to pick up chicks, you wear that. And fucking A. Um, so I'm in these like dungarees. And of course, I go like literally, like I say, man, what, call it a Thursday. I'm in the United States Marine Corps. I'm Sergeant Osmond, and on Friday, I'm in fucking dungarees. You're third-class fucking Osmond. Yeah, and God there I am, man. Petty Officer Osmond, and I'm like, <laughs> what in the blue fuck is going on around here? And like, still had my high and tight with my Dixie cup on. It's just classic, man, this hilarious shit. So I hung out there for about five weeks, um, and the chief was really cool. I went and told him who I was, and I, was, you know, I'm waiting on my orders to go to Bud's. And, you know, I just, I was like, hey, man, I... You know, muster with you guys in the morning, but is there any way I can like break away from doing like bullshit paint the rock working parties to actually like work out to try to prepare myself to go to Buzz? He's really cool, man. He, he let me do it. So, um, you know, hats off to that guy, whoever yeah. he was. But and so you did that for six weeks, five weeks, five weeks, yeah. and then straight to fucking class straight, straight to Buds. And then I want to say I was there maybe two weeks before um, it was head shaving party. And but I started with class two thirteen. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. And went through Hell Week and then uh, part of second phase for I had my uh, leg injury and then I was did a double roll so I was in PTRR for four months. Yeah, so you went two thirteen to two fifteen because I yeah. started two fourteen. I remember, in fact, I have a picture. I thought I, I may have sent it to you. Um, you worked the fucking Hell Week, uh, my Hell Week. Like you were one of the brown shirt rollback support assholes for uh, nice. for Hell Week. So yeah. 
Yeah, because I remember, uh, in fact, because uh, you were you were one of the guys I gave. Back then, this was before digital cameras. I mean, they existed, but nobody really had them. Right. And uh, so everybody bought those little cheese dick fucking disposable cameras. Yep. Uh, and I, I remember I handed one to you and one to a couple other guys and whatever. And, uh, you know, I get it back and there's like a picture of you standing there like with your hand on your hip fucking smiling. And then like 28 <laughs> fucking pictures of ball sack. Like, yeah. <laughs> fucking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks, buddy. Fucking. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like a whole fucking roll of camera just wasted fucking yeah. shots of you fucking around being an asshole. But uh, those aren't uh, wasted shots. Yeah, those true. are those, those are cherished moments. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that was, I mean, look, I was the Jackson Pollock of my time, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, shit. Andy Warhol's a yeah, pussy. Did you, you see that. my ball sack hanging out on the beach? You know, come That's on, That's art, goddammit. That's right. The uh, yeah, so you know, our our time and buds didn't didn't really uh, mesh or or cross paths in terms of working with each other until we both get rolled into third phase, uh, or I guess you had, second phase. You got rolled into second, so I, and then I I joined third phase of two fifteen. But uh, do you remember when you and I met? Probably I, not. But I don't know if we. I remember when we met. I remember you being in Hell Week though, and um, for all the listeners here, how. The name Mikey Big Balls Ritlin and Forty Mike Mike came to be. So, <laughs> so I, just so you guys all know, when you're going through Hell Week, it's a miserable experience because you're soaking wet and you're freezing and you're you're basically in a hypothermic state the whole time. So everybody's dick, for a lack of a better term, looks like a button on a fur coat. It's the best way to describe it, right? You have an Audi, now you have an Innie, and you're like, wow, I didn't know it can actually be that small. But sure as fuck, it gets really, really fucking small. But not Mikey Big Balls Ritlin. Dude comes around the corner and you were like changing out because every day you got to change out in a new greens. And of course they're in they're in buckets of water. So you're you're like you're like, hey man, here's your fresh uniform, but it's yeah. soaking fucking wet before you even put it on. And here comes Mike swinging his fucking flesh bat. <laughs> Right. And everybody, and I remember yeah. like being in as a student and like the instructors, everybody was like, what in the fuck? And like turned everybody's head. <laughs> And then you got a picture now. Mike is like this emaciated kid, Looks 18 like I years just old. just broke out of Auschwitz. Yeah. So he's like emaciated. So he checks in the buzz, what, weighing 145, you think? Yeah, fuck if that. So in hell week, right, day three, you probably lost 15 pounds. Now you're like, let's say you're a solid 130 pounds, right? Oh, yeah. And yeah, you're nice. walking around with this fucking tripod. <laughs> And everybody's like, what in the fuck? So that's where everybody started calling you Mikey Big Balls. Is that where I came from? Or did, yeah. Yeah. I, or, and then I, later on the teams, when we we're like, yo, man, do you think you could put your dick into this 40 <laughs> Mike Mike? And he cannot, I would say. So then it became 40 thought, Mike Mike. I, I need to get. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> that's not, what I should have saved the camera for. <laughs> like, this story is useless without pictures, right? <laughs> I need to, but I, picture I, 20 guys going through SQT trying to talk Mikey Big Balls real in, into putting his cock into a 40 Mike Mike shell. Or forty Mike Mike and can't do it, so then his nickname changed to Forty Mike Mike. I think uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get this as a testimonial for my grinder account. If you don't mind, if you don't mind doing that, <laughs> please do, please do. <laughs> All right, so Hell Hell Week went well. <laughs> hell Week went really well. And uh, so yeah, so you worked worked my Hell Week, and uh, thanks for the flattering, fucking embarrassing story. But uh, anyway. The so hell week goes well. We uh, we end up joining fucking uh, joining forces, I guess you'd call it. But I remember very specifically when we first met, and here's here's why: is because I absolutely fucking hated you when we first met. That's not the it, first it, person it, that's ever said that. But but here's why: is that uh, the it, it, you probably don't recall because I think you probably treated everybody this way. But uh, like here you are, this disgruntled fucking E four. Four years in the fucking Marines, and and I'm a you know an 18 year old fucking asshole from Iowa. Like my my whole experience is the Navy, and uh, and fucking you know as soon as we met because we were in the same we were in the the same boat crew. Like the first thing you do is you walk up and like you size me up and down. And you're like, are you fucking kidding me? And I was like, what what? <laughs> you know, I like, did. Yeah, wow. you're like you fucking. Su fucking soup sandwich bag of mashed assholes no fucking discipline having mother like just start dressing me down like you're a fucking boot boot camp fucking drill instructor and like you you were nitpicking my fucking uniform my haircut the fucking shave oh man and i remember the, like the, the the straw for me was uh you were like are you fucking kidding me with those boots and i was like they're fucking shine what the you know like what the fuck 
And you're like, no, asshole, the fucking, the blouse goes between the fucking 13th and the oh, 14th yeah, the first fucking, and the second or whatever the fuck it was. I was just bullshit, like, dude, yeah. are you fucking serious right now? Like, like that, that was my, <laughs> that was my impression of you in, in, in third phase was yeah. like, that was, that was my, uh, my intro to Chris Osmond. I was like, oh my fucking God, He's I'm a, stuck with this fucking asshole. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is, you know, obviously there was zero time between the Marine Corps and going to Bud's, right? So my only experience is this fucking Sergeant Osmond guy, yeah. right? And when I, what's funny is I checked into Team 3, and I go to my platoon space, right, Echo Platoon, and I walk in there, and I'm in my uniform, and it's like all fucking ironed and starch, and I got my fucking cover and fucking <laughs> dialed in. So I walk in, in the Marine Corps, you check in what they call six and center, right? I mean, you, you may remember that from the yeah. Navy, right? Six inches from the desk and, you know, centered and all this other shit. So I go in there, and I'm like, "Petty Officer Osmond reporting for duty, sir." And I'm, he's like, <laughs> and, he, "And and he, I'll never forget, man. My my lieutenant, platoon commander, is barefoot, right? <laughs> in his catch me fuck knees with a tank top on, and he's listening to Jimmy Buffett. And he's playing like a, like a, a six string, like an acoustic, and." He stops. He's like, like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Like, he goes, what? And I'm like, Petty Officer Osmond reporting for duty, sir. <laughs> and he goes, listen, man, why don't you go out and try it again? That's not what we do here. So now I'm thinking that he's, I'm like not motivated enough because I'm like, you know, I'm this brainwashing Marine Corps right, shit. Which means I, you need to scream it louder. Scream it louder. So I fucking come back in there <laughs> and I'm just like screaming the fuck at the top of my lungs. And now my LPO, who I didn't even know at the time, I didn't know he was an LPO. I didn't even know what the fuck that really was other than like, hey man, this is your bud's LPO. I was like, I have no idea what a petty officer is or how to lead or how, why is he leading me? I'm like, I don't fucking know. Well, he's like reading the morning paper and he like drops it and he's like, that's Osmond, the Marine. And he flips it back up and keeps on reading his paper. Yeah. And so I'm like standing there at attention. He's like, and he's like, he goes, well, what's your name? And I'm like, Petty Officer Osmond, sir. And he goes, no, no, no. Like, what's your real name? Like, what's your chick call you? And I'm like, uh, Chris. He goes, look, he goes, Chris, I'm John. Nice to me. He stands up, shakes my hand and shit. He's like, welcome to Echo Platoon. He goes, look, dude. I, he goes, look, I don't know what the fuck thing you thought you joined but whatever you're doing in front of me right now he goes that's just not what we do here he's <laughs> yeah. like you went through buds so you could literally pretend you're not in the military but get yeah. paid by the military <laughs> yeah. he's like so look he goes you're way way too fucking crazy for me he goes i can't deal with this shit for two years man. I can't, I can't fucking do it he goes so look why don't you go to the gym go for a workout Come back tomorrow. He goes, but look, see these other guys around here? He's he like, see how they, they're in their hoodies? They kind of just look like they don't give a fuck. He goes, that's what you need to start to become. That's because they don't give a fuck. He's like, just, <laughs> he goes, unlike what you're used to, he goes, being a warrior and being an operator has nothing to do with spit shine boots and your fucking press cam. He goes, that doesn't mean a fucking thing to us. Yeah. He goes, how are you in the field at doing your job, being responsible? He goes, this is welcome to being an adult. I remember him telling me that. <laughs> And I was like, holy fuck, man. And I, as I like, as so I go like do a demo pit run or whatever fuck it in. And it like really, it took me like, I don't know, six months to a year before I really was like. Took the edge off. Took the edge off and kind of unmarine cord myself. Yeah. And then I was like, wow, this feels fucking great. And then I just went fucking high and stu high and crazy. I was like, yeah, I really don't give a fuck. Was yeah. that, uh, I mean, I guess, was that a, a hard transition to make? Like. Or was it was it more of a welcome one? It was both because it's I mean it's welcome obviously because you're judged on real performance yeah. and your real capabilities and you really you know, are developing a, a a close bond with the guys that you're in a platoon with and a team with. Unlike the Marine Corps, it's you know sergeant, corporal, yeah. lance corporal, PFC, fucking yeah, you it, know, it, sir, yes sirs. You know you don't really. There's no fraternization with fucking. <laughs> people above you pay grade wise or positional authority wise, right? Like, no, no. So I, so as an example, like I went through Marine artillery school in, in Fort Sill, Oklahoma when I was 18 and there was 19 of us that went to the same artillery unit. So we're all brand new guys. Right. And I was meritoriously promoted to corporal and I wasn't. And so we're all like boys. We all hang out at the E club. We drink fucking do whatever. And literally I get promoted and on, 
And the next time we like went to go eat chow, I couldn't even sit in the same area as them. I was now in an E4 and above. I was in the NCO fucking only area to eat fucking chow. No fucking shit. Yeah. Yeah. God and it was man. and it was like, hey, Chris, I'm like, oh, negative, Marine. It's <laughs> Corporal Osmond. <laughs> no shit. Oh God, yeah. And, and and the fucked up thing is, is if you don't enforce that discipline yeah, and then, that change, yeah. heaven for fucking bid. Yeah. Some angry ass motherfucking three time divorced gunnery sergeant walks by with a horseshoe dip in his mouth, and you're like, <laughs> hey, what's up, Bill? Then yeah. you get hammered. Yeah. And he treats you like you're a brand new fucking recruit and he smokes your ass and, you know, yeah. it, it makes you stand fucking weekend duty and takes you away your ID cards. You can't even leave the barracks. I mean, it's fucking, yeah. you know, that's yeah. the Marine Corps that I was in anyway. Yeah. I don't know what everybody else's experience is, but. Yeah. No, I mean, um, that, that seems to be pretty fucking consistent. I mean, I've got, there's a handful of Marine guys within the dog community that I, I shoot the shit with and uh, have, have talked about that. Same thing. Like, I was surprised there, like one guy was even telling me about. You know, year, he's been out for years and, uh, you know, goes to the Marine Corps ball every fucking year. That's yeah. the other thing about Marines. Like, those, like all you guys know fucking Marine history. Big time. You know, like, there, yeah. there's not a motherfucker out there that doesn't know, like, you know, the birthday. It's, like, a bigger deal than your fucking birthday. It is, you know? like, absolutely. Um, but, you know, goes to the Marine Corps ball and, like, shows up, dude, in fucking regulation. Like, there is not one fucking sliver of... of you know, gray area or no, like, you know, I'm not. like, like, what if you showed up with like a little bit of stubble? He's like, Oh fuck no. Fuck no. He's like, you know, there'd be a, 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 a gunny that's been out for 20 fucking years that will dress you. Down. Yeah. will yeah. light your fucking ass up in front of everyone. It's like, Jesus Christ. Like it just, yeah. Like that's, that's the, uh, the cookie cutter experience I think with, uh, yeah. you know, with all Marines, which I mean, to me, there's an element that's kind of cool uh, about that. I think that it's, well, I mean, it obviously is, it serves a purpose and it, yeah. and it obviously works. I mean, I, I, I would argue with anybody as far as a, a service that is built around the warfighter yeah. that is extremely, or extremely effective at going into foreign countries and fucking people up, yeah. you know, since 1775, the Marine Corps has been doing it. Obviously the army has been doing, it, you know, but you know, beyond the, like, you know, the inner service rivalry and the jokes that we all make, um, you know, the, the Marine Corps methodology is tried and true mm -hmm. and they're not changing that fucking shit for anybody. Yeah. And so that, you know, and like you say, you know, the history is like beat into you, right? Mm -hmm. Literally where you go into the teams and you're like, Oh yeah, man, remember fucking operation, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, who, what, who, <laughs> yeah. who did, you did know we, what I mean? Did we do that? <laughs> Yeah. How'd we do? Yeah. How'd we do? <laughs> Holy shit, man. You were, you were there too. Fucking yeah. hoo-yah, bro. <laughs> Fucking teams and shit. Yeah. Like no one remembers anything and you're not really taught. Um, I mean, you get some history. Yeah. Remember, we probably watched an hour long video at Bud's in first yeah. phase just to see if we'd fall asleep. Yeah. Um, to get, you know, the shit kicked, kicked out of us. Yeah. But it wasn't the, the way that the Marine Corps is. And, you know, what, what I find interesting is that we don't have like the Navy SEAL ball. Yeah. Right. And it's, yeah, but it's, it's interesting because it's January 1st, so it's on New Year's. Yeah. It's like a, that, of all fucking things to have. Yeah. I'm like, like man, if, if there'd be any group of people that could start partying on New Year's Eve <laughs> yeah, and, go. And, then, and then straight into a fucking birthday party, it would be us, <laughs> yeah. but we don't do it. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I do find that interesting, but the... Um, but no, man, I really, really fell in love with like, you mean I'd never have to see boot polish again? Yeah. Never. Yeah. I could put my hands in my pockets and. Yeah. Get your hands out your pockets, Navy. And yeah. Fucking, yeah. What you doing, Navy? <laughs> Come here, November. Remember, remember Army Jump School? November. Come here, November. Beat your boots, November. <laughs> That's, I mean, I, I wish they still did it. Like, I think it's kind of a travesty they don't. Like, not, you know, sending fucking Bud's graduates straight to, to Benning to fucking jump school in the Army. Like, that shit. I mean, I've, there's a million fucking stories from that. That three-week, yeah, I mean, like, what a fucking transition that is. But, uh, yeah. yeah, like, I, I think that's kind of a missed missed opportunity from a and granted like efficiency wise yeah it's probably fucking stupid and outdated sure. and not not worth doing but like goddamn I'm, I'm glad that that we came from an era where where they still did that you know but uh that's too bad they don't but you know yeah. like i said I, I get it but um all right so you check in into, into team three um you you did a, a pre-9-11 deployment Yep. Uh, and then for a period of time i know you actually jumped into our platoon during a dive phase during some dive training for a couple of weeks, you and uh, you and Ben. Ben, yeah. So Ben, I don't know if you remember, but 
Um, I don't, yeah, I don't remember why the fuck. So, he so Ben's face was shattered. Remember when oh, he yeah. had his, his jaw yeah, wired shut? Fucking the spare tire blew up on his face or some no, shit. No, it was a. Remember in the in the dive locker, there was that pressure gauge. So you could so you could test uh, the pressure gauges that went on the attack boards. Oh yeah, but it, but that blew up, right? Right. So you yeah. it, remember it had like a twenty five pound glass door yeah. on it, and it had those big ass bolts, and you and you put it in there, and you turned it, yeah. and then you would charge it to XYZ depth yeah. to make sure the pressure gauges work. So Ben was our dive rep. Yeah. And, you know, one night he's in there, fucking locks that thing down, or so he thought, charges it, and as it goes to, say, 110 feet, he, like, steps in front of the glass thing to look at it, to read it, and it blew off and yeah. hit him right in the face and yeah. knocked him unconscious. Shattered his fucking jaw, right? Shattered his whole face. Yeah, yeah. he was fucked up. God damn. So... Um, so he goes to the hospital, has his like jaw wired shut and shit. So he had to do, um, diving so he could be qualified to deploy. Right. Cause everybody has to check the boxes. Yeah. So I wasn't particularly great at combat swimmer. Like I would, <laughs> like, I wish I would have joined the Navy owls, the fucking sea thing. I'm like, whatever, man, <laughs> yeah. fuck, fuck all that. But, um, um, but you know, it was really weird. Like I, for whatever reason, I don't know, man, I was just never a great driver. I wasn't great on the attack yeah. board. You know, buddy, fucking I will swim, you know, 40 yeah. limpets on my back. I'll drag all that shit with me. Yeah. Like, just don't make me touch that goddamn attack board. Cause, yeah. You know. Don't um, make me drive. I don't, you know, but, but that's the thing. That's the thing about the SEAL teams, right? There, or any any uh, professionalism, I guess. There's, you know, there are strengths and weaknesses, yeah. um, uh, you know, across the board. So, um, but anyway, so I'd already done all of my diving and shit but i personally didn't think that i was i was like i just felt like i don't know i don't know if i want to say inadequate but i knew that i could sharpen my skills and be better so i self-tortured myself yeah which you think about 30 days of diving oh it's horrible day. yeah two and to, days and yeah two yeah. days 30 days right and and to volunteer so <clears throat> ben has to go through diving they're like hey man we're gonna and you were in golf platoon yeah they're like hey man ben you're gonna do um the diving block with golf platoon. Yeah. And I was like, you know, good luck, dude. <laughs> and, but then I, I was thinking about it, like sitting there in the platoon space thinking like, Hey man, here's, here's one of our bros. Our platoon mate is going to be going to another platoon. Yeah. And you know, now he's going to be strapped up to fucking somebody that doesn't know him. And you know, Ben was not good in the water. Let's <laughs> call a, yeah. you know, a spade a spade yeah. if i was marginal he was just fucking horrible yeah. right so so now you got dumb and dumber under the fucking water you know? <laughs> yeah, no shit. um but which which but it's interesting is it was that because he wasn't that good i took over as driving most of the time yeah which forced you to fucking get better which forced me to get better and inevitably you know i was uh uh did pretty well and you know, uh, I remember like just doing the debriefs and shit. Remember when he would, remember when Ben would do a debrief and he would say, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada all the time. <laughs> yeah. And he would never like, and I remember seeing you guys like rolling your eyes, like, fuck, we hate these dudes. Yeah. Like, you know, this guy sucks. And like, now his debrief absolutely fucking blows and, you know, yeah. sitting around the fucking dip tank and like, yeah. God, man, when's this going to be over? <laughs> um, but you know, as it's told now by my sea daddy, yeah. Uh, you know, my boy, Mr. Webb, you know, his, his whole rendition of events is that, um, I was, I was, you know, because of that, that I, I was on a Trident review board and he went in and, you know, spoke up for me and I got to keep my Trident. Yeah. This is the story around. Yeah. Kept me around and yeah. thank God for Brandon Webb. He saved my life. You know, yeah. just these stories, man, are just fucking ridiculous. But, um, but that is actually the truth of what happened and you were there, you witnessed yeah. it, you saw it. So, yeah, no, I, I remember. I, um, I mean, it's funny cause I, th we, for whatever reason, there was, there was a number of times where we had, uh, strap hanger fucking dive pairs with us for I don't know like we just won the fucking shit lottery or what. But, the, <laughs> but uh, you, you guys weren't the only ones actually. There was a there was two two officers that uh, that that did that, and of course because they were officers, like they were getting ready. The the reason they were with us is because they were going to to Damn Neck, and uh, I, I won't mention their names. I think they're both still fucking there. But uh, at any rate, they so they fucking jump in with us for just a couple of dives, like to you know knock the rust off before they yeah. go out there or whatever. And uh, so naturally, we fucked with them, you know. And uh, oh, for sure. And so Shane and I uh, put fucking like you know everybody has all their gear and shit set up 
uh, you know, and then you have the die brief and you fucking do yep. whatever, but every, everything's lined up on, on those fucking, uh, shelves or the, the table shelves in the, in the dive locker. And so Shane and I go in there and, you know, uh, on the dry erase boards, like there's those rolls of magnetic tape to, that, that would stick to the dry erase board. That oh, you, to create like the, yeah, uh, columns and yep, shit. Yeah. So of course we take a roll of these fucking magnets and put a fuck ton of magnets on the, on one side of the compass board <laughs> underneath, <laughs> under, <laughs> underneath their fucking compass. Yes. And so we get in the fucking water and, and you know, they didn't, they didn't know it was like four or five fucking layers of magnets taped to each other on just one side of the oh fucking my magnet. God, that's to- fucking epic. To- total, totally throws them off. So like, the in, they're lost the whole like they're doing fucking circles out in the bay like yeah you, like you a see, one-legged duck just fucking <laughs> cranking it around yeah, yeah like they, they you know they're they're and for those listening like to the way that they would keep track of everybody is every swim pair has a fucking like a little inflatable buoy about the size of a basketball with a fucking chem light attached to it yeah and so the safety boats are are you know floating around the fucking bay and they can see where all the dive pairs are at and these motherfuckers yeah just doing circles out just like fucking stevie wonder <laughs> out there trying to figure out where the fucking he's going and uh god damn it at the end of course they played it off like you know yeah no, i mean we struggled a little bit at first and then like totally bullshitted their way like motherfucker everybody knows you were lost and we we yeah. fucking showed them the thing and they lost their fucking shit but uh so you you guys weren't uh, weren't the only crew that jumped in that got the wrath of fucking golf platoon in the yeah uh, in, the, in the dive portion but uh yeah that's fucking priceless shit but um so, so you check that box. Ben gets cleared. You guys go back to uh, yeah. to Echo, and then you deployed. You were I, you guys were the first fucking platoon to go to Afghanistan, right? Yeah. So I was. Um, so we'd already finished our workup, and <clears throat> so now we were like doing schools, right? It's all different now the way that they line it up. Mm-hmm. But remember back in the day when you know you would finish your you know twelve month, thirteen month workup, whatever the fuck it was, we would then have time to like uh, go to schools and stuff. So I went to the Marine Corps Scout Sniper School up at Camp Pendleton. So I did their like their ten week course up there, and that was that was interesting. Going back to the to the mothership, if you will, going oh, back yeah. to the Death Star as a team guy. Oh fuck, dude! I, you want to talk about when I first got there? I was just like, you know, and then those years <laughs> later, and I come back to the Marine Corps, and they're like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like bro <laughs> yeah. don't call me bro i'm a fucking staff sergeant you hear me and i'm like dude chill the fuck out man why are you screaming at me man yeah. you know what i mean but that's their buds yeah right so i literally was i you know didn't kind of take that into account i was just yeah. like yeah it's cool man i'm gonna come up there fucking and i'll never forget you know part of their their uh, selection process <clears throat> is land nav and it's not land nav like you and i know land nav yeah where you have like a silver ranger compass and they actually show you how to use the motherfucker where you're like, okay, here's point a, here's point B and you put your compass and you, and then you spin the dial and it lines up with lat long lines. Yeah. And you, and of course, you know, you can look and there's a declination constant and you're like, oh, okay, it's 13 degrees. And, like, and you put the screw on the bot and it does all the shit for you. Right. Mm-hmm. To, to make, you know, you're using the tools available to you. <clears throat> Marine Corps, not so much. Marine Corps is still using, the fucking green fold out U S stamped fucking lensetic compass, yeah. right? Calumus compass, I think is who makes it. And so the Marine Corps, you're like looking at the declination constant. Now imagine fucking, you know, 50 Marines out there trying to do goddamn math in the middle of the night. <laughs> and they're like, uh, is it right and up or left and down? So you're like, well, no man, it's left ad, right subtract. You're like doing those basic shit. Yep. And they're out there like cheek to eye method. They're like, fucking go to the left, Billy. <laughs> trying to like line themselves up. And I've just come fucking running by him. And I'm like running. And they're like, where's all your gear? And I'm like, what do you mean, man? And I got like this little fucking three-day pack on. Because, yeah. you know, part of that land nav, you have to land nav for one week. And they drop a shitload of uh, kids out of that. I call them kids because they're like 19 to 20. But they, they drop these kids for land nav skills mm-hmm. running around the fucking mountains. Yeah. And... um you know, part of that is carrying your ruck and having all this kid in it, right? So we show up, and this is just as like the embitter radio came out. Like the Marine Corps didn't even know what the fuck that thing was. So they have all got their big boxed, you know, heavy ass man pack radios. And they're like, well, part of the equipment requirement, blah, 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 blah. And they read off all this shit. So I show up and I'm in solid tan camis. Right, so the Marine Corps yeah. not is, e- not even the desert, the solid tan, solid tan, because yeah. that's my field uniform. Yeah. Remember at Team yeah. Three, that was yeah. our field uniform, those right? Were, so, those those were legit. Yeah, so it says you know field uniform, 
Right. So I got like the compass sewn on the fucking sleeve, got Velcro and shit. So I already stick out like fucking dog's balls. And now I'm in like solid fucking tan in the mountains there at, camp, at the schoolhouse at SOI, right? This, at the Scout Cyber School. And they're like, you know, checking everybody's equipment, weighing their fucking packs. I got this three day pack. And they're like, you know, you will have this many fucking quartz water. You will have this much fuck. So I had like two MREs broken down in there, like duct tape with my spoon, whoop, camelback, <laughs> whoop. And there's my embitter. And they're like, what in the fuck is this? And I'm like, that's my radio. And they were like, what? It doesn't weigh enough. It doesn't weigh enough. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't have another radio. This is, they're like, what the fuck do you mean? I'm like, well, it does, uh, uh, it does VHF satcom. They're like, what? This is satcom. And I'm like, yeah, let me get the antenna. And like <laughs> out of like the outer pocket, remember that little angled <clears throat> pocket on the radio pack? <clears throat> I pulled out that little ass antenna and I was like the little cube and I yeah. pull it and I like extend the antennas. And then I, and I like, yeah, and I got the coax cable and that plugs in and they're, and they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And I just hold it towards the satellite and I'm like, you, this is me. <laughs> and they were like, their fucking mind's blown. Mind blown. Like they had, <laughs> like they had just discovered fucking fire. Like I was like, I was showing them fire and they were like, holy shit. I'm like, I'm like, sorry, man. So like that kind of started the getting back, like kind of getting them, you know, like trying to integrate and try to play the game. But yeah. I, but it was just funny because our equipment was so much different and that yeah. it, it like, it de we definitely were, you know, set apart from those guys yeah. and it, and sometimes a class would like fuck up and they had this chain. It was like this colored chain, like a boat chain, you know? So when guys hold, the, you know, this many links apart and be all uneven and fuck them up. So that was kind of like their log. Right. Yeah. And these, these <clears throat> instructors were always like, we'll get the chain, keep fucking around. We're going to get the chain. That was like their big threat. And I'm like, well then fucking get it. <laughs> and I like yell up in the back of the classroom and they like, who said that? Who the fuck? And I'm like, I'm like, just get the, and, they, and I'm like, who gives a shit? And they were out there just, and they were hammering, <laughs> hammering the fucking dog piss out of us. And I'm yelling at the other students. I'm like, I'm like, this is what they want. They, they think you're fucking weak. Fuck them. <laughs> fuck them. And we're just out there. Cra and then, so I get pulled aside and they're like, look, man, you realize this is a process. This is like our buds and shit. And you're like, you know, we, we know that you can like go out there and run around with this chain and yeah. you know, do all this stuff. But you know, they're like, we really appreciate if you take this course a little bit more seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, Roger that. So then I kind of like, you know, I got on board and, Completely but it was game. cool. Um, but, but graduation date was September 13th and obviously nine 11 happens a couple of days. So we were already done with school. We were just kind of like, you know, cleaning up the barracks and doing our bullshit. And, um, that's when I got a phone call and was told I was recalled. And then I just packed all my shit and left and went down, um, back they, to the team. They didn't say shit to you. They just said, get the fuck back here. No, you remember, you remember the old, like the recall drill, right? Oh, yeah. You'd say, Hey man, you've been recalled. Yeah, you just hang the phone you. up and go back. So then yeah. they, I get on the phone and they're like, Hey, this is Lieutenant blah, 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 blah. You've been recalled. And I'm like, okay, <clears throat> I hung the phone up and I just started packing my shit and left, left yeah. the schoolhouse. So. What uh, I'm curious to get your take because for me at that time I was I was between platoons. It was the whole reorganization of the whole goddamn community. So like yeah. I got back from a deployment in February of '01, and and we weren't starting our next you know platoon muster workup uh, process uh, until January of '02. So that whole fucking time Damn. I actually went and did a I did a stint of the fucking SISM team. The, for those listening, the Navy pentathlon team. I, I yeah. did a, a season there because there wasn't shit else going on, uh, and did that. But uh, but anyway, then nine eleven happened. So for me, like I was, you know, I was in between platoons anyway. So what? Uh, how how was that? You know, I, I always like to get people's uh, service members who were either you know about to come in or or were in where they're at and and what. What was your mentality like for you specifically uh, when that happened? Like, did, did it change how you felt about training, how you felt about your job? Uh, what, what was your mentality like? The, you know, we, when, you know, I already had combat experience from the Marine Corps, right? Um, then when we were doing, you know, operation and during training, but, you know, we still went overseas <laughs> and we did VBSS missions, right? So yeah. they're, you know, they're real world missions, you yeah. know what I mean? And, but, to some degree, I think everybody kind of realized that, like, hey, man, the, the the chances of us getting in, like, a no-shit firefight are really, like... Slim to none. Slim to none. Or, you know, you'd hear these stories of, like, oh, yeah, so-and-so was a dev group, and, yeah. you know, they... Fired his pistol once. Fired his pistol <laughs> once, and, you know, whatever. Um, so, I think it all happened so fast that 
you know, I mean, from the time that I got that phone call to when we left on that C5 was like six days. Oh, God damn. And I didn't realize it was that fast. What was crazy about that was, you know, we start loading <clears> out and we're, so we get recalls. So we're in 100% isolation. So I didn't leave the base. Nobody could. And we couldn't make any phone calls. We couldn't do any of that shit. And so we're loading out our gear and packing the pallets and doing our thing. And then we, you know, have to go upstairs to the third deck. Remember the, the classrooms and all that shit were up there? Mm-hmm. And that's, they, so they bring in like Navy JAG lawyers yeah. and they're like, Hey man, you know, we got to make sure your life insurance paperwork is good <laughs> yeah. to go. So that's always a good sign. Has your will up to date? Yes. And so, <laughs> Hey, who here has a will? And we all look around like, I, I know a will. I, you know, I, you know, I will drink beer for, for food. Like what the fuck? <laughs> and so now we're making will and test, you know what I mean? And then they're like, Hey, for you guys that are married, for those of you who are not married, you know, you have to file a power of attorney and we're like, what? Yeah. They're like, yeah, in the event that you get killed or you're incapacitated that these people yeah. can legally take over your life. And I'm, you know, so it hit me, I think at that point yeah. where I was like, wow, man, I've done a lot of shit kind of, and never once have I filled out paperwork like this. Yeah. So I'm like, what do we really get? You know, what, what does somebody else know that none of us know? Like, what the yeah. fuck are we going to be doing? And, <clears throat> uh, so we fill all this stuff out. And we're finally allowed to go home about, I'm going to say maybe like 12 hours before we left. And I tell my wife at the time that I'm leaving. And she was like, what do you mean you're leaving? And I'm like, yeah, I'm leaving. Like, she's like, when are you coming home? You're a horrible like, woman. I'm leaving. Yeah. And <clears throat> she's like, when are you coming home? I'm like, I absolutely have no idea. Yeah. Where are you going? I'm like, I have no idea. You know? <laughs> and so that was kind of it, you know? left the next day and jumped on the C5 and you know we're thinking like man you, you know if you think back to that time like the the towers are still smoking yeah every you know when you would watch the news the firefighters lo- locator beacons the the actual audible beacons were still beeping in the yeah. rubble yeah i mean <clears throat> you know that's some really really powerful shit yeah. to think about you know, the images of people jumping out of those towers still to this day fuck with me. It's very tough for me to even watch that stuff today. Like, it's yeah. like, if I, especially if I'm like, you know, two scotches deep and it's like, hey, 9 11 remembered. And I'm like, nope, yeah. click. I got, I got, you know, cause it's, it's, you know, that's the worst of humanity. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you're, you know, and, and I try to put myself in those people's position of like, man, you're just at work hanging out in the, in the cubicle. Yeah. And an hour later, you're like, hey man, do I burn to death? Yeah. Or do I jump and kill myself? And it's like, wow, you know? Yeah. Now, so Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it's impossible as an adult to see any of those images and, and understand the gravity of of what that situation was. And like, yeah, I mean, you talk about that that is textbook lesser of two evils right there. I, yes. mean, like, I, I mean, holy fuck. Like it is. I mean, like it, I'm right there with you. It's, it's hard to watch and it, and it, 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 uh, refuels and kind of re incites a, uh, you know, a bit of a violent fucking rage. I think that all of us have that, uh, you know, that we're as, as affected as we were and have lost friends since then fighting right. it and all that. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's some tough fucking shit, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and you think to those times, you know, the, the worst, um, that it happened was, um, you know, a guy who went through buds with dying at team five. Remember the parachuting accident? Yeah. Bearden. Yeah. Mikey Bearden. Right. So, you know, that was really the only, you know, experience that any of us had yeah. of somebody, I mean, like Ben blowing his, basically blowing his face off in the, in yeah. the diving locker. Like that's, that's a teammate being injured. Right. But yeah. it's like a training accident. You're like, Oh, okay, whatever. Um, you know, none of us, I don't think, knew what the fuck we were getting involved in, right? And, and you know, the history of the SEAL teams and all the stuff that we had been trained to do was a maritime um, assault team, right? So we're going to come in there via boat, helicopter, whatever the fuck. We're going to get in there, and it's going to be something close to the water. Yeah. You know, remember all that shit? Hey, we've always got one foot in the water, yeah. Yeah. right? Now, next thing you know, you're in Afghanistan, you're like, bro, there's no water there's except my fucking, fucking canteen. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you're right? fucking puddle. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so we get overseas and everybody, I remember being, everybody was like fired up, yeah. angry as fuck. And so we think we're like going right into the fight, right? Well, we're the tip of the spear and all this shit. And then we get to Kuwait and they're like, hey, man, you guys are going to be doing VBSS. And I remember we were so pissed, so yeah. disappointed. We're like, this fucking sucks. Whereas, 
any deployment before that, we're like, man, we get to do VBSS. Yeah. Like this is so, <laughs> yeah. we're doing, we're doing real world missions. Think yeah. about team one, what didn't do shit. Yeah. Team five. And for, and for those know, listening, uh, VBSS is visit board search and seizure. Uh, one of the bread and butters of especially seal team three at that time, uh, was, was board like shipboarding. So we would, you know, board these tankers in the Gulf and, and take them down basically because they were smuggling fucking oil out of, uh, out of the Arabian Gulf, um, you know, defying the sanctions basically. But uh, anyway, just so people understand what that is. Yeah. So, I mean, but you remember at that time, and I call it Operation Enduring Training, like pre-9-11, the only cool thing going on was those real-world ship takedowns. Yeah. But now all of a sudden, after 9-11, you're like, the last JV as fuck, man. Like, where's (laughs) recon Marines when you need them? Like, you know what I mean? (laughs) And like, you're like, why can't they do that? This is fucking bullshit. We're Navy SEALs. Uh." Yeah. And, and so we were in Kuwait for about three weeks and we're out on the flotilla, the Mark fives, the fucking ribs, and we're just kind of kicking it and the squawk box hits and our troop commander who was, you know, now it's a troop commander, but our troop commander for all intents and purposes is on the radio. And he's like, Hey, we need everybody inside the Mark five. So we gather all around the, the squawk box and he says, listen, um, we got a mission. You guys are going right now. You got to jock up. We got to be gone in like two minutes or less to ch- chase this fucking thing down. And he just gives us a brief history on the boat. And he's like, hey, the name of the ship is Alpha 117. This is the ship that Al-Qaeda used to smuggle the explosives in Africa that were used to bomb the two embassies that killed over 200 people. And all of I – mean, like it went from – Durka, 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 he won't stop. Durka, 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 he may have some oil to like, no, 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 this is boats, Al-Qaeda. Yeah. It was, and you're like, just this, the gravity of it all, I think, was was serious. I mean, I, yeah. you know, and I, I say it all the time, like, you know, typically, like, we're masters at grab assing and fucking around, yeah. right? <laughs> that, and... But there was none of that, right? It was just so serious. And I remember every there was no talking, there was no bullshitting. Everybody, there was none of this. Oh, hey, bro, I forgot my bup. None of that shit, like that you yeah. typically, you know, experienced. None of that happened. It seemed like everybody knew where all their kit was. Everybody got jocked up in under fucking two minutes. Everybody yeah. press checked their weapons. No one had a light AD. <laughs> all their night vision worked. No one was like, "Fuck, bro, I forgot my fucking battery, dude." <laughs> You know what I mean? The, you know, because this shit happens all the time, right? Yeah. You know, and I say it, man. People really knew what happened behind the the blue yeah. curtain of the SEAL teams. You'd be like, uh, "Are you really?" Yeah, I, I, yeah, we put the special in special warfare. So, um, but you know, this like the I think just the gravity of it is like our our um, our capabilities and professionalism. Yeah, you know, it 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 just all kind of came together, yeah. and then we jump on these boats. And I remember that being my favorite mission of all the shit I've ever done in my life. I think because of that moment. I remember thinking, hey man, this is just us, right? And yeah. it's we're on the we're on the rib, got our helmets on, fucking night vision, get flipped down, we're waiting for the 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 pro word to to go to begin the assault. And I remember thinking, it's like, man, there's no green braids out here, there's no rangers, no marines, like it's just us. There's yeah. 16 angry motherfuckers, and yeah. this is and like think about it, three weeks after yeah. the towers fell. Yeah. And I don't think I've ever been that mad in my life. No shit. I was getting angry. The closer and closer we got to that boat, the <clears throat> angered, angry I got. And we fucked those dudes up, man. <laughs> no shit. Oh, God. We beat the living <laughs> fuck out of them. So what was interesting was, you know, in, in our typical training and, and the VBSSs you've done, you know, you come around the corner with an M4 and typically guys yeah. are pretty compliant. Yeah. Right? It's, you didn't even give them a chance, did you? <laughs> no. So... <laughs> Um, I remember being like the number two guy up the ladder. I was, cause I was a secondary point man. So our primary point man goes, I go, the corpsman goes right behind me. I take the ladder off his back, hook it, drop it. And then we're the four guys that set the perimeter. And then the chief comes over the, the railing. Now our chief, I don't remember him, was Chris Dye. Oh yeah. So Chris Dye had experience because he was a guy that hung the haversack on Noriega's, uh, vessel in Panama and blew that fucking thing up. Yeah. And later on went on to gold squadron. And then when he uh, was asked to leave, <laughs> he came into, he came into team three yeah. and he was teaching diving with Randy Beaujolais. Yeah. Remember that shit? Yeah. But, yeah, well, it's the crazy. Fucking... yeah. But that was his, his swim buddy from seal team two. Yeah. And anyway, so then he ended up, you know, becoming our platoon chief. And, um, so we come over the railing 
and the back hatch like opens up. So we're out there on this, the, the back deck. They were all got our M4s up. And by that time, the fucking sniper bird had come out of nowhere. And so that, you know, the rotor, you can't really hear shit as you know. And then this door opens up and there's this fucking dude standing there. And we're just, you know, I, I can't remember who yelled it out. Somebody yells out open door, right? So we're like open door. And we start fucking racing to the fucking door. Now, I'm a, uh, at the time, I was one of the primary prisoner handlers. So, you know, the old school, like, hey, I'm going to point my M4 at you, and then you're going to go 90 degrees, and then, you know, fucking take you down, zip cuff you and all this shit. No. Right out the window. So I fucking stop. Like, it's funny thing about it, right? Like, I would have, like, probably given a, a medal for doing it the right way. Or, you know what I mean, saving yourself and getting your fucking ass chewed in the kill house <laughs> yeah. by doing the technique the right way and shit. And I remember, like, stopping, and I was pointing my M4 at this dude's face. And my chief, like, Chris, literally goes, pushes my M4 barrel and just goes, boom. And this guy's, like, boom, and crumbles like a bag of shit. And he's, like, cuff that motherfucker. And I was, like, yes, America is here, dude. And then that would that literally set the tone on this yeah. assault. And everybody got, we fucked them dudes up, yeah. man. How, how, uh, how many of them there were there? I want to say there was like 16 to 18 guys yeah. and uh, we, at, I mean, literally beat the living fuck out of those dudes. <laughs> yeah. Fucking payback's a bitch, huh? Yeah. yeah. Hey man, I'd say dude, it's, yeah. as, as Monty tree size, remember Monty? Oh, yeah. As he used to say, hey man, being a terrorist is a tough job. You know what I mean? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough <laughs> you know, gig. That's a tough gig, man. You choose your rate, choose your fate. I mean, what the fuck, dude? Yeah. You know? God damn. So uh, did, did anything come of that? Uh, of that seizure in terms of intel or, or uh, you know, what, what happened after that? I guess. So there were, um, <clears throat> what I was told was that, you know, the day afterwards that um, they sent guys from the agency out to like interview all the guys. Um, and that ship takedown was on the, uh, the, the presidential and the vice presidential's like security brief and that whole yeah, deal, which sure. was kind of cool, man. It like hit a pretty high level that we were out there doing that. Um, did you guys find shit uh, on board? No. So there was no weapons on board. Um, there was just a bunch of cigarettes down in the cargo. Hold, so yeah. we took a shit ton of, we filled like two, <laughs> two, uh, pair of bags with cigarettes, yeah, yeah. you know, the, like the, uh, yeah. yeah, that was good. Fucking pirates. Yeah. Modern day pirate, man. It's like, Fucking you know. beat, beat them up and take their shit. Yeah. Uh, all right. So after that, um, what what uh, did you guys do as a platoon once uh, once you wrapped up that boarding? Um, we did one. I think we did one more, and that was uh, just a little guy compared to that one. Um, so we got on board. Same type of thing, though. You know, smacked them around a bunch, zip cuffed them, um, fucked them up pretty good, and then and then right after that, we we were we were sent to Oman, and that's where we began our prep to go into like Afghanistan. And what I laugh about is, remember Team Three was like, you know, you're going to do reconnaissance, special reconnaissance SR, right? That was our uh, was one of our our jams, right? Remember that? Because mm-hmm. we specialize in desert warfare, yeah. and we are the only special operations unit in the world that didn't have vehicles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And remember that all the briefs that we give, all the after actions were like, sir, we need ATVs. Yeah. We need Humvees. Right. And they're like negative. That's yeah. fucking negative. Yeah. Well, we'd go out to fucking Fort Irwin and walk fucking 40 miles in, yeah. in August. Yeah. yeah. With 200 pounds of shit. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we show up out to Oman and all the Rangers got vehicles. The guys from uh, fifth group special forces, they were super cool to us. They all have Humvees, and I was like, "What the fuck? These guys got like weapons that like mount and swivel, and they got outboard facing seats, mm-hmm. and they had like their nets were all like built into the sides that like rolled down their cargo net." And I was like, "But I thought we were." <laughs> I, I was like, "Hold on a second, man. Hold on. I I could have swore I read somewhere that we were the best. <laughs> yeah, sure. I thought we were the tip of the spear. What yeah. the fuck? I think I'm the handle. Fucking Look at this base shit. of the shaft up in this motherfucker." <laughs> Yeah, we were definitely getting the shit. The, the veiny base of the shit. Yeah, yeah. And so all of a sudden, we are combat ineffective. We can't even go yeah. to Afghanistan because we don't have any fucking vehicles. <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden, we're like this badass tip of the spear VBSS fucking ninjas yeah. to literally like, nope. Yeah. Thanks, guys. And right at that time, um, the Rangers that were attached to, uh, I want to I think it was Blue Squadron that was out there at the time, but, I, but anyway, they were getting ready to leave. And um, they were like, hey, man, you got to give your, your vehicles up. And they're like, what? 
And they're like, yeah, man, the SEALs don't have any vehicles, so you guys got to give them your Humvees. So the only reason, and I will publicly say it, the only reason, Army saving the SEALs again, yeah. the only reason Echo Platoon even went to Afghanistan is because the Rangers gave us, were forced to give us their fucking Humvees. Oh, shit. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a similar story. I mean, we were up in, uh, this was going up into Iraq, but similar deal. Like, we show up in fucking Ali Asalem Air Force Base in northern Kuwait yep. after we did the, the uh, oil rig takedowns a few nights before. And we had three fucking Humvees for 16 dudes. And they're like, we need another one. So Sanford and Son? Yeah, I mean, Sh- Shane and, and uh, a couple other guys went and fucking stole a, a Humvee, a green jungle green humvee from the air force from the u.s air force stole it in the middle of the night yeah pull it into our high bay and we spent all fucking night with literally a paintbrush like paintbrushes and fucking cans of tan paint and, and hand painted it fucking tan <laughs> and uh and then and it didn't none of them were armored two of them didn't have fucking doors like yeah. didn't even have doors on them um but yeah so fucking the vehicle fucking achilles that uh, right. that is naval special warfare has been been a plague for a long time but well yeah and, and to your point about the doors and the armor and all that you know there's a time when that kind of shit really didn't exist right yeah. and then, and so we flew over on c-130 talons and in order to make weight with all of our kit we took all the doors off all the fucking yeah. windows out yeah it was i mean yeah, it yeah. was straight up fucking rat patrol, yeah. ghetto as fuck. Yeah, yeah. Well, all right. So you guys, uh, you guys end up getting the Humvees and you you head up into Afghanistan. What was that like? Because this was what October, November. Uh, we hit the ground about a week and a half before Christmas of two thousand and one. Okay. So it was <clears throat> still pretty fresh. Yeah, to say that it was cold would be an understatement. So to put it into perspective for the listeners. You know, typically, if you're going to acclimatize to an environment, it takes weeks, if not a month, Mm -hmm. right? And that's why it's, you know, spring, fall, summer, right? You're going through those seasons, and by the time you get to summer and it's blazing fucking hot, or you get to winter and it's cold, you're kind of uh, adapted to that, your natural environment that you live in, right? Which is why you're hanging out in a fucking t-shirt and I'm in a hoodie and a goddamn watch cap <laughs> yeah. in your living room because I you're from California. become a California kid and I'm the toughest pussy in the world. <laughs> so so we are in Oman and it's a hundred and fucking twelve degrees in the day. So we're on Batman hour, so we're working at night only, but it's ninety five to ninety eight degrees at night. Fuck. Right? But we jump and we're there for fuck almost a probably three weeks, a month, some shit. We were there for a minute. Yeah getting all of our shit together, getting everything ready to go. And um, we we fly in under the cover of darkness, right? And the C-130 pilots, the Talon guys are like flying on night vision. And I'm like, what the fuck? Because, you know, you don't train like that, yeah. right? Or they didn't. Didn't, right? Yeah. So I'm like, wait a minute. <clears throat> and they were kind of briefing us. They're like, hey, guys, it's going to be really, really bumpy and rough for like three and a half hours because we're, we're going to be flying like, a, you know, less about 500 feet off the deck at some point, might even get lower, but we're on night vision. And I'm like, you're like wait what and again yeah and again you're just like dude i just borrowed a car and yeah. you're flying on night flying a fucking plane with night like you this is really thing about really really getting experience like you can say all the shit you want like oh buds and this and navy but then you really start getting around professionals in the military yeah and you realize man you're just another spoke on the wheel of freedom you ain't yeah. nothing that special <laughs> yeah you just you know what i mean yeah and that guy's the chain that dude's the pedal yeah and together you make the bicycle right yeah. and that's yeah. really kind of how it works as you know and yeah. so you start like learning about all these fucking units you've never heard of capabilities that they have and you're like Holy you're like damn we can do that yeah yeah so we land in kandahar airport under cover of darkness they're on fucking night vision bro no yeah. lit runway no nothing and and so they're like yeah as soon as we land we're gonna drop the ramp you guys ungripe the fucking Humvees and start them and we're going to make a U-turn you're driving off and then we're just going to combat start and get the fuck out of here so that's exactly what we did Yeah. but when we land it's 17 degrees at night so we go from being 100 degrees to 4 hours later 17 degrees god damn and that wind hit me, man. I mean, that cold night air hit me, and I was like, dude, holy, <laughs> where the fuck? We are not in Kansas anymore, man. I was like, holy shit. I, like, other than like being in Hell Week, I don't, and I was bone dry. Yeah. I don't remember a time that I was ever that cold in my life. No, fucking. And you guys, you didn't have shit either, right? Like, you were. No, because remember, you we were Team Three Desert yeah. Warfare Platoon, and you got yeah. the fucking Filipino Mafia. Yeah. And you don't, you know, goddamn fucking cold weather shit. <laughs> it's fucking hot in Nyland. You know, fucking goddamn fucking Danner boots with the thermal. <laughs> Fuck you, you know, all this shit. And you're like, 
you're like, I'm like, hey man, can I get a G-Shock watch? You're like, oh, we're out. Come back at 1300. I'm like, but you're wearing a fucking G-Shock. What the fuck, man? I want your fucking watch, you crazy little fuck. So remember we had like that, the, um, oh, fuck. the desert bags. Yeah. And we had the desert camo, like, um, shitty ass. It wasn't Gore-Tex. even Gore-Tex. It was yeah. like, it was like thin. It was the lightweight Gore-Tex. Shit. Lightweight Gore-Tex. Yeah. That's all you guys had. So we had that and we had our, uh, summer weight, like 40 degree, um, bags. So, yeah. And dude, we were like in everything, man. We were thermals, fucking everything under the sun we could think to put on to just sleep at night. It was yeah. fucking freezing, man. Yeah. God damn. Yeah. So, when, uh, so when you guys landed, I mean, did you, I'm trying to think. I mean, there there wasn't a lot of uh, coordination or or other uh, U.S. allied fucking assets, right? I mean, like, did you get who did you link up with? So the Marine Corps was already there. So they they had my how the tables have turned, huh? How the tables have turned. <laughs> so like, hey, Navy SEALs. Yeah. Like, now fuck. now that you're in the Navy, the Marines are fucking greeting your ass. Yeah, I'm like, dude, when the fuck am I going to greet somebody? I've never greeted. I've never been like the first guy there and be like, yeah. hey guys, welcome to the fucking fight. I'm like always greeted by some other fucking asshole. Um, but no, they had come from Camp Rhino. Okay. And the, um, I want to say it was Delta Platoon from Team 3. That was attached to them. And then we relieved Delta Platoon yeah. in Kandahar. And okay. then we started working. Um, so next to us at the, in Kandahar, there was like, you know, areas where like the hospital and like these like sections. So we kind of like broke up. And that's when, like, all the coalition forces started coming in. So, like, the, the New Zealand SAS, the Australian SAS, uh, the Canadians showed up, Danes, Nor- Norwegians, the German KSK. It was like a hodgepodge of special ops. I mean, shit that most people didn't even know existed. Oh, damn, like, we are the world of special ops, huh? <laughs> yeah. And every one of them has an M4. Yeah. And that's, I'm like, wait a minute, dude, your M4 is nicer than mine. And like, yeah. I remember the Germans had... Uh, EOTEX. Yeah. No one even knew what the fuck that was. Yeah. Right now it's like on every rifle, right? But back then I was like, what is that? And they're like, ah, yeah, it's the EOTEX. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is that, dude? And they're like, it's holographic. And yeah. you look through it and it was this big ass circle. And I was like, no fucking way. And you can like, with both eyes open, you can see shit. Like, yeah. that's fucking incredible, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one of those. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. You guys are, you know what I mean? Fucking Germans. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was, it was cool to like, just see everybody's equipment to see, you know, how that whole thing came together. And, you know, we were there in a man, not very long, maybe a week and a half. And the green berets that were next to us, um, from fifth group, if, I, if my memory is correct from fifth group. Um, yeah, they're from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So it was fifth group. So they, they go on this mission, this like pre-dawn raid, and I remember being jealous as a motherfucker. I'm like, dude, why aren't we going? What the fuck, man? This is like, again, this whole tip of the spear thing, right? Impatient motherfuckers that we are. So they go on this raid, and the story that I heard was that they ended up lighting up a bunch of people who were not supposed to be lit up. And so they were like asked to leave Afghanistan. So they're there one day, they go on this fucking raid and then the guy's <laughs> coming back and they're like, hey man, can we borrow your wash bucket? I was like kick, <laughs> kicking it with this dude, like hanging out. And he's cleaning his gun and washing off his like knee pads and his in his boots. It was like, dude, that wa- he was bloody as fuck. He was covered in blood. I'm like, God damn, what were you guys out there doing? It's like you were in a slaughterhouse or something, right? Oh, shit. And but then literally like within 48 hours, all their shit was packed up and they were gone. God damn. Yeah. It's like fucking Blackwater all over again. Right. So so then we were tasked to do this Zarwar Keeley mission, which was supposed to be their mission. Oh, no shit. Because they had way more guys. They had all the fucking vehicles. They had all this shit. Um, but I believe the only reason, literally the only reason we were there is because um, they were gone. So yeah. so we get picked to do this mission, which is a BDA, right? To go in. Which is battle damage assessment for those of you listening. Those of you assholes that don't know what BDA means. Go ahead. That's right. It's not big dick ass. <laughs> Battle damage assessment. So we get told that we're going to go into this cave complex. And they have these like just really shitty, you know, satellite pictures of it all. And it was, you know, the Marine Corps was going to fly us in. And we're going to do an in-flight refuel in these CH-53 Echoes, these big ass helicopters. And it was like a three-hour insert um, to get out there <clears> from where <throat> we were at. And we end up right on the Pakistan border. Um and this this valley of caves was built by the CIA. No oh, shit. Right when the when they were back in the Mujahideen fighting yeah. the Soviets, and I in this cave complex has never been penetrated. The Soviets tried to get and they got their asses handed to them by the Afghans. 
Well, now they're like, hey, man, you 16 guys are going in there. I'm like, um, <laughs> Bob. <laughs> you're, right? you're like, did you not just do you not do you not just hear yourself with the fucking history brief you just gave? And now you're like, hey, it's cool, we got 16 dudes, and there. But we had a contingent of uh, Marines. There's 50 Marines that went with us, and the idea is that we're all going to insert and we're going to patrol through this valley and hit all these caves just to take pictures. And the Marines were just going to be our like perimeter security and kind of just move along the you know. Was was this in terms of the battle damage assessment? Was this after it had had the shit bombed out of it? Or it was so it was bombed like the day or two days before we got there. Mm -hmm. So we land, and it's supposed to literally be like six or seven caves, right? Is this not to interrupt again? But the, is this the Tora Bora region? Is that after that campaign, or is this totally? This different? is after Tora Bora. Okay. So Tora Bora was done by um, CAG. All right. And so we were not a part of that. That was like CAG and I think maybe SAS, SBS guys were with them. Um, anyway, so so we're going to do our own version, so to speak, of like Tora Bora. And we're just supposed to like patrol, take some pictures. Hey, guys, you did it. Good for you. Yeah. And we get the fuck out of there. So we're told that we're going to be there for 12 hours at the most. Mm -hmm. And... So we, we make this decision. We're like, okay, well, we're going to pack for 24 hours. We'll take a couple extra MREs. We'll take a couple quarts of water. Right? Maybe a jacket. Maybe a jacket. <laughs> right? Hey, you might be. Right? Take a jacket. Fuck it. <laughs> so, you know, we hit the hit the ground, and it's not six caves. It's more than 75 caves, and all the bombs missed. So <laughs> the cliff faces are, like, steep. And the bombs just, you know, they're because it's just a blank carpet bombing type deal. Yeah. So essentially, they just missed everything. Mm -hmm. So now they're like, well, guess we're doing cave assaults. No, and I'm like, whoa, I'm a point man. That means I go in there first. Like, yeah. I'm like, holy Fucking terrifying. Vietnam tunnel rat. Yeah. But these, <clears throat> these, some of these caves are big enough to drive vehicles through. Yeah. And, the, you know, they had underground. Uh, jails and power and they had like a fucking like you know jihadi starbucks and one of them and like <laughs> but it ended up being we, so we so we found so much shit that they wouldn't let us leave and so now this you know 12 hour mission ends up becoming nine and a half days so we're God out there damn. for nine and a half days patrolling and blowing shit up and so the cave thing it was just like the the, the beginning of all this shit and so we we found <laughs> more munitions than i Again, I'm probably going to be fucking, somebody's going to Google this shit and fucking tell me I'm a fucking idiot. What I was told and what it's, we do know, what I know anyway, is that it was the largest cache of mun weapons and munitions that have been found since like World War One. No oh, shit. Yeah, because I mean, it was, like I say, man, it's 70, more than 70 caves and there's millions of rounds of ordnance and all kinds of shit. So you, um, did you guys bring like fucking charges with you and you're just blowing shit up? I mean, so we had a, we had a couple EOD techs and what we decided was they just didn't have enough to do anything. Mm -hmm. So they were just, we were just marking, marking the entrances with, with GPSs for airstrikes later on. We're just going to basically bring back this, um, this, this target list and say, yeah. Hey man, these are the grids to the cave entrances and you know, knock yourself out. So we were taking all kinds of pictures and sending back SATCOM and, kind of giving them a an overview of what these these tunnel systems look like and i don't know if i've ever been man so nervous or scared in my life because you know you're thinking okay man there's people in these motherfuckers we don't know if they're in there or not there could be booby trap there could be anything going on in there and you go in there and you got your little surefire flashlight and you're like whoop right and it disappears into darkness you, there is you can't even see the back of the fucking caves Fuck they were Christ. so big and now you're like patrolling through there trying to find people and munitions and like thinking you're going to step on a landmine or something. I'm just remember, but what are you going to do, man? Yeah, like, that's why you're here. That's why you're here, man. You're here yeah. to, you know, you're America's finest. You <laughs> earned it. Congratulations, yeah. dick face. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're yeah. welcome, America. And now you're like in this, in this cave. I remember just being so like just nervous and like, holy fuck, man. I will be the first dude that takes round to the chest. There's yeah. no doubt about it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so that type of stuff. You know, so but you just kind of get into the rhythm, and yeah. all of a sudden it just okay, man. Fuck all this. We're here to do a job, and now you're just in the rhythm. We're doing cave entries at the cave entries, yeah. cave entries. So about near the end, we get up to a, a cave, and again, my boy Chris dies. Like he looks and he's like, "Prep that cave with a hand grenade." I'm like, <laughs> "Fuck yeah!" I'm like, "Yeah, motherfucker!" King, whoop, 
and I throw the grenade in there. And, and then it, come, I, it comes flying back out at me. And I step foot in there because, you know, I'm a fucking, uh, it goes off, boom, right? And so I'm a point man, the first dude. So he's coming behind me. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> boom, this wall of fire comes out. And I'm, I'm, and I'm blown kind of out of this cave. And I go into one of these big ass holes Holy from fuck. one of the missed bombs, <laughs> which damn. I think is the only thing that actually saved my life. But so I get like blown into this fucking uh, bomb pit. No M4. I don't know where the fuck that thing's at. Because I was old school, man. I didn't put, I had a sling on my M4, but it was made out of 550 cord. Yeah. And I'm like, but think about like Vietnam shit. They're like, sling, you're a fucking point, man, dude. You don't yeah. fucking take your hand off that thing for nothing. So yeah. like you're, again, this old school dumbass shit. But I patrol with my sling, but it's like wrapped up. So if I need it, I can undo it and sling it. But I never patrolled it with a, with a sling. Later yeah. I put one on. I was like, that's fucking stupid. That's never happening again. Yeah. <clears throat> so like fall into this hole. I think I'm on fucking fire. What what was the the flame from? It was from a munitions cache that we couldn't see. So like, so like it, sympathetically detonated. Yes. No, no so shit. but the so the tunnel goes in and it like say button hooks to the right. Well, my grenade like hits the back wall and button hooks to the right, <laughs> and it lands in mortars, missiles, fucking, and the sympathetic detonations went on for over twelve hours. There was fucking a Christ. yeah. Uh, uh, so. Had I gone in there and been like, I don't know, four or five feet now, I'd definitely probably be dead. Yeah. No shit. Um, Jeez, so I get blown in this fucking cave, right? And my helmet's all fucking crooked, right? So I just look like Private Pile. And I'm <laughs> down in this fucking hole. No M4, right? I think I'm, it feels like I'm on fire and I got law rockets strapped to my backpack because I'm also a rocket guy in the platoon, yeah. right? So now I'm like, holy fuck, this thing's in this. So I'm thinking this goddamn rocket is going to blow my fucking head off. I'm like, dude, I haven't even fired one round yeah. and I've killed myself like three times. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? You're like, again, hey, man, you're really a tip of the spear yeah. operator, man. You're getting it, you know? Yeah. So, so I'm like in this fucking hole, but now the platoon can't come and get me because all the sympathetic, all the shit's coming out of this cave. So yeah. they got to patrol up this fucking mountain around this goddamn thing and then come find me. And all I've got is my SIG, right? And so I pull my SIG out and I crawl out of this hole and I'm behind this big ass rock. I remember just sitting there. I was like, yeah, dude, you're so fucking, you're such a Navy SEAL operator right now. I was like, you're, I was like, you're the, you're like half burnt. I'm like, have, you know, like, you're like, no, no rifle, no rifle. Like you are like the world's worst fucking operator. I just remember just thinking about this. like, dude, is this how it ends? <laughs> it's like all this shit. I'm like, is this it? Like if, you know, I'm like, man, this is it, dude. And so the platoon comes around and they, and they see me by this fucking rock and our corpsman walks up, typical team guy shit, right? He like walks up and he's like, he's like, fuck man, you all right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, wiggle your hands. Can you feel your face? And he's like, boop, boop, boop. he's like, you're good, man. And, and then my buddy's just like, here you go, bro. Want this back? He hands me my rifle. And I was <laughs> like, holy fuck, man. And then one of the guys is like, man, we thought you were dead. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, there was like, you were standing there. And then you were like, there was this massive fireball, which we saw you in. And then you, and then as it dissipated, you were gone. We yeah. like thought you were completely just incinerated, incinerated. By did this. your fucking rifle come flying out or what the, how did they find it? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't know sure. how they found it. Yeah. yeah. Cause I didn't have a sling on it. Like yeah. I literally was in my hand. I'm like, and then, you know, yeah. so maybe it flew out of my hand and like landed yeah. by him. Yeah. And uh, they picked it up and brought it back to me. But um, God, that's a fucking trip. Yeah. So that was like my introduction into like real war and real yeah. missions. And yeah. I was like, I think I like, did more damage to myself than any enemy yeah. ever did. But well, I, th I think it's. Uh, I mean, the the couple elements I like about that story is that it uh, one, it's it's honest. Like, it, and you know, it's not, uh, you know. It, I don't know, bullshitting for the sake of fucking making yourself look good. But it, I think it really highlights the realities of war is that, you know, you've got a plan and then 90% of it doesn't go to plan ever. You know, like most yeah. of the things go horribly fucking wrong and, and they're just good life lessons. Like, you know, most of the things that you expect or anticipate either aren't going to happen or they're not going to happen the way that you want, or, uh, you know, it, it's going to turn into a total fucking shit sandwich. You're going to get thrown curveballs. you know, not unlike every other aspect of your life, whether it's your fucking car breaking down, your water heater shits the bed, fucking, you know, you get sick, whatever. Um, 
unfortunately with with uh, within the confines of warfare it's generally life and death when when yeah. things go wrong but uh, that's a fucking that's a good story um for, for once you guys finished that nine and a half day fucking fiasco what uh, what did you guys do after that so that was the, the <clears throat> biggest mission i'd ever been on the like the historic um you know the his that was a, his, a historical mission i mean in, in that nine and a half days the um combat controllers and i'll be very clear on that point the combat controllers called in more than 200 airstrikes in nine and a half days God damn. um and so in the end we were credited with like you know eight to eight to 15 you know enemy kaa from airstrikes none of us shot and killed anybody which was you know interesting and then later you know, think it like you're that's you know just the way that we were doing shit <clears throat> and then later on the, the shit that the teams got involved in and everybody else that you know america's forces got involved in is pretty crazy yeah. um, some of the fucking stories and the shit that people did but um and still do actually right now probably as we're recording this there's there's probably some e3 getting his ass shot off in afghanistan yeah still um, which is hard still to, hard to believe fucking 20 years ago 20 years almost. ago yeah um <clears throat> You know, so we came back from that, and then it was like we were the go-to. Yeah, you guys were the fucking war-proven subject matter All of experts. a sudden, we were the war-proven, like, yeah. SEALs can do anything. These guys never even saw water the entire time they were there, and, yeah. like, they do this crazy-ass historical mission. No one was injured. No one was killed. Mm -hmm. You know, we came back with some scalps, you know, via airstrike. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, just the integrating with the marine corps the insert the extract dealing with the fact that you know we had enough kit for like food i mean we had to you know we killed chickens we killed a i killed a goat and a cow myself that was the only that was my those were my two confirmed kills in afghanistan <laughs> if anybody wants to know it was to feed my platoon yeah. um then you know so we got these like crazy these cool pictures man of like a, you know cow leg hanging over a fire and we're all wearing like afghan garb that we had yeah. taken from like safe houses and shit that we'd later yeah. like called in airstrikes and blew up it's pretty fucking cool yeah. um i had a great time man i mean um you know it, it you feel tested you feel worthy you feel like man you know we're really doing what america pays us to do you know they yeah. don't pay us just to eat frogman burgers at danny's and fuck chicks you know yeah. what i mean like we're really <laughs> supposed to be warriors and yeah. you know this is what you know, you train and you, and you, and you, you work toward and it felt really good. So we ended up like having to brief all those other special operations units on kind of like what to expect and what the train was like. And, and, and we were really had just a trove of intelligence and pictures and all the stuff that we brought back. So then we start getting inundated. I mean, like it seemed like every every fucking week they gave us a mission to go do, yeah. and it was all just like recons or, hey man, we got a second hit on a vehicle. Once you go do a you know uh, interdict op and you know am vehicle ambush missions, they would give us um, that one didn't actually happen. We you know some bird spinning, um, but another interesting thing that happened was um, Operation Anaconda. I was there for that, <clears throat> and our platoon along with the Danish Special Forces were the QRF for Operation Anaconda. That's a quick reaction force for you assholes. You fucking savages listening. Quick reaction force. You're welcome, America. <laughs> um, so we go to Bagram Air Base, and you know they're prepping for all this stuff. But that's where uh, Dev Group was at and all those guys, right? So we got to hang out with them a little bit. That was kind of cool. Um and, you know, but we really didn't mess with them. We were in like two separate areas, but um, they were doing their thing and whatever. So, so the morning of Anaconda, as everybody knows, you know, Neil Roberts fell out of the back of the helicopter as they were inserting on the top of the uh, Tuckagar Mountain, right? Which later became named Roberts Ridge. So I'm on watch that night or that morning, I should say, and the phone rings in the fucking tent that we're in. And we were like in these crazy ass air force tent sleeping on cots with a pot bellied stove to keep us warm you know and they're like hey don't bring in the don't put the cans near the fire because it could cause it but if you left the diesel fuel outside it would it would uh gelatinize yeah it was yeah cold as fuck and coldest i'd ever been anyway and of course you know we got that bitch in cold weather gear from team three at the time yeah. <laughs> um so the phone rings and i answer it and they they're like, hey man, wake up your 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 uh, your top four and send them down to the talk, tactical operations center for all you assholes listening. <laughs> so they send them down there, and like they didn't even make it 
down the road before the fucking phone rings again. And they're like, Hey, you know, pass Elvis, which was the code word to launch the quick reaction force. So I'm like, what the fuck? So I go over to the Danish special forces tent. And I'm like, Hey, I wake up their, their guy. And I'm like, Hey, Elvis. And he's like, sits up. He's like, Elvis, <laughs> Elvis. And I'm like, Elvis, Elvis, Elvis. And I like close the little fucking hooch and I, and I go back to our, and then, you know, we have our little, and we've been practicing. We'd like practice this drill. We put all of our shit on yeah. and then walk down to the airfield. And we had like a certain time to be down there. So we get down there and a vehicle races back with our top four and they're like, we're going boys. And they got the two, uh, CH 47s. Yeah. They use 47s. The army use 47s. So they got two 47s spinning and we jump on razor zero one and the Danes jump on razor zero two. So literally we're like passing around the notebook of like, Hey, we've got one guy on E and E don't know how many enemy forces, Lot, 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 right? We have, so we got all of our shit. And now from the Zarwar Keeley mission, we learned, hey man, uh, 12 hours means nine days. So now all of us, it was like mandatory. So we all had our rucks. We had our fucking snowshoes, um, which we were given halfway through that deployment. Cause all of a sudden now we're doing cave clearing at 11,000 feet in snow. And they're like, Hey man, we're going to send you guys some snowshoes. <laughs> and no one had ever put snowshoes on before. And we're walking around the courtyard in the fucking dirt. Yeah. Figuring practicing. Out how to fucking use them how to use snowshoes <laughs> in sand in practicing our contact drills. Yeah. I'm like, wow, we're, we're all dead. Why don't we just fucking kill ourselves? It'll be faster. I'm like, but good, the good news is this is all tax free pay. So yeah. fuck it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. and like, and, and minute danger pay 150 bucks extra month. So that's yeah. legit as fuck. I'm like, wow, dude, $150 tax free. Yeah. And totally I get to walk in dirt with snowshoes. <laughs> this is pretty fucking elite. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, so, Get ready to like lift off, and then this this uh, seven ton truck like pulls up, and there's all these army rangers on the back of it, and Nate self, you know he's their OIC, you know, and all these guys like jump off. So Nate is talking with our platoon OIC, and then he runs back on the bird, and he's like screaming because you know the bird's spinning. It's like we're getting ready to take off. He's like, get all your shit, get the fuck off. And we're like, what? And he's like, get off, everybody. So we start to get off and he's like, no, bring everything. So we get all of our shit, come off with our fucking rocks, our weapons, whatever. And we literally drop our shit right at the, right at the end of the, uh, probably 10, 15 feet off the tail, tail ramp. So they have enough room to get in and it, and it has room to lift off. Right. And there's Nate self, the Rangers, and they got all their kit and they're like tightening up the rucksack straps and they march up the fucking ramp. They take off. So we like pull a, you know, earplug out. We're like, yo, what the fuck? And they're like, well, hey, man, we just found out that the guy that is on E&E is from Red Squadron, and the Rangers are their QRF. And we're like, but he's a SEAL, man. Fuck that. We're going in. Yeah. They're like, well, no, we're not. See, the helicopter's leaving. <laughs> and so we just, like, kicked it, kicked it on the tarmac for a minute and, like, kind of take all this shit in. And then within, like, 45 minutes— all fucking hell breaks. All out. hell breaks loose because Razor Zero One, which is the helicopter that we were on, is the one that lands right there and gets shot down. Well, as it's attempting to land, yeah. takes RPG and crashes, and then yeah. um, you know, so it's it's kind of it's weird to think about, man. That, oh yeah, that was literally like a one. Had that bird taken off one minute before, that would have been us. Yeah. Um. So then, how, how many Rangers uh, were lost on that? Do you remember? I th I think six Rangers were killed. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Fucking Christ! Yeah, yeah, it's like missing a uh, a flight that crashes. That's know? right, man. That's yeah. exactly that's exactly right. Um, yeah. So so then we get on other helicopters because now they get shot down, and then we go to a Ford refueling point, a FARP for all you <laughs> assholes listening. Um, so we are sitting there, and then we got the Danes with us. It's our whole platoon. And then Red Squadron shows up. So now there's like, you mad, there's a fuckload of people sitting out there. But we have to sit there all day long. And we got the squawk box hooked to the radio. And you and you can hear like all the radio comms with the Rangers um, calling for medevac and all their guys being killed and wounded and shit like that. So we, we had to sit there and listen to that all day without the ability to go and help. And you can literally see like the mountain ridge. Do you know why they didn't, didn't let you guys go? The, the... The, the commander of Operation Anaconda decided that it was too risky to it was it was too much of a risk at that point to to have another aircraft shot down during daylight. Yeah. So 
that's why. The, so literally, which is really, really fucked up, but there was between us, the Danes and the squadron, probably 55 people that they could have put up there to help them. Yeah. And I kind of feel like, you know, they just left them up there to eat shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is a sad, sad situation. It is. I mean, that's a, that's a, always the, you know, probably the toughest call a, uh, a commander of any operation, uh, you know, needs to make. Whether I mean fucking Somali, I mean, look at history and there's a million of them, you know, of, you know, at, at what point is it like, fuck, you know, to me there isn't. Right. Um, you know, obviously it's probably easier for us assholes to sit here and, and, you know, make, make judgment calls when, uh, when we weren't the ones that, uh, that were responsible for the overall mission. But I sure. still, to me, like on a principled level, yeah. Like you just, you just don't fucking do that, you know, right. like fucking send, send what you need to send. I mean, same with fucking Benghazi. Like to me, that's, that's a classic example of not doing the right fucking thing, Yep. you know, but, uh, anyway, that, uh, did that fuck with you guys at all in terms of, uh, the, the psyche for the rest of that, that deployment? For me, it did. I mean, I can't speak to the, you know, everybody else's, you know, uh, mentality, but then, you know, that happens. And then within days, you know, they have the, um, uh, the funeral, um, which I did not go to. I was, I think I was the only guy in the platoon that didn't go and not because I don't respect or honor the dead. I've gotten to plenty since, but it really kind of fucked with me. Like, man, dude, do I really want to see the reality of this stuff? You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, I went, I did not attend, I went there and saw the cross and, you know, the weapons, the helmets, you know, and there's Neil Roberts, you know, he's got his fins and then, you know, they got, you know, the Rangers, it's just, and, you know, I looked in one of the, the Rangers tents and you look in there, man, and you just see all their stuff like boxed up on the end of the cot. And you're just like, man, it really fucked me. I'm like, made me sick to my stomach, man, that, um, that some, you know, not that it, could happen you know obviously it's war but you know again man this is within you know the, the mentality we talked about like of just hey man you're in a basically a training environment doing some vbss stuff the chances of any of this stuff ever happening yeah. is really really rare and now you know here we are five months later and that's and, the reality of life and that's the reality of life that's the reality of war that is it, 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 and it's like wow man this is no bullshit yeah you know um but that's, it uh, is what it is, you know. Yeah, no, I mean the, the that that double edged sword of uh, doing what you love with the guys that uh, you know you consider brothers, and now losing them. I mean that uh, that's the tough dichotomy of of uh, being a soldier. Uh, Absolutely, I, I think it is a, yeah. a professional fucking warfighter. But um, so, what was the rest of the deployment like in terms of activity that you guys did? Was that was that did that pretty much wrap it up, and you guys came home, or did you do do anything else of note between then and? and no, the there was uh, one more um, mission, but I wasn't on that one because I I had uh, got sent home for uh, for good attitude. Not for good attitude. <laughs> I always had a great attitude. Um, I was I do enjoy life, man. I will say that, um, yeah. but. Um, Maybe that's part of the drug use because they yeah. just don't like want to die yeah. not having tried everything. Yeah. Maybe that's part of what it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, there was a, a night we were we were told like, "Hey, man, you guys are done operating. This is it. We're you know all all over." And we had done a lot of missions with the German KSK. We got uh, attached with them and started doing like they really weren't like. I don't know if they were trying to make these historical things or what, but you know, the Germans hadn't been in war since world war two. When you think about how long it had been since a German stood next to an American and actually fought Yeah, long ass time. Yeah. And so we started doing a shit ton of really big compound hits with the German KSK. And that was like our thing. Um, so a lot of just like insert in helicopter and, uh, you know, just hitting like, you know, 13, 14, 15 house complex. They were huge. Some of these fucking, you know, up on the mountains and the hillside made like, of mud. And you're like, wow, man, you yeah. know what I mean? It's incredible. Moving on up like, like village size fucking. Yes. But yeah. huge villages. Yeah. 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 Um, and so that, uh, what did you get sent home for? Or So you were part of that and then you left after that? Yeah, it was part of all that, and we, we it was again a lot of uh, capturing just weapons yeah. and munitions that we would like typically blow blow up there, 
and then take off. A lot of all of those were same, you know, one day operations. I never experienced anything like extended operation other than that Zarwar Keeley thing. Yeah. Um, everything else was all like one day shit. Um, the so we are told like, hey man, you guys are done. Like, and so we started having these like parties. Well, the Germans w- would fly in like pallets of beer, so all the other forces could drink. We couldn't. We were on a fucking oh, you're a dry, you know. We don't do that. Presidential orders, you cannot have beer. Okay, no problem. And I get it because we're we're fucking uncontrollable savages. We're pirates. I get it. Um, so the Germans though can fly in all these like tall boys, these fucking German beers. So I hit one of these dudes up, and I'm like, "Yo, man, how much of them fucking beers?" They're like, "Well, we'll sell them for a dollar a can," and I'm like, "I'll take four thousand. I'm like, oh, "Okay." <laughs> and by this time, right, the um, 101st Airborne had come to Kandahar in 90 C5s. True story. 90 C5s full of shit, and we go from like eating an MRE a day and two bottles of water. I was down to like 165 pounds. Like my riggers belt was past my middle back. It was almost, yeah. it was, it was, I was a skinny motherfucker. I should go on that diet again. <laughs> fucking war on weakness. I'll just eat an MRE a day for fucking six weeks. Um, anyway, so, so they got like their bank there. They got MWR, they got hot showers. Fucking, they had a little movie theater. They were showing movies. I was like, what in the fuck, man? This is kind of a trip. So we started enjoying, you know, the lap of luxury, so to speak. Well, I go up to the the little M, their uh, their little bank cage right there in the airport, and I'm like, "Yo, how much money can I withdraw out of here?" And they're like, "What's your rank?" I'm like, "I'm an E5." And they're like, an e-, and they're like, "Oh, you can get 300 bucks." I'm like, Whoosh. "So I slide that across, go back to the German's compound." I'm like, "Hey, man," I'll, and I hand this dude 300 bucks. I'm like, "I'll take 300 beers." <laughs> he was like, "What the fuck are you talking about, man?" I'm like, "Yeah, man, let's have a party, man, because we're all packing and leaving in a week. Let's just have one big fucking blowout in our compound." And he's like, all right, let's do it, man. So the Germans agree to like bring these fucking pallets of beer. So we like, so I gave a guy like a 12 pack, a, a CB. He's the only one with a fucking forklift. I'm like, hey man, I need you to bring this pallet. So we like put the camo net on it with blankets so we would see what the fuck it was. So this dude's driving through, you know, Kandahar and comes into our compound and like lowers this pallet of fucking beer, right? And this is not on ice or nothing like, and no one gives a fuck. It's cold enough anyway. So we got this roaring bonfire going on. We got the dartboard hung up by now. Got the generator. Finally got a generator. So now we've got like the radio, you know. So we're like, it was like a no shit. Yeah. Typical team it's guy. It's like a goddamn rave. It was a rave happening, right? So the Marine Corps gets wind that we're doing it. So we're like inviting Marines. We got, it, there was people from everywhere. So yeah. this compound ends up having probably fucking 200 people in there. And we're raging, dude. So imagine not drinking for fucking five or six months. All the experiences that we've had, there's a lot of stress built up. So you play hard, party hard, and we just start getting after it. Now the Germans start opening up the black bag. <laughs> and out comes the Crown Royal, the fucking red wine. And they're like, oh, you must drink the red wine with us. And I'm like, what the fuck? And they're like, yeah. In Germany, we have this wine that we heat up and we drink it during the holidays. It's like a really, really special thing. So we brought all these, we wanted each guy. So now... Each guy's got like a canteen cup of this fucking flaming hot wine that we put on the fire that we're drinking with these Germans to like, you know, solidify our brotherhood and stuff. Cranking on these tall boy Germans, these German beers. Guy only knows the alcohol content was in that. <laughs> now the vodka comes out, the fucking Crown Royal, the Jack Dallas. I'm like, what? Well, this shit came out of like nowhere, man. Um, so we're raving and doing our thing. Now, typical team guy fashion, me and my boy are talking to this army chick, right? And, you know, we're telling her tall tales, trying to get into her pants. And, you know, this party's fucking <laughs> raging. And we're standing there, and all of a sudden, this wine bottle comes flying at us, right? Because it's pretty much pitch black dark except for the fire, right? And they're imagining hundreds <clears throat> of people, the radio's going, shit's, it's getting chaotic. I'm really, really fucked up. One of the better nights of my life. <laughs> and... This bottle comes flying and it hits the wall next to us and it shatters. And we're like, God damn. We're like, God, this party's getting fucking nutty, dude. Don't even think anything about it. And then all of a sudden this like <clears throat> head pops up over the wall and he's like, fuck you. Seals are pussies. You motherfuckers. Blah, blah, blah. This guy's like screaming at us. So one of our guys who is now dead, he died in extortion one seven. Um, Heath Robinson walks up and he's like, fuck you. And now Heath is like, you know, um, 
talking shit to this dude. And my other friend picks up this broomstick and starts hitting him with it. And so it's like, so he's like hanging on this wall telling us what pussies we are, and he's got this headlamp on, right? <laughs> And so now Heath is chewing this dude's ass, and this other dude's got this broomstick, and he's just like, fuck you. Fucking boom, boom, boom. Pin- pinata style. Pinata <laughs> style. And you see it's hilarious because you see the stick going top, top, top. It's got getting chopped down every time he hits him like a piece of this fucking broomstick's breaking off. And it's like, you know, head, neck, and the shoulder. Ah, hits him in the elbow, and he fucking falls off the wall, right? So I'm like... So I'm like rolling laughing. I'm dying, man. I'm like, wow, this is what it's all. Now we're, now we're fucking operators, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now whole, it's a party. Now it's a real party. This is what, this is what I really joined for, right? <laughs> Fuck all this getting blown out of a cave shit and falling into a hole with your handgun. <laughs> this is the, this is it right here. This is the real shit. This was the brochure. And now hell week is worth it, right? All of a sudden I'm like, Hey man, being a seal is kind of fucking cool. Before yeah. then kind of sucked, but now yeah. it's really fucking rad. So, Next thing you know, like a whack-a-mole, this fuck pops back up, right? And now he's now he's yelling at these other dudes, and he's like, I want to fight. Fuck you guys. I'll beat your fucking ass. So my boy takes off at top speed phew, through the compound, running out there. And our LPO is like, dude, stop. No, don't do this. Blah. You know, because he's like, he knows what's going to happen. So a couple of us give chase, and we go out there into this road, and it's just gravel, right? fucking this story gets a little bit better <laughs> but it's all gravel at the time you know just laid on the rock people driving their vehicles is kind of what smashes it down well next to our compound is the combat controllers compound the, S- the sts squadron and so this dude sees all of us coming sucker punches the first guy that's out there that he was like i'm gonna fight you blah blah blah, blah. and he runs into his compound. Help, help, help. The SEALs are ambushing me. I'll never forget, man. Like in the middle of the night, I'm hammered. I'm just like, what? Ambushing? I'm like, what the fuck? So, so um, he runs into his compound and he stops and they got these like little <clears throat> engineering stakes, right? The same that you would use to make a barbed wire fence or like, they, but that was like their gate. So they had this like Constantina wire around their compound and they had a, uh, a wooden pallet was like the door, right? The super ghetto, right? Nine, post 9-11, like right then. So they have this like safety wire. That's kind of like how it swung open and closed. Now he's there with his hands on the fucking engineering stakes. And it's just this barrage of fuck yous and seals are pussies and da da da, da. But no one knows who this guy is because we're all sterile camied, right? Yeah. No one knows who the fuck any of us are. And next thing you know, it's like, we'll step out here and watch you fight. And it's not me saying it's like him and the other guy that he'd already hit. And so finally kind of was enough was enough. So I stepped between the dude and these two big motherfuckers. And I'm like, hey, man, let's go. Let's get the fuck out of here, you know. And next thing you know, you just hear, ow, God damn it. Oh, fuck. They're throwing rocks at us. And you hear the fucking uh, Air Force dudes locking and loading their M4s. Because the boys were fucking picking up these rocks in the in the in the road. <laughs> Jesus fuck! Over the con like from like point blank range from me to you. Yeah. In the pitch black, right? They, no one can see <laughs> shit, and they're like, "What seals or what? Fuck you!" And they're full baseball pitching handfuls of fucking legit rock, and pe- I mean peppering them right in the face, the chest. Fuck! So these kids freak out. They get a little. They get a little nervous. Whatever. <laughs> You know, no, I guess nobody likes to get hit point blank in the face with rocks. So I'm, <laughs> so, so that's kind of like going on. So that kind of elevates shit. And now as this is like happening, I'm between these two fucking monsters. And I turn to the guy and I'm like, hey, man, can you just shut the fuck up for two seconds so we can get the fuck out of here? And right. He's like, what? Boom. And he kicks me right in the chest. And I fucking, I'm drunk as fuck. Boom, and get hit in the chest. So I fall back in the in the road, and I stand up, and I'm like, "What the fuck is that? All you got?" And then, he, and then, he, and then he like roundhouse karate kicks me like uh, Tong Po style on a fucking banana tree <laughs> into my leg, and my fucking knee buckles in. I'm like, "Boom!" And I like go down to a knee, and I was like, "Fuck this!" I stand up and I just swing. Boom, and I hit him. And all of a sudden, shit got real quiet. I think the shot heard around the world, right? So he's like, oh my God, my nose. So he's got this headlamp on. So he's like 
still have that picture of this fucking dude holding on to these engineering stakes, not even seeing this punch coming, just eats one right, right down Main Street. <laughs> but now his head is down, and he's like, oh, my nose, but the light is shining, and there's this <laughs> blood fucking pouring out of his face. And I'm like, yeah, bitch. And I start taunting him, right? I'm like, how you like that, motherfucker? You know what I mean? I'm like, seals or what? Come on out, here's some more, motherfucker. And then my platoon chief, the first guy with a flashlight out of all this fucking chaos and fucking bullshit, comes up and he's like, boop. And he sees this, all this blood. And he shines up and he goes, Jesus Christ, Colonel Mackey, are you all right? Oh, <laughs> Right now, I didn't laugh at the time, but like laughing now, it's funny as fuck. But he was the guy starting shit all along. Yes, fucking colonel. He was the STS squadron commander, twenty first STS squadron commander. Was he fucking drunk? So we, yeah, later on we found out he had been getting liquored up. But he was he was upset because you know you got to remember like Operation Anaconda that his guy Chapman had gotten killed in, up on the mountain yeah. along with um, with Neil Roberts. So he was emotionally distraught and upset, you know, oh, doesn't like Navy SEALs, feels like his boy was, you know, all the stories, right? Yeah. So, so he's all just basically pissed off and obviously harboring some kind of fucking animosity for something we had no control over. But regardless, he's the guy that I fucking hit. Yeah. And now I look down and my fucking hand is bleeding. You could probably still see the scar yeah. on my knuckle. So that's the cartilage in his face that came through and cut my hand open. No shit. So now the corpsman's like, hey, dude, we got we to gotta go back. You got to get some fucking stitches, man. Your hand's all fucked up. And I'm like, fuck that, man. And I'm all like, you know, punch drunk now. And it gets like broken up really soon after that. So we all kind of go back and they shut the fucking party down like, you know, typical. And you just yeah. hear fucking cans getting crushed. Get this shit out of here. No evidence. And there's like <laughs> <laughs> people, trying to, you know, clean up after a fucking 200 man fucking yeah. booze fest. Right. Yeah. After not being able to drink for five months. But so clearly we're like out of control. Shit just went bad real quick. So now I'm back in my room. And our corpsman's like, hey, man, you got to have some stitches in your hand. I'm like, no fucking way, dude. I'm like, no, and I'm drunk off my ass, so I'm not making smart decisions, clearly. So I'm like, just squirt some super glue in it, man. I don't give a fuck. Just, we'll be good. And he's like, I'll tell you what. I got a beer. Typical corpsman shit, right? He's like, I'm like, what? And he's like, (laughs) like out of his kit. He's like, I got a beer. I'll give it to you if you let me give you an IV because you're going to be really fucked up tomorrow. He's like, let me give you an IV because you're gonna, he goes, dude, you're in a lot of fucking trouble, bro. No bullshit. He's like, Chris, you're, you're pretty much fucking done, dude. He's like, so be smart. Let me give you an IV. Let me just look at your hand. He goes, if you want super glue, fine. I'm like, all right, cool. So I trade him an IV for this beer. Yeah. Sticks me. Next thing you know, like in the fucking dark, he's got the headlamp on. He's like, on the syringe I'm like what's that he goes dude it's just anti-inflammatory man just make sure you don't get any infection so I'm like all right, cool I got this beer in my hand and I don't even see the plunger hit the bottom (laughs) I'm like out fucking cold no shit out cold crafty fuck little dirty bastard (laughs) Uh, one of the best corpsmen ever I love the guy but so I wake up I mean so fucked up and I'm just groggy and I'm like oh my god and the room is like bending and like I hear people like talking and all this shit's going on. And there's and there's our new guy, Corman, getting a lesson on how to do stitches. Yeah. So in the middle of the night in the dark, these guys are stitching my my fucking hand up. And I wake up and I'm just and I'm drooling all over me. I'm really fucked up. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, what the fuck was that? He's like, oh, it's ketamine 250, man. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, the shit we give like to the to the pigs and to the goats, like yeah. the horse tranquilizer shit. It's like I knocked <laughs> your dumb ass out. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> And I was, so I'm like, I'm like, he goes, man, he goes, I never used it on a human before. He goes, not going to lie to you. I thought I killed you there for a second. And I was like, what? (laughs) He goes, man, he goes, the way you just went out uncold and dropped your beer. Like, he goes, I honestly thought I'd killed you, man. I was like, fuck, maybe the dose was too high and you've been drinking. He's like, so even now he goes, man, you just beat this dude up. And I think I killed a motherfucker. (laughs) And I'm like, so I, you know, kind of come to, but the next day, uh, Admiral Worthington, who would, who was a uh, uh, a captain then, it's an 06 for all you don't understand the name Rank Simpson, um, flies in from Bagram, and he's fucking fuming, man, absolutely fuming, obviously. 
So we're all out in the courtyard and shit. And he's like, I just got one question. Who is the fucking dumbass that decided it was a good idea to punch a fucking lieutenant colonel in the face? I raised my hand. He's like, and what the fuck is your name? And I'm like, uh, Petty Officer Osman, sir. He's like, what is it? And I'm like, Petty Officer Osman. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, look, you and the other asshole, get the fuck out of here. And I was like, sir, he's like, you heard me. Get your shit and go home. Like, they got like, no orders, no nothing, right? Yeah. So he literally just, I like, grabbed my, uh, my, uh, my rifle, my, my chest rig and some kit. And I was like, hey, guys, make sure you pack up my stuff. And me and him literally walked down to the fucking runway and there was like birds coming in all the time. So like about the fourth one lands and we're like, yo man, where are you going? And he's like, uh, this one's going to Oman. I'm like, yo, can we jump on board? He's like, sure, dude. So we just hop on the back and boosh, we left and we got to Oman and hung out for like three days. And then finally a Marine Corps like C5 was flying back to Miramar hmm. and we went down and got on the manifest. That's how we got home. No oh, fucking shit. Yeah. God yeah. damn. And then I went. To, and then I went to Commodore's Mass for that. So I think I'm one of like four guys that have gone to Commodore Mass and kept yeah. their bird. So pretty. Did he, did they break you down in rank, or did you have any fucking harsh consequences from that? No. So um, they were pretty cool about it. I mean, you know, once they heard the story, and when I went to XOI at first, the the reaction was, I just got one question for it. I thought, like, oh my god, here we go, dude. You're a fucking E1 in a you know, and you're yeah. in the Fleet Navy. And he's like, why did you wait twice? And I was like, excuse me, sir? And he's like, yeah, he already hit you once. Why don't you just blast him the first time? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, uh, I didn't think about it, really, to be honest with you. And he's like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And so I leave, and then, but then Harvard rotated back, and he was like, hey, whatever happened to Osmond? He's like, nothing. He's like, bull fucking shit. <laughs> bull fucking shit, man. And he like freaks out. So now me, me and my boy, like I thought I'd made it. I was like, cool, man. Like team guided up, second platoon, knocked the motherfucker out. And um, made it back, and I'm I'm like going on the trade at man. This yeah. is fucking this is good shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, they're like, nope, you guys are going to Commodore's Mass. So it's like you know, bust out yeah. the fucking dress whites and did that whole thing. But we yeah. got I got fined like 250 bucks in a in a six month probation yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah, fucking Christ, that's fucking awesome. God damn. <laughs> Like, yeah, but that colonel got fucked up, man. Yeah, 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 no shit. Fucking broomstick and uh He deserved yeah, it. Fucking Christ. Fuck him. All right. So um talk about transitioning out uh, of of the Navy and, and going into what you're doing now. Yep. So as as far as the transition out goes, um what what can you tell us about um you know getting out and starting uh your first uh, gear company and, and how that tra- has transitioned into what you're doing now? Yeah, so I was always a, a gear geek, right? That's what I, you know, kind of, that's like my thing, right? I would I would say that, you know, how you have a passion for canines and everything about it. And midget that, porn. And midget porn, that's pretty good too. Um, you know, they, that's, for some odd reason, I don't even know what it is. I like fell in love with gear and equipment and all yeah. this stuff. And... You know, I had a buddy of mine modify my rucksack when I was in my first platoon because I was a communicator. And I came up with this, like, little sketch design. He sews a thing up, and then people are like, hey, man, where the fuck did you get that? And I'm like, yo, I made it. So around 2001, I started Tactical Assault Gear. And, you know, I didn't know shit about business. I had 23 grand in my name between savings and a, and a loan I got from the bank. I told him I was going to buy a motorcycle, and with my credit score, they gave me... 10 grand and I already had 13 grand. So that was my seed money for the, for the business. And so I rented that thousand square foot, um, shop above the gym there in Imperial beach. Right. Right. As you left, I was like, Hey man, I can't, I can't afford to be, have a shop in Coronado, but I can have one in IB and you know, maybe it's like a 50, 50 split as guys leave the base, whatever. So, um, so that's where I kind of cut my teeth was, was in retail and I was a dealer, um, for every nylon company around at the time, you know, London bridge, Blackhawk, Eagle industries, spec ops, brand, paraclete, camelback. I mean, I sold everybody's shit and I sold knives and accoutrements and all this other shit. And it was funny was, you know, if you think back to when we were in our first platoons and stuff, we were going through like combat swimmer. Remember you had to like spray paint all your green gear black. So you go diving for the night and the next day it was green again. Yeah. Before the mission was even over, it was green again. You're like, what the, yeah. this is fucking stupid. Well, you <laughs> had to do it right. Yeah. Going through the motions. But I was the first 
company around to kind of not just make product. I was kind of kidding together things that made guys' lives easier. So I get black H gear and, you know, would buy the, 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 the water canteen pouch with the mesh in the bottom, but it had a so strobe light pouch sewn to the outside. So guys, you could drop their strobe light into it, but it was all black. So the belt was black. Mm. The holster was black. The age, you know, so no one had to paint anything. So I just had these like kits and that's, you know, like I said, I started in that business that way, yeah. which is being in retail sales. And then obviously nine 11 happens. I go overseas, I come home and all the stuff kind of like almost all the shit that we were selling and that we were using didn't work. Yeah. And it was too bulky. It was too hot. It was too this. It was too that. So I just on, you know, sitting around started sketching my own ideas for chest rigs. And I found like a local sewer um, to sew up my stuff. Um, didn't have a label. Didn't have any of that shit. As a matter of fact, my, my first email address was tagsupplyco at AOL.com. <laughs> You've got mail. <laughs> You've got mail, <laughs> motherfucker. And... I remember having like the a printer with like dot matrix and it had the perforated. Remember that fucking thing you would oh, yeah. pull in half and like tear off? Yeah. So I'm like printing <clears throat> shit out. It's like, yeah, yeah, ticka, 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 ticka. And I'm like, <laughs> that was like how the business started. Yeah. Um, I didn't know shit about, you know, a POS system, point of sale. Piece of shit. Um, for all you assholes. <laughs> But all you assholes, anything like that, and you know, inventory control management, supply chain, man, all this stuff, man. I, I knew nothing about business. Um, I was like, overhead, I don't see anything over my head right now. I don't know, fuck. So, sure, I can afford it. Yeah, taxes, it, I have to pay those. Yeah, <laughs> what? Um, you're like, wait a minute. Well, if I have to pay taxes because I have a profit, well, how about I just run this into the ground with no profit for a decade? <laughs> fuck it, yeah. I'll win. Fuck them, right? No, so, um, so it was an interesting time because I had just came back from Afghanistan. I survived Commodore's mast. And, um, you know, when I started making my own gear, people would start coming in there, like the supply guys, right? The same Filipino mafia guys making fun of earlier. They would come in there and they'd be like, hey, man, I need to, I need to buy 200 Riggers belts right now because they had their impact credit card for the command or whatever. And it kind of took, you know, it hit me pretty quick that they're not coming in there being brand specific. They just want a rigger's belt. Yeah. So I was like, hmm. I can make that shit. Yep. So I just started <laughs> making rigger's belts and, yeah. you know, had a guy draw up a logo and I was like, oh, that one's, that, the one on the far right, that looks fucking cool. So that's where the logo comes from. And, um, you know, so I just, you know, didn't, I don't, I don't know if I had the, the wherewithal to come up with a better name. I just like, well, it's tactical assault gear, I guess. I, you know, yeah. so that's why I call it that. Yeah. Um, and if it was a titty bar, it could have been tits, ass, and G-string. So tag <laughs> would have worked regardless. So both my both. passions. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so so next thing you know, it, the riggers belts turns into you know machine gunner pouches, turns into flotation H gear. It turned into all that stuff. And chest rigs and, you know, it just grew into this, you know, little mini brand, but it was only there in that store. Well, and then this uh, was at a time, too, where, like, the, the, the tactical world fucking exploded at that. Like, you were at the right place at the right time as far as that goes, right? I mean. Yeah, absolute uh, luck. So, I was, you know, <clears throat> as it grew and I got to know about uh, contracts and what a GSA schedule was and, you know, what a TLS contractor was and, you know, all these like government agencies that sold to the, you know, and, you know, fostering those relationships and really kind of diving into the industry. Um, you know, I came, you know, pretty educated, uh, about it relatively quickly. And then it came time for me to reenlist. And my two options were to be an SQT instructor or to go to seal team one. And when I went over to visit with, um, uh, the, the command master chief over there, he's like, look, man, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to, I'm going to put you in the worst platoon we have because I heard you don't fuck around. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, man, I want you to go in there and just start handling dudes and start beating dudes down and fucking hazing people, haze them into submission. And I was like, hold on a second, man. You know what I mean? Cause I'd have been on my third platoon at that time. And he's like, yeah, man, he's like the LPO sucks. You know, they really, their leadership, you know, they're pussies. He's like, I need like a, 
guy like you to go in there and just wreck shop. And I'm like, well, there's 16 guys in there. Mm -hmm. I'm one guy. I'm not going to go in there and wreck shop on 16 people. And I go, why don't you just hold the headshed accountable and fix it? You know what I mean? So I kind of was like, it, it was almost like, hey, man. While flattering. While flattering that you think that I'm that angry and I'm just going to go in there and start smacking dudes around, which I, you know, that's fine. But at the end of the day, why isn't the command actually taking responsibility for the product that they're putting out? Right. Yeah. So I'm like, no, nah, that doesn't sound cool. Then. So my dad, you know, again, he was, he was retired as a master chief with uh, uh, 21 years in service. And he, and he talked to me one day and he's like, look, man, we're not going anywhere. We're going to be in the Middle East forever. And he's like, so the war will always be there. You know, the teams will always be there. He's like, well, he's like, look, man, do yourself a favor. Get out and just run your business for one year. And if it's not working out, just go back in. So I promised myself that I would pay myself what I was making in the teams, which was $4,000 a month take home after taxes. So that's what I paid myself um, for that first year. Uh, and I went in right at that time when I got out, we were doing about 850 grand in sales. And a year later, like you say, man, the industry like exploded because of all the wars and shit. So I went from like 850 grand to just over 5 million in 12 months. Fucking Christ. And next thing, and I'm like, man, I'm a high school graduate E5. Asshole. Total fucking dick. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm like, you know, so that was an interesting time for me because, you know, I, like I say, man, I have no business. I did not have any business background at the time. So I just was like, well, I went through buds. <laughs> I can fight my way through this shit. And I, and I really dove into, you know, it's like being in the teams, right? Or, or whatever unit you're in or anything you do in life. If you really want to be considered a professional, you dive into your profession yeah. and you become an expert at it. And you're recognized not because you're a fucking good looking dude or you can fight and drink or whatever. It's because you're respected in our world because of the skill sets that you bring to the table and your dedication to your craft. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was, I, that's what I wanted to be recognized as in the tactical nylon industry Yeah, was like, you know, not, I'm just not your competitor, but I'm going to crush your yeah. nuts because I know more than you, your, your business is bigger than mine. You guys have more of an advertising budget, all this, but you know, some, you can make up ground by becoming what you sell in a sense. Right. And really, really getting into it, not not knowing anything about you is like, I don't know, man, it's on hook three, I think, or, yeah. or like really knowing what the fuck you're doing. So that's what led me into learning so much about raw goods and manufacturing and designing. And, and that's where I was like, you know what, man, I'm just going to sell my own stuff. And I opened a store in Oceanside, um, which uh, I'm assuming was strategic and that it's right by fucking MCRD, right? Oh, uh, right by Camp Pendleton, right? right like right, right outside yeah. the gate. Yeah, yeah. Right outside the gate there of Camp Pendleton. And, and, you know, it was just like some like extra like Blackhawk shit when I first opened it up from the other store. And, <clears throat> but eventually everything was just my own branded stuff. And that's, and it just kind of held hard, right? And was doing millions and millions. And next thing I've got dealers all over the world. And, you know, I had a little um, manufacturing facility, which is like 1,500 square feet if my, if I think if that's right. Yeah. And I had like 20 people in there and they're making shit. And, you know, where I, well, looking back on all this, where I really, really fucked up was I then decided, hey, man, that's so much business that this shop is too big. We, we can't sustain this any longer. So I'm going to I'm gonna go and open up a bigger factory. So I ended up opening up a 23,000 square foot facility. And between sewers and preppers and, you know, finishers, inspectors, shipping, I mean, we had about 110 people in the building. And... You know, it was just, and, but there's just so much overhead involved in that, right? Yeah. 1.4, 1.6 million a year in payroll. The building's a dollar a square foot. So it's $23,000 a month in rent. I mean, it's just, it's insane to think about the amount of product that you have to turn yeah. to pay for that kind of shit. Yeah. When I look back on it, you know, which is the whole like Chris Osden design stuff, what I'm doing now is I, you know, I should have never opened up that, that, um, facility mm -hmm. i should have made that little last spot i had into like a premier research and development yeah and, and then, then just outsourced it, outsourced it. Yeah. yeah 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 i mean that's always the lessons you learn you know too late right in hindsight yeah right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what uh what was the the progression like year year to year like what year did you get out 
2004. So from, from 04 until like, as, as the walls kind of come in with that, like what, what was that transition from going from running that big ass facility and then deciding you know, I'm going to sell it and fucking do my own thing. Like, can you, can you take us through that, that process? Yeah. So I approached a company called LC industries and it's the biggest company no one's ever heard of, but, um, they make all the five gallon jerry cans, right. That you ever drank out of the military. Yeah. Every, they make all the Silum chem lights, uh, master locks, all the, all the locks that you used to use that said U S government on it yeah. made in the facility there in, in, uh, their Raleigh Durham plant. Hmm. Uh, all the site, like I said, the Silum chem lights, all the spoons and the MREs, all that shit's made by these guys, but they also do a lot of, um, file folders and office supply products. So, you know, the, the skill craft stuff. Yeah. Well, they are the largest <clears throat> employer of people who are blind in the country. And so they have preferential treatment with contracts part of what their business model is is to have what's called a bsc which is a base supply center and if you go on to an army base or an air force base um maybe some marine corps bases have i don't know but anyway they um you go in there and you use the impact credit card which is the commands you know uh, credit card to buy stuff but that's where they buy like their off supply products and stuff well part of their stores they had tactical shit in there and I, and I approached them to be their supplier of tactical equipment. So that's how I met them. And I went out there to talk to them about them just being a dealer base or a distributor, right? Because they had these huge, like 120,000 square foot distribution center where that feeds all these stores. And I was like, man, maybe I can shut this factory down and literally just give them all the gear and then they can distribute to all my dealers and kind of take it to the next level from like the $5 million level up to the 10, up to the 15, you know what I mean? Kind of, you know, stair step this fucker. And I leave the meeting. They're like, yeah, man, we'd like to do business with you. I'm like, thank you guys. So nice having you out. Blah, 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 blah. And I leave. So the vice, pre- or not the vice, pre- the COO is like driving me to the airport. Phone, his cell phone rings and he hears, yeah, yep, yep, yep. I'll ask him, I'll ask him. And he hangs the phone up. He's like, hey, man, uh, they want to know if you want to sell your company and come to work for us. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, man, they like they really liked your liked you, like what you have going on. And they, they really want to dive into this nylon. But instead of us just being a distributor, you know, why don't we buy your company and then you can be, come on board? So I call the guy back. And I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, man. He's like, come back in 30 days and we'll negotiate a price. So I did. I came back. Um, in 30 days, negotiate this price. Everybody's happy. And you know, at the time, I mean, I would sell it again. No, no doubt about it. I don't regret any of this shit, but I, at the time, you know, my whole family was working for me and now they're out of a fucking job. Well, (laughs) Chris goes to the bank and dad's out of work. (laughs) Well, interesting, you know, uh, side note on that. It's its own story, but you know, I got a small business loan during this, this process for $1.4 million, an SBA loan. And, but I had my home locked up in a trust and all my, you know, all my assets, everything was like locked up in a trust. So to take that out of a trust, so they had to sue my ass, they could take my, my cars, my house, my everything. I got a $1.5 million personal life insurance policy that they were the beneficiary of. So if I died, the loan would be paid. I was a big ass. It was a big deal, right? Certainly the biggest loan I'd ever personally signed for. And the payment was $19,000 a month. If anybody wants to know what a loan like that costs. Um, so when I went to my family, I was like, Hey, you know, to make my loan package look stronger, you know, I could, you know, maybe you guys can co-sign and da, 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 da. And nobody wanted to do it. Yeah. So this entire time, you know, behind the scenes, you know, I'm constantly being reminded by, you know, especially my brother of what a piece of shit I am. And if, man, if I own this company and you're fucked up and you're this, and you just like this, like mental beat down of, never feeling adequate. Like I can't do enough. I can't say the right shit. And of course, you know, that ties all into family. So now you've got everything from childhood all the way through adulthood. It's all brimming. It's all brimming. And these guys are like, Hey man, you want to, you know, and so they, so they say no. And I was like, well, look, I will give you guys each 20% for just signing this document. And nobody wanted to do it. They, and I was like, so you're saying it's cool for me to do it. I could lose everything, but you're not, you're not willing to lose shit. You just, it tells me, you're here for a paycheck and that's yeah. cool. I get it. No big deal. No hard feelings. So I, so I knew then that I was going to work to, to sell the company. Um, so I sell the company and of course it's like, well, what do we get? 
I'm like, Buh, an exit interview. <laughs> they're like, and my brother like lost his shit. And he's yeah. like, what do you mean? I'm like, dude, you don't own any part of the company. You had a chance. You didn't want to sign the documents. I'm like, what do you want to tell you, dude? Yeah. You know? Um, so, you know, it, it ended badly, you know, and during that, that acquisition, you know, you go through what's called due diligence where you say, Hey man, my business is, you know, worth X. But now you've got to prove that, right? Yeah. So every buckle is counted. Every, you know, hey, we have $650,000 in raw goods and inventory. Okay, well, you have to articulate that and actually show that you do. It just can't be some arbitrary fucking number you throw on a piece of paper. So that due diligence took about 90 days. And in that, you know, I discovered that my brother was stealing from me. Um, and so part of tag was tag custom. And that was the people that would come in and say, hey, man, I want to, uh, you know, your rigger's belt would be better. If. If it had two more inches of Velcro on it. All right, man. Well, instead of it being 40 bucks, it's going to cost you 150 bucks. And there are people dumb enough to pay. I still don't understand why people, it, I think it's that, you know, maybe it's that, hey, he's listening to me and I'm making this thing exactly the way I want it. It's but nothing would. Yeah, but nothing was so extremely different than what we were doing that I thought justified the prices that people are willing to pay for this yeah. shit. So I'm no longer in the custom business. I, somebody's like, hey, I got an idea. And I'm like, cool, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Shove that right up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about some, how about a custom <laughs> belt up your ass? And what was happening was he was, you know, we had the, the custom division going. And he was running it, but what happened was he had changed the like remit to a PO box out in town. So everybody that was buying all this stuff, God damn, he was stealing the money. Yeah. Um, so after we dove That's into that good. that pile of of uh, weeds, you know, he had uh, that I could prove anyway with you know invoices and customers and all emails and all the bullshit. It's about 40, 40 grand. So I lose my shit naturally, right? I'm like, man, you've been, you know, you're my family, you're my blood, and you know, um, I felt like to say I felt betrayed would be an understatement. Um, I probably thought of killing that dude at least a hundred times. Yeah. No doubt about it. Um, you know, if I'm going to tell you I tried meth, I'll, yeah, I will admit there was a moment in time I would drift off to sleep, you know, thinking about his fucking head being canoed um, <laughs> at a barbecue with the family. But, but I just decided to walk away from him like you know it's it's that thing like are you ever going to win anything let's say he gives me the forty thousand dollars back yeah you still don't trust him you still don't like him no yeah. it's it's fucked forever right yeah. so maybe it's that um maybe it's like hey man how much did it cost to get rid of him for the rest of your life that that piece of shit i was like yeah. hey forty thousand bucks isn't so bad yeah. so i never have to see him never have to deal with him um he's doing his own thing god only knows what that is but yeah you know whatever so yeah. um you know, so just that caused a lot, a lot of problems within the family. But, you know, like I say, man, all that shit was brewing. Because, you know, when, it, when a business is making fucking 25 grand a month, 30 grand a month, no one gives a shit. Yeah. Everybody's cool. But when a business starts pulling in 650,000, 700, 800, next thing you know, you're like, holy shit, man, we might hit a million dollars a month mm -hmm. in sales. People get fucking really, really weird. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, it's sad, man, but that's just the reality of life. I, you know, yeah. And I don't believe anyone's immune to that, but, yeah. you know, I think when it comes to family, there are, you know, it, people take advantage, I think, more with their own family than they often do with strangers. Yeah. Um, when it comes to shit like that. So, um, but that's how it ended with my with my brother anyway. My parents and I, you know, have a good relationship today, which is cool. Um, and you know, I went to go work for this company. Now the transition from owning it to working for it. Whew, yeah, that's, that's a fucking ego in the back pocket. Yeah, it wasn't in the back pocket. I think it went through a hole in my back pocket, somebody shit on it, then kicked it down the street and lit it on fire, I think is the best <laughs> way to describe how my ego felt doing that. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 if, I, I, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, it's the best way to describe it. I mean, if, if somebody was like, I guess in the military, right? So we know, like, let's say you're a sergeant major in the Marine Corps or you're a general, and then one morning they wake you up and you're like, hey, you're in boot camp and you're a fucking seaman yeah. fuck face. Yeah. <laughs> and you're on restrictions. Yeah. And you're on restriction. <laughs> Swab the deck, bitch. Yeah. Fucking um, Christ. Did so, uh, so was that a fucking train wreck from day one? And it just, I, I would say so because 
part of the negotiation was how is this going to affect the business? How is this going to change how we do business, what we've been accustomed to for a decade, right? And I, you know, that's one of the proudest moments that I've ever had is that I, I took a business that started with 23 grand and built it into a multi-million dollar company that I then exited. Yeah. Um, you know, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, yeah, man, I was a hundred air that went to being a thousand air. And then all of a sudden I'm a 35 years old and I'm a multimillionaire yeah. and I'm like, Buh. so <laughs> I didn't know what to do with the money. Like I was like, Hmm. And I think that's when like, okay, how far can we take this fucking partying? Yeah. And that's when I, like, I know that's when like the, the shenanigans really kind of started, yeah. uh, for me, because there was just no limit to what I could get my fucking hands on and the dumb yeah. shit I could do. And it just <laughs> didn't seem like it was enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and maybe in some way it was trying to replace not being in the military sure. and having that crazy ass adrenaline rush yeah. of jumping out of a plane and being with the boys and, yeah. you know, and then of course the whole family dynamic. So yeah, you the, know. the Dan Blazerian itis. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, yeah, but like I, I yeah. say, to people, I'm like, hey, man, I, I, that I believe is kind of when somebody started shaking the fucking champagne bottle, and maybe a year or so after that, mm. so I was like, oh yeah, boop, and that thing just went, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I went along with it. I had a great time, but um, yeah. Um, but I found out a lot about myself. You know, I found out a lot about people when it comes to money and, um, you know how they treat you, how they look at you, how, you know, it, it just, you yeah. know, I have a pretty good handle and perspective on what I believe is. That's why my whole thing is about being very true to yourself. And that's why I try not to come on something like this and lie. And you're like, Hey, what, have you ever tried a drug? And I'm like, uh, negative. <laughs> yeah. That's for weak people. And I'm like, yeah. no, man, I've done some crazy shit. Even you <laughs> took, I mean, think about all this shit you've been in your life. You're like, yeah. hold on a second. You tried what? <laughs> yeah. Like even that, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it, but I, you know, in all that, I mean, I learned that, you know, you have to be authentic. Yeah. You know, people can smell bullshit from a mile yeah. away, you know what I mean? Um, and so part of that whole transition was that nothing was supposed to change. Hey, man, you're just going to stay you. We're just going to own the company, and now you're a vice president, and you got this crazy-ass salary and benefits and all this weird shit. And I'm like, all right, it's cool. And within weeks, they're out there. Their HR people flew in from North Carolina to tell me that, Hey man, you can't wear jeans and a t-shirt. Our company has a no jeans and t-shirt policy. And you know, you got to get rid of the keg because I had a keg in my office. So all the boys would come in fucking, they had mugs and yeah. you know, we'd have movie day and shit and I'd shut the work down. I'm like, yeah, I'm really want to watch lethal weapon right now. And I would just like <laughs> stop working and what, what, you know, and you know, I definitely wasn't probably too OSHA compliant. I mean, I would, you know, I had some OSHA posters up, but I doubt, you know, we're, you know, we're doing like drunk. <laughs> Not exactly before. by the book. <laughs> Not exactly by the book, but you know, but I, but that's just what I knew. And that's how I knew how to <clears throat> manage the chaos and the stress was by having a good time. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of how I, I, you know, kind of live my life every day is that, you know, I don't, try not to take shit too serious. Cause I think you just get yeah. wrap, wrapped up tighter than a goddamn guitar string. And it's, you're just ready to snap, you know? Yeah. Um, so then they just took away the heartbeat of what that business was. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of like, Hey man, Hey, li Hey little fella, yeah. <laughs> we're going to, <clears throat> we're going to show you how a business is really supposed to be run. Yeah. So they came in with that, that, that attitude that they were going to bend my will and change me as a man. Yeah. And it, you know, we all know how that goes. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. So I just, you know, just wrote it for about a year. And I was like, this just isn't me, man. This isn't, you know, fuck this. So I resigned. And right about that time, I started designing stuff for companies that, you know, were working with like the Marine Corps or whatever. So I was, so that's where the name Chris Osmond Designs came from. Did they, did they have some crazy ass non-compete to where when you got out, like it hamstrung you a little bit in terms of? Yeah, so when you sell a company, you know, it's, it's different than, you know, a non-compete, a traditional, like, non-compete is unenforceable in the state of California. However, when you sell a business, part of that is you're selling your goodwill and yeah. your, a bit of your trade craft. So you, that type of non-compete is enforceable. Yeah. Um, so I didn't own my own company. I just was designing stuff for other people. I got you. Which doesn't, you know, yeah. I'm not directly competing with them. It's not even the, you know, the same business model. So yeah. I was able, so able to go around that. But, um, a couple years later, I get on the phone with the president of the company 
that I, that I sold to. And, you know, he and I always had a really good rapport, a super cool dude. And we just started chatting it up. And next thing you know, we're talking about me coming back to run tag because sales were in the shitter. They had all kinds of consultants in there. Um, you know, one of them, you know, uh, God, I'm trying to think of the name of it. The uh, dude from the East Coast. Oh, fuck, I don't know. Oh, I, I, anyway. Former team guys, but they had their little like consulting gig. So they were in there and they had, you know, just people all over the fucking place. Oh, here's how to sell it. Here's how to sell. So they were spending so much money on consulting fees. So I went in to go talk to them and interview with them. And they was like, hey, well, what would you do if you came back tomorrow? I was like, the first thing I do is fire every motherfucking consultant you have. Yeah. <laughs> and I think they were kind of like shocked. They probably, you know, <clears throat> thought that I had like refined myself and changed the way yeah. that I talk. And yeah. turns you know, out I haven't. Turns out I haven't. Matter of fact, I probably cranked it up a notch. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm sorry that piss, fuck, shit, cunt, and ass offends you, but yeah. that's just how I talk, yeah. right? So I'm not going to not be me. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't take it. Mm-hmm. You know, you're a 55 year old man and you're offended. I'm really, really sorry your feelings are hurt. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. So, so I just was like, yes, the first thing I did, I shit can all them dudes. I would bubble. So I kind of just laid out, you know, plan of action. a little plan of action in a, in a quick meeting. And they literally just like looks at the, the vice president and um, the guy that would be my boss. Uh, and they were like, hey, make him a director figure the money thing out, send him a fucking employment agreement. And he's like, welcome back, Chris. Shakes my hand. He's like, I got to go, man. And he leaves. And that's how I came back to Tactical Assault Gear. Oh, shit. Yeah. And I was there for four years um, before they finally fired me. I guess they just really, really got sick of uh, me being me. Of ass shit, fuck, cunt, <laughs> motherfucker. Yeah. 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 So they were, um, you know, they just... Like I say, man, they're they're a great company and they do a good thing employing people who are blind. And you know, I would never, ever, ever say they're not doing amazing things. But what they're not amazing at is the tactical space because it's just not the world that they come from. Yeah. So it's not the language they speak. They have no connection to it whatsoever. They yeah. don't. It, so it's just not their jam. They yeah. just, you know. Um, that's that's where a, a limitation of uh, even being uh, a savvy businessman or or savvy business company doesn't translate is that if you if you can't speak the fucking language and don't have any any connection that uh you know there are limitations to it yeah i mean it, it would be is is naive and is and is stupid is hey man i had a couple dogs when i was in high school i love dogs yeah. and me coming to try to do what you do well un- unfortunately that's most people they're like well, i had a fucking <laughs> dog growing up like i i know what the fuck <laughs> you know he didn't bite anybody i know what i'm doing like eh, okay uh, that's actually probably the most frustrating and hard, hardest thing I deal with is, uh, is exactly that. You know, it's, it's the, like, well, I had a dog when I was a kid. So, and I'm not even talking about people trying to come work here, uh, just in terms of training or sure. you know, like the online training and stuff. It, it, uh, it never ceases to amaze me how, how many people want to fucking argue about shit. And it's like, well, you're ask you're asking me what I think, and then you want to argue with it. Like you're coming to me, asking me what the fuck I think. <laughs> right. I do this for a living professionally. Like you know, whatever. But yeah. Um. Anyway, just because you drive a car every day doesn't yeah, make you a race car. It doesn't mean you're Mario fucking Andretti. That's right. Yeah. Um. All right. So getting into what you do now, uh, can you can you talk about uh, w- what it is that Chris Osmond Design does and where people can find you? Sure. So it's chrisosmonddesigns.com. I'm um, actually in the process of making a new website, um, and I originally started it just making motorcycle equipment because, you know, I've, I've been riding bikes for, man, 20 years now at this point, point. and much like the tactical stuff, there were <clears throat> bar bags and tank bags and just, you know, sissy bar bags and all that shit I'd see people riding around with, and I just thought it was garbage. It is garbage. I mean, anything you look at out there just fucking sucks. It's all made in China, so there's just like, Harley Davidson, we're fucking American bread. Yeah. Run, run. And I'm like, hey, man, everything you're wearing is made in fucking China. Yeah. You know what I mean? Welcome to America. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, but I come from a manufacturing background of made 100% made in America, very compliant, and that's, you know, for government contract shit. But, um, you know, so I'm like looking at all these bags and I'm like, man, I can fucking make that thing. And to me, it just looked like a, uh, like a Molly pouch, like a utility pouch. But instead of it having the attachments for a Molly strap on the back to go to a plate carrier, like, Oh, I'll just reconfigure it to mount onto a handlebar. Yeah. Um, so that's how I got my start. I just really made just one bag 
and in the motorcycle industry, you can only buy shit in black. But I have access to all these different fabrics. Like, no one had even seen multi-fucking. They didn't even know what the fuck multi-cam is, right? They didn't mm-hmm. even heard of the shit. So all of a sudden, I, like, put this site up, and I got multi-cam black, multi-cam red, white, blue. I got all these fucking colors, and that's – and it's, it just through Instagram and word of mouth is how it, how it grew. And I'm, yeah. you know, um, really surprised that I went literally from – you know how I got introduced to Instagram was that that fucking ALS ice bucket challenge. Yeah, and they were like, and they were like, yeah, it's on Instagram, and pe- and it was like on television, and people showing clips from their Instagram, and I was like, what the fuck is Instagram? I had no idea what it was. That was my introduction to Instagram and the whole social media thing. So I get an account, I do an ice bucket challenge, um, and then you know here we are years later, and I got you know a decent amount of following, which I think is cool. Um, but it's all grown by word of mouth, and yeah. then that morphed into tank bags and the same magnets I use in the tank bags are the same magnets that are in the pistol pouches that hold the the pistol magazines. Yeah. And so like it's all the same exact nylon zippers hardware <clears> that <throat> I would use if I was going to make you a chest rig to go to war tomorrow is the same exact shit. So the 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 material from a pure from a pure material perspective the the quality crushes anything that's out on the market. Yeah. Um but what I but what I wanted to do was stay out of the tactical industry. I wanted to retire from that shit. I was like, never again, man. It's like the Holocaust. No fucking thank you. Yeah. But my wife kept bugging me about it. She's like, look, dude, you haven't changed your cell phone number in 20 years. <laughs> and people still call yeah. by phone. And they're like, hey, man, we want to buy 200 of this. I'm like, but I'm retired. Yeah. And she's like, are you really like literally like throwing money away? I'm like, she's like, dude, you're a fucking dumbass. Yeah. You know what I mean? So she, she's really, really cool. And in, in the re, really the reason behind that, like my, I guess my whole attitude on life has changed. And, yeah. and, and, um, but then also bringing me around to reality that like, man, this is what you do. This is what you really love. Why would you not want to do it? Yeah. You know, um, it, it'd be like tomorrow morning if you moved off this property. Like, how long before you say you're retired before you're petting a dog? Yeah, probably about ninety minutes. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know if I'd be petting a dog. There'd be some peanut butter involved. It, it could get weird. Whoa! Yeah, that's, late. that's later too. But I want to be a dog yeah. now. All of a sudden. <laughs> Come here, you little <laughs> shiatsu. Yeah. Let's play tummy sticks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um. You know, so she was like, hey, man, why don't you just make one fucking product and put it on Instagram and see what happens? I'm like, all right. So I make these dump mag pouches, put them up there, and they and they sold out in like three weeks. Yeah. And she's like, well, there you go, man. That's your answer. So now I'm in the process of changing the website. So the, the new site, when it launches, it'll basically be like, you know, on the homepage, it'll just be like, click here for tactical, click here for motorcycle. Yeah. So I'm going to delve back into the tactical side of it. But what I, but I really, really learned from my experiences with tag, you know, I sold the company, had about 1800 SKUs, a lot of shit going on. I finally learned what overhead was. Uh, (laughs) And, but I really kind of thought like, you know, the, the last thing the tactical industry needs is another asshole selling a fucking Molly pouch, you know, because it's now completely saturated. Right. When I got into the business, there was like five to six companies doing it. Now there's hundreds, but no, none of them sell direct to the consumer. They're all, they all have these like crazy ass MSRPs because they give a government d- discount 40% or they'll give a dealer 50% off. They do all these things, but they travel, they go to shot show. They've got, you know, a hundred outside sales reps. They have all these, all this shit that I used to have. And that's what creates the MSRP because you need to cover your overhead. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm doing now is, only selling direct. I do not have any dealers. I refuse to have dealers. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm making the product and I mark it up 20% and then I put three bucks on it for the cost of ground shipping USPS and and that's what I sell it for. Yeah. Um, so the difference between, you know, like the alleys that dump pouch as an example, you know, the average one out there is about 53 bucks. Mine's $26 shipped to your door. Yeah. So it really cuts out. I mean, that's a crazy margin difference yeah. on, on pricing. Is that pretty standard as you're cutting it in, in half or even a little over it's, half it's on pretty much half, every? Yeah. Yeah. And, and some companies are way higher than that. Like, yeah. you know, there are, you know, I'll use an example um, of a plate carrier because people are very familiar with, uh, with armor carriers and plate carriers. The average plate carrier probably costs, and this is without using laser cutting, this is without using any automation, which most companies have switched to, which is, makes it even cheaper. But let's just say on the high side, 
you're paying $85 to have that thing made. And I mean, that's like all in, rooted to the tutor, like it's, hairs are burned and it's sitting there ready for sale. They retail on average between $325 to $499. Yeah. So these crazy ass markups. So I'm going to make the same exact carrier because it, there's no secret sauce in this, right? Multicam is multicam. And, you know, everybody knows what that is now, but it all comes from the same suppliers. There's only two suppliers in the country that supply multicam. Yeah. So if you're using 500 denier cordura or 1,000 weight and you're using the webbing and, you You're know, getting it from the same fucking... Same, same places, right? Yeah. I, I have my, my hooks pretty deep in that industry because of, yeah. of the history there. Kind of like you are in the, the canine industry. You know so many people, right, that... You know, you can, you know what shit costs to make, you know how, it, what it costs to train an animal, what, it, what an animal should sell for and, you know, what comes along with those, you know, those different levels of, um, of training. But so, you know, nylon to me is no different that, you know, if it costs me a hundred dollars to make something, you will see it on that website for 125 bucks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's fucking good shit, man. That, uh, I love it. I, it's, uh, it's always neat to see guys that. You know, come from our, we'll call it our generation, you know, doing yeah. doing the things that uh, that we're doing. I mean, there's so so many of, of our guys out there doing pretty pretty awesome, awesome shit out there. It's, uh, it's fucking great to see. Um, all right, so we've been going uh, three and a half plus hours now. I know uh, we got to really? wrap it up. Yeah. It feels like 20 minutes. That's what she said. Wait a minute. The uh, Before we play Stitch the Seamstress, seamstress here, which is going to happen later That's since right. you're good at sewing. Uh, is there anything you want to add uh, before we uh, roll on roll on out and wrap it up here? Follow me on Instagram because that's where all my information's at. So. What, what's the handle on Instagram? Well, it's underscore Chris underscore Osman underscore designs. There you have it, folks. Three underscores. Um, all right, one uh, one real quick. I'm not going to do the the normal spend 20 minutes talking about all the products, but I do want to mention just a couple of real quick things. The CBD oil, motherfucker. It comes in full spectrum and isolate, 500 milligram each. Key lime uh, is the full spectrum. Lemon lime is the isolate. Give it to yourself. Give it to your dog. Rub it on your nipples. I don't give a fuck, but take it. It's good for you. Go to trichosupplements.com, and uh, that is where the hotness is. We're going to have the trichos collar and leash combo coming out on rayallen.com. Uh, we're going to have franchises at trichos.com uh, by the time this airs, probably. Um we're also going to have uh, crates uh, very, very soon. Uh, gentle nod to another product I'm going to get into, crates through Dakota 283. I see nylon. The, tri- the Trichos uh, crate uh, soon soon to be released. Um, and we've also got training certificates on uh, the teamdog.pet and the online training. If, if you own a dog and you're listening to this podcast and you're not a member of Team Dog, fuck you and choke yourself uh, at the same time because uh, it's fucking $99 for the year and there's promos running a lot for even cheaper than that. But now you can get uh, the Tricos, you can get training certificates, you can get uh, basic obedience. Uh, soon you'll have advanced obedience. There's behavior modification. Uh, and we've also got um, the True Foundations course, which is kind of the, the basic training. Uh, very soon there's going to be Trichos trainer certificates, which is a conglomerate of, of everything that you'll be tested on. And you'll get a, an actual Trichos trainer certificate. Uh, that's coming real soon. Some of the other things I'm really excited about is this fucking thing right here. Uh, go on YouTube to check it out. Uh, ITS Tactical is making uh, these Trichos first aid, uh, canine first aid kits. All right. Uh, I'm not going to read the list of stuff because there's a ton of shit in there, but this is co designed, uh, influenced in terms of me saying this is what needs to be in this fucking thing. And it's complete. Uh, and what, what you will be able to get on, on the teamdog.pet website very, very soon is you'll be able to get a Trichos, uh, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a canine first aid certification that you you certify online through our site and a canine CPR certification that you'll be able to certify on our site. Uh, And we're also going to be selling these, the Trichos Canine Med Kit, uh, that again, it comes uh, in this pouch that I'm sure Chris will pick apart here uh, real soon, but uh, it's a a full complete kit. Uh, So we're uh, looking forward to being being able to offer that to you very, very soon. So uh, check that shit out, teamdog.pet, for all those certifications and just basic training. All right, Uh, Chris. I want to say uh, thank you for coming. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you, fuck. man. It's been yeah. a long time, man. It's been it, it a long has. time coming. Too too long. It's fucking great to catch up with you. I really and truly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come all the fucking way out here. 
Absolutely, man. I know that you had to extend your trip to do so. I appreciate it. Uh, to you guys, the listeners, uh, while choking yourself, know that uh, I am extremely grateful and very humbled by your support. If not for you, we would not be able to bring you these uh, these episodes, and uh, and your support has been uh, nothing shy of overwhelming. So uh, many thanks to you guys. I uh, appreciate all the support, and until next time, this is Mike Drop. Mm-hmm.